Good morning, Hendrik. Can you hear me okay? Yep, see you over nodding. Thank you. We're um we're um we're Hello, Paul, can you hear that? Yes, I can perfectly. Yeah, it's coming through from the room now. Fantastic. Um, yeah, we're just setting up some final things and we have 10 minutes. I, ha I have your slides ready with the team here. Great. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I can't see you. Yeah, John can't see you. <laughs> I'm definitely here. I can see you, John. Good. Yeah. This is number one. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. 
Hello. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for making it here um, so early on the first slot of this being the second day officially of the IGF 23. My name is Hendrik Eich. I'm a public affairs officer at Géant, which is the regional research and education network of Europe. Um, and before I introduce the speakers, I'd like to just talk a little bit about why we're here today. So global cooperation in the field of submarine cables is an essential element of both internet governance and diplomacy. Research and educational activity is fueling demands to support investments in submarine systems in remote areas as well as in more traditional routes. The changing profile of the ownership slash utilization of the internet is noted and the public interest role of research and education can be seen to be significant enough to be a conduit to ensure a retention of an open, resilient and distributed internet structure. Submarine cable agreements between national regional research and education networks, or NRENs slash RENs, are based on the common values of trust and reciprocity, and they allow public entities to not just share and disseminate public research, educational data, but innovate solutions and services to bolster scientific advancement. With this, of course, comes both economic growth and drivers of sustainability. Submarine cables can also provide physical geopolitical solutions to an increasingly politicized internet for the good of research and education. Um, I'd like to now introduce the speakers uh, we have today for you. Uh, the first, and this will be in order of appearance. So the first is my colleague, Paul Rouse. He's the Chief Community Relations Officer at Géon, and he's joining us uh, online, and he'll be presenting first. Um, 
following that, uh, we have our friends and colleagues from, from WIDE. So starting with Jun Marai-san, founder of the WIDE project, uh, professor at Keio University Graduate School, oh sorry, professor at Keio University and father of the Japanese internet. We then have Professor Kaiko Okawa-san, and she's a professor at the Kaio University Graduate School of Media Design. She's a director of the School on the Internet Asia project, launched by the WIDE project in 2001. And then we have Dr. Masafumi Oe-san, who's a vice director of the IT security office at the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan. And our final speaker will be Ieva Mureshkeni. She's a strategy and policy officer at Norginet, which is the regional network for the Scandinavian um, NRANs. Um, the backdrop of this um, session is um, we wanted to view it a bit through the lens of the EU-Japan strategic partnership. And also within that agreement between the EU and Japan, there are provisions for agreements on submarine cables. And in order to understand this in its scientific, economic and um, political impact, um, we'll start with Jean giving a brief overview of how we came to this space. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Paul for his first 20 minutes. Thank you, Hendrik, and good morning to everybody there and to all those online. Can you see and hear me okay? okay good, thank you. Right, we'll start then with the first slide. And uh, really, I'd like to start off with an introduction um, here to talk about how the uh, we have the outcome of the combination of submarine cables, the internet, and research and education networks. So we'll start today with a little lesson in history, first of all. And uh, let's look at the, the concept of the submarine cable. It was in the mid 19th century when the first transatlantic cable was put into service. Um, it started off with another very successful beginning, but by 1988, the world saw the advent of fiber optic cables in place across the North Atlantic as well. And this really became the start of the capabilities as we know today, to the point where 98, 99% of all the world's internet traffic is actually carried by submarine cables. And there to the right, you can see uh, an extract of all the submarine cables that are in service around the world. So really very much a critical infrastructure for modern society. Let's overlay that next then with how the internet came about. So it was Vint Cerf back uh, at Stanford University. And the importance here of the story here is you, you'll see that uh, a lot of the internet was born out of research academia. So Stanford University, uh, the internet protocol uh, was devised. And then later on at CERN, Sir Tim Berners-Lee actually came up with the concept of the World Wide Web. Now, many of you may have heard of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where at the lowest level, humans recognize we have the need for simple things like food, warmth, shelter. Some bright individual has repurposed this Maslow's hierarchy of need and suggested Wi-Fi is the most important characteristic in modern society. So it just goes to show from the concept of, of ideas in research that the internet now is ingrained in everything we do. And for any of you that have young children, you'll know anywhere you go someone new, the first thing they want to do is find out the code for the Wi-Fi. Looking at the next slide then, what's the significance of, of research and, and the use of, of the internet? Well, here in the image, you can see uh, the Atlas experiment at CERN in Geneva. Uh, the purpose of CERN is high energy physics, and it looks for new exciting uh, research into how the world was created. So most recently, you would have heard of a new particle that had been identified, the Higgs boson particle. And when the scientists there work on these uh, activities, the, re the, the experiments are conducted there, but the data is disseminated around the world for scientists to collaborate globally to investigate those data sets. And uh, what you can see on that bottom graph on this slide is actually the increase and in the profile of traffic. These scientists generate huge amounts of data when they conduct these experiments. And what you'll actually see on the right-hand side of that graph is where the traffic is now, or the data produced, flowing out of the, the network to research around the world, is actually starting to peak at around a terabit of data that's coming out there. 
So in terms of networking connectivity, that's a pretty significant flow rate in the network. And we need so certain kind of network capabilities and solutions to be able to convey and transmit that data accurately. As well as this, CERN produces other great impacts on all of our lives, uh, a picture there of an X-ray. So the technologies that CERN are working with are actually then deployed and adopted in X-ray technology that many of us, hopefully, you won't experience it, but if you go into hospital and have a, an X-ray taken, some of the technology from CERN may be incorporated into the X-ray machines that are used to improve the, the image definition. So that's physical sciences, but that's not the only place where network connectivity is important. In the subject of observing the Earth, Earth environmental sciences, the European Union has a space program called Copernicus. Copernicus has a number of satellites that have different sensors there, and all of these sensors take a range of measurements around the Earth and make this data set available for researchers around the world. So as an example here, one such centre in Kenya, the Regional Centre for Mapping of Resources for Development, receives this data that's uh, gathered from the satellites and is transmitted over research and education networks for researchers to help contribute towards the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, looking at land use, um, crop erosion, uh, crop diseases, all of the sensing technologies are very important to help make effective use of land resources. Now, if you recall back to what I told you about the creation of the internet, roughly at the time the internet was created was also the birth of the National Research and Education Networks. And I'd now like to introduce you to the Jeanne organisation. Hendrik mentioned it briefly in his introduction, and I'll, I'll spend a little bit more time here. Jeanne is based in the Netherlands, but we're an association with 39 member NRENs behind us, and we provide services and activities that support over 10,000 institutions or 50 million academic users. So we're pretty significant in terms of research and education activity. And in our composition and our activities, the things that we cover and do, if we look at the next slide, please, Hendrik, is in running that organisation, we undertake a number of European funded projects. But in doing this, we have three dimensions, the network, services and people. The network I'll talk about more in just a moment, but the services are also important to exploit that network technology layer. So identity services allowing students to access their resources as they move around uh, centres uh, or researchers to collaborate uh, using shared facilities. And then finally, the people dimension, ensuring communities of interest can collaborate and work effectively. And the way the modern world works, this isn't limited just to Europe we often work on a global basis. Let's have a little bit of a look at the network now. The network that you can see there isn't built by Jean alone. A characteristic of our community, the National Research and Education Network, or that when it's aggregated at a regional level, the Regional Education Network, we collaborate together. So Europe will collaborate with North America, with Asia PAC to ensure a network is in place to support those use cases that I've described already. And my colleagues and speakers here today will talk to you at greater length about some of the specific activities or initiatives that we see coming up in the future. But at present, we have a good infrastructure to ensure this collaboration and this research activity can happen. We not only support the physical sciences and the earth sciences, but we support other user communities as well. Research often relies on technology, artificial intelligence, high performance computing infrastructure, access to those sorts of resources are important. Our network provides the connectivity pathways to those. But also the control that we have over our network infrastructure ensures that we can service arts and humanities community who are very sensitive to latency characteristics on a network, such that a, an artist performing a dance routine in Latin America can collaborate with someone in Central Europe who may be playing the accompanying music with a very much controlled latency over the music and image coordination. Health and food uh, is another area and also uh, energy. Uh, we're working on developing a, a new site in Cadarache in France where there is a global collaboration to look at fusion uh, energy sources. 
um, the data and control of those systems will produce a significant amount of uh, connectivity requirements and research and education networks are underpinning that. So I've explained to you a little bit about how the internet came to be, how it has its source in research education, and also the significance of submarine cables that, in, that, in that domain. So what have we done about this? What have we done as research and education networks to make sure that the network and infrastructure exists there? Well, as an example, Red Clara, the regional network in Latin America, with Jail and funding from the European Commission, enabled an investment in a new submarine cable connecting Europe to Latin America, such that we have dedicated spectrum on this route for the use and benefit of research and education networks. So this was a real pathfinder example how research and education networks can be an active player in the submarine cable marketplace. That's a little bit about the now. What about the future? Well, why are we here talking today? What's important to us? If we look to an external advice, um, that from telegeography, uh, a good expert organization in understanding all things that are going on about connectivity in large, their data shows that the ownership of these submarine cables is changing. It's changing that what are called content providers, the likes of Google, Microsoft, Facebook, are taking a greater percentage ownership in this submarine cable infrastructure, which means the market is shrinking. So we perhaps have a risk around ensuring that we have adequate capacities that we can continue as NRENs to could deliver the research and education mission. So this is taking our attention and we're seeing some action and response to this already. In Europe, on the next slide, there is an initiative called the Digital Data Gateways. Just recently, Jean has worked with the European Investment Bank and DG Near from the EC to invest in a new uh, Medusa submarine cable system in the Mediterranean Sea. And this will improve the connectivity for a number of North African countries. There's another example where, for the benefit of research and education, and securing sovereignty over this infrastructure for the public good, we can have a good mix in the parties and actors to ensure continued outcomes and, and uh, infrastructure access. But it's not just the connectivity. As a community, the research element continues. And we're using these same submarine cables in a new project called Submerse to investigate whether it's possible to use submarine cables to be earth observing. And on the next slide, you'll see an overview of the Submerse project. One slide appears to have missed out there. So I'll just talk to that. The submarine cable has the ability to not only ca carry data, that research data that may be produced by CERN, but it has the ability to observe the earth around it. And the oceans are the largest, greatest unexplored territory. So we can see what's happening to the earth from the view of the ocean, which is important for things like climate change and understanding undersea currents. So we're looking at how these submarine cables can also be used for earth observation. I mentioned earlier uh, when I was talking about the network, how we don't ever do this just alone. We always ensure that we collaborate with partners around the world and often at a political level, we see commitments being made for example, between Europe and Japan with a recently signed strategic partnership agreement. And I know Jun will talk to this more uh, shortly and explain how we can translate this political agreement into action in the form of things like digital connectivity and the broader socio-economic benefits that that brings. So overall, there's an introduction there. I hope you've understood how the internet has come to be how the importance of submarine cables are relevant to the internet in carrying that majority of all traffic and how for research and education it is essential that we can continue to have access to submarine connectivity infrastructure to deliver the benefits for society at large. Thank you very much for uh, listening and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you Hendrik. Thank you very much Paul. Um, 
and thank you very much for that clear introduction as to why these cables matter, essentially, for research and education in our community at large. Um, before I move on, does anybody have any questions for Paul from the audience? Or in the chat, which I see no questions. Um, we can also, we also have a segment at the end where we have time for more audience questions. Um, but now I would now like to move on to WIDE, our colleagues in Japan. And um, I see Jun has a microphone already. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so okay. I will let him start. All right. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to Kyoto, Japan. And uh, um, I'm uh, uh, Jun Rai, uh, Kyoto University WIDE project, well, founder of a WIDE project. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about WIDE risk later. But the, the professor Hiroshi Esaki sitting in there is a director representative of a uh, wide project. But anyway, uh, today I'm going to talk about the, uh, what the, the Japan team basically, not only the wide project is uh, talking about. And uh, can I see my slide? Can you, can you control the slide, please? Okay, um, so wide project has been, is a, a research consortium working for the infrastructure uh, researches on the internet technology and uh, protocols and other things for a long time. Uh, it's, uh, it's been uh, 35 years of uh, history. Uh, and it's uh, uh, more than 100 uh, companies. Uh, most of our companies uh, supporting us is uh, from Japan, but uh, also they are from the other part of the uh, world as well. And uh, then the universities and the engineers from the um, ISPs and the vendors, engineers. So it's a it's a very nice uh, a mixture of uh, uh, professional experts uh, on the uh, uh, network and the computation uh, background, um, I including the science and other researches. Um, so the White Project decided next slide, please, um, to to work on the submarine cable. And uh, we've been you know, kind of uh, uh, doing a uh, lot of uh, work. But uh, uh, if you heard uh, uh, Giant and uh, uh, other European activities, and uh, this is very nice that the um, EU is uh, funding the research activities. And then the research activity is uh, endorsing the installing of a new submarine cable around, right? OK, so um, then the. Um, U.S. Uh, National Science Foundation, United States, is uh, doing the very similar thing and connecting the international cable, including the connectivity to Japan and the Europe, but also to the South, South America and the other thing. So, see, the U.S. got their uh, pretty big uh, funding uh, body, and uh, then the EU got the pretty big funding body uh, based on the research and uh, then endorsing the installing of a submarine cable. So. Uh, the point is that uh, we don't have that in the uh, Asia Pacific region. So uh, that has been the issue. So uh, uh, various uh, entities started to work together uh, to work as Europe and America and uh, then the Asia Pacific in, uh, some infrastructure uh, for the research and the educational activities. That has been discussed, but the finally now uh, it's uh, uh, got into the form. Uh, go ahead. And so um, now the White Project started the, uh, the things called the uh, Arena Park, Arterial uh, Research and Educational Network in the Asia Pacific, and also working together with the other uh, funding agency of Japan and the other uh, partners uh, around the Pacific uh, to work together. So uh, then, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, creating the great collaboration to uh, connect the uh, various uh, uh, partners and then uh, on to the very strong, c try to establish a strong uh, um, network infrastructure in the Asia Pacific and uh, then uh, connecting to Euro both Europe and America. So uh, if you, um, the next slide is going to be this one. Okay, good. Okay, so we have a booth actually, and uh, then you know, asking uh, all the people visiting the booth that uh, uh, to connect their their own research and educational network link 
by themselves and uh, creating uh, this uh, globe uh, with a pin and a string. And uh, so uh, if you look at this uh, in a carefree, then you know, we do have a, a, a very uh, important partners. And the blue one is, uh, by the way, the dream, <laughs> dreamland. So it's not there. So the Arctic fiber is uh, one of the blue line. And uh, from the Chile to uh, this side, yeah. Chile to, oh, oh, we don't have that one yet. Yeah, we have one in here. So after this session, then please visit our, our booth and uh, you can add your dream link uh, for the, uh, anyway. But anyway, so um, that's, that's uh, kind of a symbolic uh, effort. Uh, we've been working together. So uh, this, this uh, part of the Asia Pacific is uh, not just uh, by uh, Arena Park, which is a wide project operation, but also the Cynet and the other things. So uh, going to the, uh, oh, the, let, me sh let me share one of the challenges uh, we started to work. I mean, we are the uh, researchers of uh, networking technology as well. So uh, we have a new uh, technology called the uh, LODEM, uh, reconfigurable optical add and drop multiplexer, which is uh, well known for the data center technology as well. But uh, so instead of uh, dropping the fiber and uh, then uh, going forward type of a thing, then uh, we can split the, uh, the spectrum and the dynamically reconfigurable spectrum thing. Uh, that's a, a RODAM technology, uh, which is now being uh, getting uh, pretty much standard for the data center uh, technology. But uh, that's called a dry RODAM. And uh, then, you know, so uh, uh, there's going to be a wet RODAM, which is uh, under, uh, used, used for undersea cables. So uh, that's going to change our configure and the design of the uh, submarine cable for the dropping in the city uh, in from the uh, middle of the ocean and uh, then uh, reconfigurable for the future. So uh, remember the uh, lifetime of the optical fiber is like uh, 25 years. And uh, therefore during that 25 years, probably the uh, split to the, and the dropping in the certain city, uh, traffic might be changed. And uh, then you know, instead of uh, reinstalling the fiber, uh, we can do the uh, reconfigurable, uh, utilizing the existing fiber and the, then the control. So uh, this might be, it's, it's not there uh, for the research and the, I mean, long-term, long-haul network on the submarine cable yet, but uh, uh, we are now very eager to uh, explore this technology for the new cable, especially between the Euro Europe and Japan. So um, go ahead with the new one. So, uh, the, if uh, uh, the Arctic fiber coming to Japan from north, which is a red line, and uh, then you know, going to south, which is uh, uh, reaching to a southeast uh, Asia, okay? And uh, then the you know, important thing is that uh, this um, connectivity for the northern cable and the southern cable uh, should be benefit for the European community to reach the southeast Asia research entity as well. Therefore, the the question is how can we dropping and from uh, I mean connecting Tokyo and uh, then dropping in the Philippines and uh, uh, other cities, which is also a requirement of a EU co research community as well. Okay, so next slide, please. And uh, then uh, those um, places could be a candidate of uh, installing the uh, wet rodam and uh, then the reconfigurable. Uh, for the you know the dropping in uh, Hokkaido, dropping in uh, Tokyo, dropping in uh, um, terminating in uh, Tokyo, and uh, then connecting in uh, Tokyo, and uh, then uh, reaching to the uh, Philippines and other uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, this is uh, what uh, uh, we are trying to achieve for the future. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. Uh, so so this is a yellow part. Is uh, basically is uh, working with the Japanese government. Uh, that uh, you know, which parts gonna be uh, more missing, missing ocean of the cable, and then you know, so that's gonna be beneficial. That uh, because uh, most of the traffic is on the internet, internet traffic can be uh, you know the getting a benefit from uh, alternative and the complicated uh, uh, route, uh, route and the topology, right? So route 
topology should be complicated and redundant uh, for the internet traffic anyway. So um, from here on, then uh, uh, the application like a research and education, not only the scientific big researches, and the starting with uh, Keiko uh, for explaining about this Oyeja and the de uh, okay, all right, all right. okay, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm, I'm going I'm to talk a little bit more. Uh, this, this slide is uh, talking about a, a research collaboration between Asia and the Europe, uh, each of the uh, specific subject, and uh, including uh, fusion and uh, uh, astronomy, uh, high, high performance computing. There is a lot of uh, requirements uh, for the research community between uh, uh, Asia and the Europe. And uh, this is from uh, uh, one entity, uh, agency, uh, NII, and the next one is NICT uh, to work with uh, various entities and the research. And the, then they know the third uh, slide is uh, basically their uh, uh, asking their requirements for the how much bandwidth do, we, do you want? And, the, and then they said 100 gig, 500 gig. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say that the most of the, the, this string is 100 gig today, and they're going up to a 400 gig for the future, So, which is going to be a, a lot of traffic. So then the switching to a re educational thing with the Keiko, and uh, then uh, more the uh, consuming a lot of bandwidth from astronomy research from OSM. OK. Thank you, Jun, uh, introducing me. So um, I've been working in Southeast Asia and Japan, um, education and research collaboration for several, no more, more than 20 years. So uh, we have right now uh, a lot of partners. You can see a, a red dot, maybe it's not a, a little bit blur, but red dots are our, our current partners. And we do have a Nepal, Bangal uh, this is the list from west to east, uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, Myanmar, uh, Thailand, Cambodia, in, uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Timor Leste, Japan, and uh, the most east, uh, I believe, Australia. And those are the partners, uh, not only a pinpoint university, but those are the gateways to their own RENs, like an NREN, BDREN, MRN. So all, e all the countries and regions has their own universities and institutions connecting. So we are kind of gatewaying uh, to all the r area. The red dot, um, you can see, as you can see, uh, they are connected, uh, each other, uh, by international collaboration. So um, who are we? Uh, uh, the wide project launched two um, significant projects in 1996 and uh, 2001. 1996 is the Asia Internet Interconnection Initiative. Remember when we live with a little connectivity in 1996, we had a, a big hope to connect all the universities. How can we connect the internet among universities in Asia? It was 1995, only 0.4% of the population of the world was using internet, and even smaller in Asia. And uh, they connected uh, many universities in East, uh, um, Southeast Asia utilizing satellite technology. And five years later, from AIIII, uh, we call it, uh, right hand side is School of Internet. How can we share knowledge among universities in Asia over the internet that AIIII created? Uh, it, uh, that was 2001, still only 8.6% 8, 8 uh, of the population was using internet. So this is the beginning of our uh, pro collaboration. And at that time, um, all the universities set up the satellite to connect each other and so on and so on. So connectivity is essential for research and education, s s um, even from a uh, very early stage. 2007, we have a full set of uh, partners started to work together. That was 20% of the population era. So uh, at that time, learning and research together in Asia has been a norm since the beginning. So um, yeah, we got together. We know we can do better with peers than doing ourselves. 
So we learned each other. Uh, you can see many countries are connecting there. And the very, very um, simple technology at that time, multicast and sa uh, satellite, and many countries connected by themselves because of the education. And s many, many things happened. And s then, 2019, we had almost 60% uh, of population connected, and the university are uh, uh, ready to go farther uh, uh, to 19, and then COVID came, and yes, this is the way we, we've been working together for uh, several years now, but uh, um, now uh, we got a, a cable connectivity, and we have a good harmonization of satellite and cables right now, and Arena Park that Jun uh, just talked about started to strengthen our collaboration beyond Asia. So, um, you can see Tokyo is connecting to many uh, places and Singapore is connecting to many places and Guam has a new topology added by Arena Park. But um, Asia University co uh, partners are excited about new high-speed network, which is a uh, uh, Indonesia signing summary, 100 gigabps coming to Indonesia. And that is not only to Indonesia, but beyond that. And Indonesia is connecting to Guam, Tokyo, but not only to, to Tokyo. Tokyo, uh, beyond Tokyo, uh, go into other places, uh, Europe and uh, the Europe and the United States as well. So it's already connected, um, ready to do many more things. And we are uh, looking forward to more collaboration and that this, uh, the, on the research and education. And in order to keep this environment sustainable, we really um, believe education for the internet engineers uh, key essence to for the future. So we have our education program, and now a all Asian partners, Asia-wide educational program on ongoing, and we are ready for research and education collaboration beyond Asia. So I would like to pass this microphone to. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm Masafumi from Astronomical Observatory of Japan. So uh, today I would like to talk to you about uh, how submarine cables enhance the big semi science. So the first three. So the why we if we are networks are under sea the submarine cables. Uh, event the astronomy. So the, this presentation will be explained about our uh, big science facilities. So this is a very big uh, consuming the data to analyze the uh, astronomy data. And also I would like to introduce the impact of the network hand bandwidth on the science. So the what is now J? Now J is National Astro Astronomical Observatory Japan. So we have a lot of the uh, astronomical facilities in the world. So the, our main facility is located in the top of Mount Nakia in Hawaii. And also uh, we are, uh, make a collaborate with the ESA and the, uh, NARO in US uh, in the Chile. So this it's called the ARMA, Atacaba Submilita Array Antenna. So that is uh, the two of the current facilities are the uh, consuming the already a lot of data to the underwrite to the uh, to observing the uh, astronomy. So there, that is one of the example. So the Subaru telescope that is has a one 8.2 primary single meter is uh, facility. So the this uh, telescope facility is a multi-purpose use. So the this uh, Subaru telescope has the three point of the mounting point for the attaching the some observation observation system. So the Subaru telescope established in, in 1999, the system has been upgraded year by year. So currently the uh, uh, high hyper supreme cam is the our flag, uh, flagship the observation facility, one of the facilities. So this is a lot of the huge amount of the data to the shot the uh, starts. So the this is a uh, lot of the high sensitive the CCD is the uh, connected to the computing facility and the storage, storage facilities. So like uh, the 870 million pixels digital camera in the top of the manager. So the all of 
our facility is located in the world. So one of the possible facilities I talked. So another one is the Aruma project. That, that first right is 2011. So this site also there are a lot of con the consuming the data to transfer to the Tokyo and the other European countries and the US, US mainland. So the, the currently the, this figure showing to the submarine cables. So, but uh, that facility is not quite really different uh, actual the data network from the Aruma Subaru to the Tokyo. So, the cable planning is submarine cable planning is uh, not relationship to the uh, some uh, location of the observation site. The ob current observation site is the best location for the uh, observing the stars. So the Next fact is that science is not possible without network technologies. So the Aruma is the one of big facilities. So uh, you show the this figure showing the Yamanote line. That is a major uh, JR line in the Tokyo area. So the each uh, parabola antenna is connected to around the size of the Yamanote line. So the fiber cable over the 60 km six kilometers away from the central data center. So uh, e each data from the uh, uh, telescope has been transferred to the correlation office. So the all of the correlation office has a supercomputer system. So that this system facility, the engineering that analyzes the data from the each telescope. So then they're creating the images. So the currently, uh, this network has based on the 10 gigabit Ethernet. However, so the, this facility is depending on the technology of the commodity community technology, so like uh, Ethernet or so ATM or something. So the, this program will be updated the year by year. So the, firstly, so the, I'm talking about the current the, uh, astronomy facilities with the net data bulk data networks. So the in last year, uh, we uh, have collaborated with the Arena Park. Uh, the 100 gigabit ESA network reached to the Subaru telescope in the top of Mauna Kea. So the we are uh, upgrading the all of the network facility from the uh, Mauna Kea to the Tokyo. So uh, before the upgrading, so <coughs> We need to the one more weeks to analyze the uh, data. However, so the after the upgrading the 100 gigabit Ethernet network deployed, so all of the data analyzed to the uh, computing facility in Japan. So I mean that basically the Subaru telescope in 99, we just only have the one one point uh, 100 ATM Ethernet AP ATM based network. So the all of the computing analyzing uh, storage facility should be located in the Subaru. However, the currently the uh, high bandwidth network has been deployed from the Mauna Kea to the Tokyo. So mean that all of data transferred to the uh, Tokyo and uh, analyze the uh, computing facility in Tokyo. So that means a lot of accelerate to uh, analyze the data, just only currently the on under the one, one 10 minutes. So that's a very good impact for the astronomy uh, science. So, and also the Aruma has the currently the data transfer system, DTS system is upgrading. So the Aruma is, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, currently using a 10 gigabit Ethernet. However, that will be upgrading to the uh, 1.2 terabps network. So which is the based on the 400 gigabit Ethernet. So I mean that Currently, the we Mount Alma telescope has the multiple band receiver is existing the one single antenna. However, if bandwidth upgrading to the 1.2 terabps mean that all all receiver are sending data uh, are synchronous to, <laughs> to the synchronous to the uh, data centers in the uh, Santiago. So mean the, the fiber is also the deplo deployed to the over the six kilometer away from the uh, main site to the data center facilities. So these network improvement is improve the network functionality open the way to the new scientific frontier.
that is a very good impact for the bandwidth. So that's all from uh, me. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much um, from all three representatives from WIDE. Um, I uh, would like to open the floor if there have any questions for our three colleagues here. And I don't see anything in the chat, but as I said before, we'll have time at the end for more questions, and I have one or two up my sleeve too. But before then, um, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague Ieva from Norginet, who's going to talk to us about the Norginet view of subsea cables. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you, Henry, for the introduction. May I have the clicker, please? <coughs> so, uh, my name is Ieva Muraskena. I'm sorry for the voice. <coughs> I come from Nordnet. And uh, if someone introduced me, then I have to introduce Nordunet as well. Nordunet is a collaboration of the research and education networks of the five Nordic countries, Denmark, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, and Finland. Nordunet was established in 1985 when the five Nordic countries joined forces. And since then, Nordunet has been known to pioneer innovative solutions and push the boundaries of the technology from the beginning of history of the internet itself. The first connection between Stockholm and Princeton was uh, set up in 1988 with a capacity of 56 kilobits per second. And in 1989, Norden has established the first open available internet outside of the US. In 1991, Nordnet was selected to operate the first root name server. And then after that, a lot of other innovative solutions. Currently, Nordenet operates a global network that interconnects the research and education networks in the five Nordic countries and connects these uh, countries to the rest of the world. The high level of redundancy on the Nordics networks is ensured by using uh, the shared infrastructure as each end run in the Nordics provides spectrum for the Nordenet network itself. On global scale, Nordnet has present both in the, in the United States and Asia. <coughs> Going further, today I'm, I will talk more about the global communication problems and how we foresee to improve uh, the routes and what value we can bring to the uh, green data centers up in the north and uh, how we can make an impa impact on the climate science and uh, pr by presenting the smart cables. Fast and reliable internet is now vital for all, par for all parts of our modern society, being it private use, businesses, governments, research and education institutions. And going forward with the digital transformations, we will need the connectivity to be more resilient, more robust, bringing even more capacity to our everyday life. If we take a look at the statistics uh, and the we break down the distribution of internet traffic for the last five years, we can clearly see that the real-time traffic has grown the most. It's, near, it's more than three times growth. We cannot afford to have delays in real-time traffic. It's not acceptable anymore by any user. But if we take a look uh, at the example of research and education world, in the north of Europe, Nordnet provides connectivity, uh, high-speed high connectivity to ISCAT 3D, which is the next generation international atmos atmosphere and geospace research radar. With this high-speed connectivity, we enable real-time steering and data integration between the three sites of the ISCAT 3D, each consisting of the 10,000 antenna beam forming phase array systems. In Europe, we also have connectivity to Large Hadron, Hadron Collider in CERN. And throughout other research and education networks, we have connections also to ALMA Observatory in Chile. Before many, time, uh, many years, scientists had to wait for the dedicated time slots or several years to get access to the equipment on the network. But now, the connection needs to be up and running one, with 100% availability. You can imagine the pressure of delivering that. 
through the research and education networks. I don't know if many of you in the audience know what this picture is showing. If not, the answer is a methane plume from the Nord Stream gas pipeline explosion in the Baltic Sea. My point here is, you cannot protect the cable on its whole stretch, but what you can do is build more redundancies. Multiple cables can ensure redundancy and resilience for our networks. And that's why we need to look at geographical redundancy, meaning we need to look at alternative routes. And while doing that, we must keep geopolitical situation in mind, especially if we consider the Nord Stream case or similar cases wi which disrupted the submarine cables. Now, if we take a look again at the statistics and the connectivity today, uh, we take a projection to very near future. We would see uh, that we would have doubling of the traffic between Europe and Asia to be expected and almost tripling uh, to the traffic between Europe and North America. Depending on the perspective we take, it can be a big challenge, but it also can present us as an opportunity to take action and do something about it. Now, if we look at the connectivity from the perspective of Europe, we can divide it into four major parts, or four major areas. For example, Europe to North America connections. There are a lot of uh, cables connecting Europe to North America through the Atlantic Ocean, but a lot of systems are aging. And we do not know yet if there will be other systems built in time to serve the future need de and demands. Then we uh, go to Europe, Africa, and Europe, South America. The cables go outside of the coast of Africa with very limited redundancy. Connecting Asia, uh, we have a terrestrial route going across Russia. And due to a lot of geopolitical implication, this route is already more or less getting closed. A lot of contracts are being terminated. And then it leaves us uh, with the Suez route uh, to the Middle East. Uh, and, the a and Asia. Now, if we take a really closer look at the Suez, where currently 90% of the direct traffic between Europe and Asia traverses. It's a very narrow area. It's only 200 meters wide at the most narrow place. And you can imagine the congestion of the submarine cables there. It's basically a cable every 20 meters. And over this area, 1,500 trips pass every month. You can imagine there's danger. And to the challenges that I just mentioned, we can offer one solution if we take the Earth from the North Pole perspective and look at the route opportunities from the Arctic. We can see that we can build the additional redundancy or create complementary routes to the existing uh, Suez Canal area connections by adding submarine cables over the Arctic Ocean. It would be a fast track between Europe and Asia, as it is the shortest possible route. It would strengthen the, the digital sovereign sovereignty and, uh, of the involved regions. The route also avoids geopolitical considerations as it would go through exclusive economic zones of Norway, Denmark, Canada, US, and then traverse to Japan. But then you might ask, why are the Nordics involved? The Arctic connectivity would also increase the accessibility of the green data center industry in the far north. There we have a lot of uh, local excess energy from renewable energy sources, but due to lack of power infrastructure, there are limitations of how much uh, energy you can transfer from north to south. Additionally, there is a relatively high cost of transferring er energy in large distances. Therefore, moving data is much more efficient and cheaper than moving energy. In addition to this, we are where we have really cooler climate in the north, we can utilize the free cooling. We don't need air conditioning uh, to cool the data centers and we can reuse the excessive heat from them 
to the nearby communities. And also, if we land high-speed connectivity in the northern areas, we can create work opportunities and prevent young talents from re leaving northern communities from coastal areas of the Nordic countries. And all of these things combined, we create the Polar Connect Vision 2030, where Polar Connect is an initiative led by Nordnet to obtain secure and resilient connectivity through the Arctic to Asia and North America, where we see submarine cables over the Arctic adding a digital routes uh, from Europe. They improve uh, the digital resilience and autonomy in the global no network. They can create a ring structure of two or more cables traversing the Arctic Ocean. Here in this vision, we see Polar Connect, a more direct route passing under the ice cap of North Pole in the Arctic Ocean, just north of Greenland, uh, by exclusive economic zones, and then traversing to Asia. The other one, uh, the yellow one, is Far North Fiber, a route passing through Northwest Passage of Greenland and then to North America through Bering Strait and uh, then to Japan. Far North Fiber project is more advanced. It's uh, way ahead of us. It's scheduled to be in service in 2027 with the total distance of the submarine cable being 14,500 uh, kilometers where Polar Connect project aims to be in service uh, around 2030, with a total distance of 11,000 kilometers. A lot of questions can be raised from this vision, and one of them, is it doable? And we are working really hard to answer these questions. We are working together with the Swedish Polar Research Secretariat to find a way uh, if this is viable to cross the Arctic Ocean with the submarine cable? And the answer is yes. Their knowledge, uh, they shared the knowledge from their previous Arctic expedition. Uh, it was the Arctic Coring Expedition in 2004, uh, with a drill ship Vidar Viking and the two icebreakers, Orden and Sovietsky Soyuz. They were able to cross uh, the Arctic Ocean and do the expedition. So in essence, to be able to build the submarine cable over the Arctic, we need two icebreaker ships and one cable laying vessel. With this approach, we can cross the Arctic Ocean and put a submarine cable there. We, so while Sweden has one icebreaker, the government is already in the discussions about building a second icebreaker of the highest polar class, comparable to the Russian one you see here. And uh, with the preparations, we see it being ready by 2030. Additionally, uh, for the submarine cable, we need to have information about the seabed of the ocean. Where Arctic Ocean is largely unexplored territory, especially for intercontinental subsea cables, but it offers dramatic advantages for us all. So we must investigate the seabed. So we are working together with Professor Martin Jakobson from the Stockholm University and uh, his project, International Bathymetric Chart of the Arctic Ocean, well, the project is helping us to gather the information of on what's openly available about the seabed of the Arctic Oceans. So the initiative of this project is to develop a digital database that contains all available bathymetric data north of 64 degrees north uh, to be used by map, map, map makers, researchers, institutions, and others who work requires a detailed and accurate knowledge of the depth of and shape of the Arctic seabed, including our submarine cable. So what we see in this image is about 24% of the Arctic seafloor that is already mapped. And we will continue to work with this project to improve this map and fill out the gaps. We aim that the uh, seabed data will be available uh, and used to identify the potential route of the Arctic connectivity. And it will contribute further for us to de-risk the project and uh, contribute to the cable survey. So as you can see, Arctic connectivity can bring broader economic benefits for the productivity trade and our all consumer welfare. It will be the shortest route from Europe to uh, East Asia, safeguarding the minimal delay time.
but also submarine cables can serve as scientific instruments for Earth observation, marine and seismic research. Traditionally, we have scientists uh, making measurements in the Arctic Ocean by dropping various instruments from icebreakers into the Arctic Ocean. They either take uh, instant measurements or they are left to float and take measurements over time. But there are a lot of challenges. A lot of things can go wrong in the Arctic. Sometimes the instruments are lost and recovered, sometimes never recovered. This is where fiber sensing comes into play. We can enable submarine fiber cables be used as sensors by equipping them with uh, distributed acoustic sensing or state of polarization technology. Apart from that, we also uh, are familiar with the smart cable concept where, where fiber cables can be equipped with various sensors and can act like monitors under the sea. They can measure temperature, pressure, velocity, salinity, and together with the vibrations and acoustic sens uh, sensors can provide a very wide scope of observations around the cable. They can, they can also present near real-time data to be used by scientists, and this data can be used to improve forecasting mo models. It can be used to monitor climate change, ocean heat circulation. It can support us uh, while monitoring from natural disaster warning systems like uh, earthquakes or tsunamis. It can also help us understand marine mammal ecosystems better. The measurements will be continuous and over a long time, so and scientists will have access to this data. Also, fiber sensing can help us protect and monitor the cables themselves. So a lot of benefits on the scientific angles, which are really important, as this was not possible before. In addition to that, there's currently a lot of political momentum for the Arctic connectivity, as expressed by Margrethe Vestager, the executive vice president of Europe Fit for the Digital Age. In addition to that, in July, there was a memorandum of cooperation signed between uh, European Union and Japan, an MOC on submarine cables for secure, resilient, and sustainable global development. And this mock states that the Arctic route presents the potential to be expanded to wider European and Asian regions and to the Atlantic and the Pacific areas. And to realize this advantage, MOC expresses, expresses a shared intention to explore and facilitate joint and respective support action as appropriate on trans-oceanic submarine cables, such as awareness raising, financial supports, demand aggregation, and as appropriate facilitating relevant administrative processes. This was a joint statement by the President of European Council, Charles Michel, President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, and Prime Minister Kishida Fumio from Japan. And they met in Brussels and communicated this jointly. And with this positive note on multinational collaboration on submarine cables, I end my presentation. If you would like to know more, uh, we have a value proposition of submarine cables a report uh, by done by Copenhagen Economics. And also you can find a lot more information about uh, Polar Connect initiative under this QR code. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Eva. I had no idea that 90% of European traffic to Asia was at its narrowest point 200 meters wide. That was quite an eye opener for me. Um, does anyone in the audience have any questions for Eva? Oh, any in the chat? Um, I have some questions of my own, but I should also expand it to all of the speakers here, including Paul online, if anybody had any further questions. Please, um, I think that microphone should be working. Thanks. I need it because I'm losing my voice. Um, <laughs> nothing to do with karaoke. Um, <coughs> I did actually have a question for um, Eva um, about the um, cost of transferring energy versus data that you mentioned. Is there any um, reports or um, research you could uh, so point to for the There figures? is a, l a lot of res research done in that uh, value proposition in the report. Uh, we did investigate that. Uh, but it's due to lack of infrastructure or the costs for actually transferring okay. the power. So you can... I can share the report with you. 
and uh, we can discuss it. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, any further questions? Um, well, then I'll rattle off a few of my own. Um, I'd actually like to, I might start online with, uh, with Paul, because he's uh, uh, staying up very late in the UK to be with us here, so I'm very, very happy that he is. Um, Paul, you mentioned in your presentation um, the Bella project, and you were a big part in making that happen between uh, Jean, Reclar, and the EC. Um, I'd just like to know or see your perspective on what would you say were, was the highest challenge in actually bringing together those stakeholders in an R&E context in order to make uh, Bella happen? I think uh, first you had the challenge of it being a pathfinder. Um, in our global community, uh, NRENs haven't had a lot of experience in investing in um, submarine cables at their inception, at the build date. They tend to procure from a more established market. So there was working in, in a new space with different ways of working and then um, being a publicly funded body comes with certain uh, requirements for compliance, governance and how the money was spent. And that was sometimes at odds with the way the telecommunications industry works. So trying to find a, a common way of working that satisfies everybody's obligations uh, was a challenge. Um, we were carrying out the project as well um, during some difficult times in the world's economy with Latin America particularly as well uh, and Brazil so ensuring funding was available um, there were there were challenges throughout the project um, so I don't think I have one particular one that rises above all of the others um, but these submarine cable systems are big pieces of heavy engineering um, taking lots of resources uh, complexity to design construct and build um, so there are many moving parts. It's, it's not a it's not a simple uh, project. Thank you, Paul. Um, no, it doesn't. I remember at the time, it of course wasn't an, an easy one to get over the line as such, but it did work and it was a success. Um, Jun, I liked your slides um, and a part which struck me especially because I'm like more from a public affairs policy point of view was you showed the different political agreements on the different projects um, between Europe, other countries, and you, you were show, showing the, like, the multi-stakeholders of uh, these, these different areas. And I was wondering, um, with your experience, what has been, in your view, the more successful projects that have had multiple member states or, or nations uh, collaborating together, and what do you think were the reasons that made them a success? Well, <coughs> that's a that's a great question. Um, it's uh, you know the you know this is I mean thirty thirty years is a long time, and the, then you know so it's always a uh, um, different different interest different uh, funding could be up, up available for the you know creating the future of the kind of uh, uh, fiber networking and other things. So. Um, uh, one time, it was uh, very much uh, you know, kind of a satellite uh, transponder uh, company uh, was uh, exploring the way for the you know uh, the allocating the spectrum. So uh, they wanted to work together, and the therefore the you know kind of uh, their transponder is uh, uh, how do we say that uh, in kind uh, to to work together with right, and uh, then the, uh, also the. Uh, you know, submarine cable itself is not that uh, uh, particular thing, but the all the high-speed switches and the uh, equipment uh, is going to be, uh, you know, co so the vendor started to uh, create the new um, uh, high-speed switch from, uh, you know, kind of, uh, say, uh, whatever, the 10 gig to 100 gig. They, wa they really wanted to test that in with uh, interoperability and other things. So uh, multiple companies working together with us uh, for the exploring the um, the interoperability testing and the other thing, so these are the uh, research 
network uh, mission that they're working together. So uh, that's uh, one of the reasons I uh, intentionally introducing today about the Rodham type of uh, challenges so that the, uh, probably the new, new, new generation of the optical submarine cable control might be achieved working together with those people. And uh, then uh, they want to test that, and that we want to test that. And uh, therefore, the probably uh, it's a kind of mutual benefit uh, to work together. Uh, from the point of view of uh, investment to the new technology, it's a very ex could be very expensive. But uh, then for the testing purpose and the other thing, then it's a kind of a mutual benefit without uh, you know, actually paying. So I said the in kind, right? So this is a testing, therefore they bring the equipment and they're working together. So uh, so it's a varied uh, for the time by time that the how that uh, uh, research type of a funding could be benefit for the real operation of the uh, creating the network. So that's a white project, probably characteristic in the world, right? So we are always, <laughs> exploring the new technology so that uh, um, probably the fundraising uh, is not that high, but uh, we can challenge the new things. So that's a model of the white project. But it, it reminds me, if you're working with these actors and you're, you're talking about in-kind contributions, that's very similar to reciprocity between NRENs when we make agreements in such a sense. Okay. Oh, oh by the way, I, I forgot the very important thing uh, during uh, our presentation uh, to to all of the European side of the people. So the talking about Southeast Asia connectivity for the researchers, that was uh, uh, initiated by what Keiko mentioned, like I in the utilizing a satellite, but uh, I really, uh, we, we, should, we should note that the 10 efforts to connect them is uh, very, very, very much uh, you know the next generation of uh, terrestrial uh, connectivity to Southeast Asia collaboration with the uh, EU and the GEN, and uh, then they, then now uh, we are uh, working together for the new generation. I mean, utilizing your uh, Arctic Ocean or the uh, the uh, thinking, redesigning the uh, southern. Uh, connectivity as well. So uh, that's basically the phase one. It's going to be uh, by satellite. Phase two going to be by TAIN. And the phase three we are talking about. Those those historical uh, things uh, should be mentioned clearly by me or Keiko. But I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me add, add one. Um, TAIN, T-E-I-N, and Trans-Eurasia Information Network. Um, the initiative supported by EU to connect ITC, ICT infrastructure between Asia and Europe a long time ago. But uh, we, we now TAIN is phase four, and uh, that strongly supported uh, the not only U EU to Asia, but um, Pan-Asia connectivity, um, basically Singapore-centered uh, uh, connectivity, right? Of course, uh, but still there, of course. It's sti since a long time ago. Okay, thank you. Oh, if I ask just a simple question, um, when was the first iteration of Tain? Um, do, you, do you remember when it began? Because Tain is like the Géant version. It's the regional network of Southeast Asia. Yeah, that's so. a question to you, actually. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> or, or Paul. Paul. Paul knows about the exact uh, year when it's... In the 80s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the yeah, but the ca cable CA1 started uh, later, uh, probably m middle 90s, I believe. Okay. Thank you very much. I mean, it just also goes to show that um, NRENs and regional networks were really uh, pioneers at the beginning um, of the boom of the internet. And I, for one, am honored to have so many colleagues who were there at that point. Um, I would like, I saw a few people come in. I'd just like to open the floor for any final questions um, to our guests. Yes, um, microphone here or, okay, thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. <laughs>
My name is uh, Bjorn Rønning. I'm representing the data Norwegian data center community, uh, i.e. the commercial part of a potential problem uh, projects. So uh, my first question is uh, endorsements by governments. But I think the reason for asking is, uh, I guess this is uh, going to be an extremely costly project. So already been mentioned that you have to commission a new icebreaker <laughs> just to get get this over there. But that can probably be repurposed to other tasks than cable deployment and, and cable maintenance. Um, so obviously, I think and um, I consider this project to be too much of a heavy lift for only for the entrance. But no offense by no means, but I think that. There sh should be, we should probably expect that you have some governmental funding or you need to have a, uh, a common uh, Nordic or even European uh, and also on, a, on the Asian side and a Japanese common understanding and agreement on, on how to fund this project. Um, because then there all also has to be done some financial viability on the return of investments so how much is uh, um, um, how much is one um, willing to to sacrifice uh, for returns on investment? Worst case, I don't know if I made myself clear or if I should probably dive into details. No, I, I have my own thoughts on it, but it's for Jun or Oyeva oh. to or Paul to to answer. Yeah, this. Paul uh, Scott I, is I think you are right. I mean. So, uh, you know, yeah, I, I was going to explain a little bit more on that, that part, but, uh, you know, the, the research and the educational network contribution for the, you know, kind of investment is uh, just, uh, you know, probably, uh, you know, the 10% or 5% of the actual in installation cost, I believe. But the important thing is that for the uh, Nordinet and ourselves, uh, from the both sides that, uh, you know, the cable company pr uh, had a plan. And uh, then, you know, we kind of uh, uh, generated a letter of uh, interest uh, from uh, both sides that uh, once it's uh, installed, then uh, we're going to occupy like, uh, you know, kind of 5% uh, of the capacity uh, along fiber pair entire for the research and the educational uh, community. So, um, that might be possible. It's not that easy, but the fundraising for the research and education for five percent of the uh, entire cable installation, right? And the other part, of course, uh, need to be uh, you know kind of uh, um, uh, in investment has to coming from the commercial or the public entity, uh, other than research and educational purposes. So. Uh, this is not that easy. So uh, in the past, then uh, you know a number of uh, projects failed because of uh, the lack of the you know con consortium building uh, was not successfully done uh, to to uh, raise enough uh, funding. Uh, but um, so for this one, uh, we kind of uh, did uh, uh, very special approaches. Uh, different than the past on uh, you know other part of the cable, which is. Uh, uh, the um, the uh, which one uh, the poll explained about the EU Japan uh, digital partnership agreement, which is a uh, very much a public entity endorsing that, that this is going to be needed for not only for the research and educational scientific one, but the, all the economy of the both end. So that is the way that uh, uh, I, I don't think a government can raise, support the commercial activities. I don't believe that, but they can, they can endorse. That means, uh, you know, the Japanese government, frankly, already started to communicate with the uh, uh, economy industries that, uh, and the financial industry that uh, you're gonna get the benefit of uh, this cable. If that is the case, then you have opportunity to invest. Uh, for the uh, optical fiber because this is special. So that kind of a promotion already uh, supported by the government in Japan already. So this is a, a additional uh, endorsement type of efforts from the public, uh, uh, I mean government side. So I think this is good that, uh, I, and, and I don't remember this has been done in the past on the history. So the, the EU-Japan Digital Partnership Agreement uh, is uh, now uh, extending 
the the kind of uh, uh, industry and the scope of the people and the stakeholders to be involved for the supporting the industry. So the research and the education are actually initiated that kind of thing. So so Nordinet and ourselves said we want this cable, and that this might be. So so we kind of started the efforts and then. The, uh, inviting the other other stakeholders to be involved. So uh, this is a very special way, I believe. But uh, what what do you think? I mean, yeah, I, I agree everything you said. And uh, from the Nordic's perspective, of course, we need to engage with the Nordic ministries and governments to get their support and endorsement, equally like in Japan. But apart from the governments, we also engage with the European Commission to ensure that there's relevant support from their side to ensure also the funding opportunities that we can explore to have the conversation with them as well because they also made some promises. We also contribute to the goals uh, they are expecting us to deliver on. And we benefit from the unique position we have from the research and education point. We can talk to them all and also engage with the commercial side. And that partnership with Japan and having connections to Japan also helps to communicate our message even further and for them to communicate it back so that both ends of the connectivity are engaged. And we create this multiple use cases uh, to have the arguments that we really need such infrastructure on our end. It's not just the connectivity that we talk about. We talk about much more benefits added on top of simple submarine cable. So I think there's there's good progress. And we're also working on de-risking the project for the commercial side, so to make them a little bit more attracted to the idea. Uh, we're working on building the business cases, exp exploring the opportunities there. So it's, no, it's not just that we talk, but we also do the work, the seabed survey, the the resources we need to for actually building the cable, but to know when they will be available so we can make use of them. So I think there's there's good progress. Thank you. Thanks, Siova. Um, Paul, did you still want to answer before I move on to the next question? I think a lot of the uh, the good points have been made there. I would just reinforce the point. Um, yeah. We've got some experience of doing this now. Um, in the Bella case study, I gave as an example. So. In the Mediterranean with the Medusa system recently and in both of those instances as Yeva and Jun have said it's about a collaboration of partnerships so the the question from the floor there is absolutely right that NRENs alone can't deliver this um, whether it's the, the financial investment the skills the expertise the resources uh, you know, the, there's government there's funding bodies there's the user communities the skills that we have within NRENs you know as, as we explained that the history of the internet comes from our community so we're we're pretty good at building networks um but the, the heavy lifting of, of actually implementing a, a submarine cable we work closely with with commercial partners um and i'd like to say that i think we're quite desirable partners there uh, you ever use the term there around de-risking uh, with public funds and our use case supporting research and education we're a a good partner to have on board um, to, to enable a project to, to progress. Thanks, Hendrik. Thank you very much. Paul. Um, I think we have another question from the audience. I'm wondering if part of the story then is also a security and resilience one, if you're looking at it from a government perspective. So from one side, you've got the ability to pump time down this, so you've got a GPS type of uh, solution there. But then what is the cost of disaster recovery after an event? So if you can predict, predict tsunamis, for example, if you can predict earthquakes, surely that has a very strong business case. So we're working with the likes of Google and British Telecom at the moment to test some of these. And of course, all of these companies are looking for new revenue streams and new services and products. So I think that is part of the story as well. And I'd welcome your thoughts on that. Thank you. Anyone want to take that, that up? You have a well, um, Yeah, probably that is a, a little bit different from the uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, following me, uh, probably smart cable concept uh, should be explained from an audience side. Uh, but uh, then uh, in Japan, uh, we've been, you know, suffered with the earthquake very much. And uh, then, you know, so uh, the smart cable concept is uh, like, uh, you know, um, piggybacking a sensors on a commercial communication cable, right? But uh, that is not enough for Japan. And uh, therefore, the uh, the 
National Laboratory of Earthquake Seismic Study uh, had a, uh, its own uh, collaboration with a cable company for the you know, specific uh, uh, type of uh, sensors to be installed. So uh, historically, we started from the uh, well expired communication cable and the putting the sensor in the uh, for the you know kind of uh, detecting the uh, earthquake or the uh, mitigation for the earthquake type of a thing. But uh, now it's a kind of a very much. Uh, um, the we we now identify that this area of ocean is going to be a very I mean bottom of the ocean is going to be very dangerous. Therefore, uh, we have a very specific uh, installation uh, of the sensor cable, uh, so the its its own uh, purposes as well. So uh, uh, it's a very serious in this country. <laughs> so uh, and uh, so um, the meaning that separate funding. For the you know kind of a co commercial companies funding and the uh, research and the educational traffic funding and the uh, uh, seismic funding uh, 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 a little bit different funding possible in Japan because of the frequency of the earthquake. Anyone like to add? Uh, just a little comment. So last week we as Nordunet had a uh, science engagement workshop. Uh, we engage with the scientists and look uh, what kind of opportunities they want to see on the submarine cables. And there's a lot of good uh, conversations, but there's also an understanding of how different the commercial companies want to use the cables and the how different it is for the scientists what they want. They want accuracy. They want a lot of information. So alone, the submarine cable cannot replace other research instruments, but it can contribute highly to early warning or just, hey, look, something is happening at that end. Maybe you want to look more closely, that kind type of information, but not be the main source of seismicity or other types of uh, natural disasters. But we can contribute to the scientific research. We can bring the information to the table, but not be the main source of it. So we need to kind of distribute the expectations a little bit. <laughs> but it's really insightful to talk to the scientists. They have really good comments. Thank you. Thank you, Yohoba. Um Are there any further questions? No, I don't see any in the chat. Well, I think with that, I will close the session. Um, I'd really like to thank everybody who presented today and who attended from remotely across the world and for those of you who turned up for this session this morning. Um, it's been an eye-opener for me and I very much appreciate everyone's input. So thank you so much and um, enjoy your coffees. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you very much. Have a good day all. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And the audience, please visit our booth after that. <laughs> then, then you can you can touch and you can you can install <laughs> your your dream to theirs.
sorting out some technical issues, but the link isn't working for those joining online. So, sorry, we didn't get to your question.
Hi, uh, good, good morning, good afternoon, good morning, I think. Um, Wakas, are you online? Are we able to hear you? Are we able, we're checking to see if our participants online are able to, yes, so they can hear us. Hi, Dan, can you, can you hear us too? Yes, okay, great, there, and we can see you as well. Okay, great, Good morning. thank you everyone. Apologies for the technical delays. It wouldn't be an IGF if there weren't internet connectivity or some other technical glitch. I think they just do it as a reminder to how important the internet is for all types of socioeconomic uh, activities, including news. So it's a good reminder of how important the work that we're doing is. I'm gonna pass it to Courtney Ratch, who is going to introduce our session. Courtney? Great, well, thank you for everyone joining us here in the room in Kyoto, as well as everyone online around the world. Um, we're really excited to have you here today because we think that there are very few issues that are as important as figuring out how to balance the need for technology, innovation, and governance, and ensuring the sustainability of journalism and news media. So we are the Dynamic Coalition on Journalism and News Media. We're gonna kind of drop the sustainability because it's really long, so think of DC journalism going forward. Um, and today we're going to have a three-part session. So first we are going to hear from the authors of our annual report, uh, which is out now and we have some hard copies as well as digital copies that colleagues from the global forum on media development which help run the secretariat will be sharing online and invite you to sign up for the mailing list so you can receive that um, then we're going to have an open forum for folks in the room and online who are interested in and in working in this topic to share their own work and research. And so we'll invite you, um, we have invited several to, to participate in that, and this is again part of our efforts to make sure that this is a very dynamic, inclusive, wide-ranging discussion on the range of topics that sit at the intersection of internet governance and media sustainability. Um, and then we will have uh, a Q&A session and we'll talk a little bit about the Dynamic Coalition and what our plans are for the next year. And, and again, those are all set by the community. This is uh, a, an effort that we, our, uh, this year we determined, for example, that data, transparency, and access are essentially what we call the trifecta um, for media sustainability. And so every year we determine the priorities based on the input from the community. So um, with that, I wanna welcome everyone who's here in Kyoto, thank you for joining us and turn it over to, oh, I should probably mention, I'm one of the three co-coordinators of the Dynamic Coalition my name is Courtney Raj. I'm the director of the Center for Journalism and Liberty at Open Markets Institute, a think tank based in Washington, DC. Um, Dan O'Malley is another co-coordinator, and we're now going to move to our third co-coordinator, Wakas Naif, who is online, and we'll welcome our online participants. Wakas, over to you. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, a warm welcome to everyone who has joined us online. Um, again, we apologize about the technical difficulties. Um, as Courtney mentioned at the Dynamic Coalition, we're really interested in hearing your insights and perspectives on the digital policies and the regulatory frameworks that affect new sustainability. Uh, this year, the coalition has also focused on uh, issues related to data sharing and transparency in data practices, especially in connection with uh, big tech companies. As many of you might have noticed during the year, um, there is uh, there seems to be a growing reluctance among big tech companies um, about um, the uh, distribution of news on their uh, platforms. Sometimes this is in relation to or in reaction to government policies, uh, and sometimes um, also in reaction to industry demands, um, which is why we feel that although many of us are working on these issues at the international level, uh, a lot of you who are um, uh, focusing on these issues at the local or national levels, your work also has a great deal of value for us, uh, especially in discussions such as the one we are about to have, a sort of global collaborative effort or debate on this topic. Um, so um, we really appreciate your interest. Please feel free to use the chat uh, to share your um, questions, comments, or suggestions, and we will try our best to uh, include them during the Q&A session. Uh, thank you once again. Looking forward to an excellent discussion. Uh, back to you, uh, Courtney and Dan. Great. Thank you, Wakas. 
Uh, my name is Daniel O'Malley from the Center for International Media Assistance, and now we're going to hop in to the first section of today's agenda, and that is um, the launch of our Dynamic Coalition's annual report, which I have copies up here up front if anyone wants to grab one after um, after the session's over. Essentially, as a Dynamic Coalition, you know, what our one of our goals is to make sure that we have a group of multi a, a multi stakeholder group. So we have about eighty participants coming from civil society. Uh, media regulators, governments, uh, big tech companies, and uh, small tech companies as well, looking at these issues holistically because we think that oftentimes uh, the the issue of, of news is is focused just on like a content component and not necessarily on other issues like the the sustainability of news ecosystems. And as a dynamic coalition, we aren't just active for this one day, one. Uh, session at IGF, we actually have a series of activities that we do throughout the year as we try to collect information. So we do a series of, of quarterly learning calls. And one of the most important activities that we do is actually the, the creation of our annual report, where we try to capture a snapshot of some of the most important issues facing news media over the past year. And um, in, in particular, uh, this year's, um, and, and, and our report is a compilation of articles that are contributed by our members. So. Uh, we it's a it's a collaborative uh, crowdsourced effort to to capture these topics this year there were kind of three big topics that came out through the contributions from our members one is the, the power imbalance between media and tech giants so that we have articles that are exploring how the dominant tech companies are redefining media sustainability uh, through controlling advertising uh, revenues and data so looking at that relationship between big tech and media Another one uh, that, that comes through in some of our articles is the, that government r regulations are a dual-edged sword. Um, so this explores how policies like data protection laws can both support or stifle uh, media affecting freedom and operational capabilities, for example. Um, we're in a regulatory period where there's a lot of work done in this area, and you know, Courtney's been at the, the front of a lot of these discussions uh, you know, how uh, particularly regulations of like the DSA are impacting media, and we're seeing there's a double-edged sword there. There's some really great things that can come out of that, but there's also some, some challenges as well. Um, and then we also look into kind of some of uh, technological innovations and ethical dilemmas. In particular, uh, this year's topic that everyone's been speaking about, generative AI, and what does that mean for uh, the news media space, especially as large language models are trained on news content um, as news organizations are going to start using generative AI technologies to, to do reporting, to facilitate communication. So looking at these new technologies and what that means for the practice of journalism as well as news ecosystems in general. Um, so I would, we, we have just launched our, re our report online today and for those who are in the chat, I believe uh, online, I believe Laura is sharing the link. Um, and you can grab a copy up front. We're now going to have uh, a chance for some of our uh, article authors to discuss their contributions. So we have been having technical difficulties, but I believe that uh, Mike Harris may be online via Zoom. Mike, are you, are you there? Great, okay, so Mike Harris is a co-founder of a uh, brief introduction, I'll pass it to Mike. Mike Harris is a co-founder of Exonym. He devised the decentralized rule book system with uh, patents pending in both the US and EU, has over 20 years of experience in ICT and is an expert uh, in distributed uh, privacy by design systems. And his article in this year's uh, uh, report is establishing independence and parity in the area of internet giants. And just because we have, uh, we've been a little bit delayed, I'm going to ask our speakers to keep their interventions to, to three minutes. Mike? Hi, I'm, I'm not sure how, how I'll do with three minutes, but I'll get going. Good morning. Uh, today, I'm going to present a new technology that will help news media address the pressing challenges it faces with very large online platforms. The, the problem is simple. Today's digital infrastructure no longer supports the independence that the web was originally designed for, and that's vital for a healthy news media ecosystem. 
search and social media completely changed our information ecosystem. We moved from a model of competing with related products to one of opaque algorithms competing with all information. Real news, content that look like news, state-sponsored disinformation are all treated equally. Aggregators like Facebook and Google control how information flows, not only shaping our individual worldviews, but directly capturing news media's primary revenue stream. This is in direct result of a network utilities taking ownership of web governance. Now, I'm speaking not as an expert in journalism, but as a technologist who has developed a tool to target this specific problem. Decentralized rule books are a new tool to establish standards, rules, and policies across the internet. They're not a platform or a blockchain. They're public documents that anyone can create. Joining a rulebook gives users credentials to access web services and benefits. The framework provides a new model of internet governance without centralized authority. So how does news media leverage this new model? Rulebooks empower the news media industry to differentiate its online content by publishing under higher standards of integrity. In other words, content that claims to be news will need to live up to the standards of journalism defined in the rulebook. Publishing under such a rulebook provides a trust signal which platforms and users can use to label and filter content. It's an authenticated blue tick that journalists can apply to increase trust in their publications. If they fall below standards, they can lose it and are subject to penalty when they want to get it back. The pace of everyday life calls for basic binary signals. This is in stark contrast to trust signals, which are not only highly contextual, but diverse. Here, the blue tick is enough to know that someone is accountable to upholding specific standards and rules. To better understand the context, consumers can click to read the rules and see who's managing them. We can see here that the article is moderated by the FT, which is regulated by the FCA and claims to be news. That claim is voluntary, so these rules can require truthfulness, yet can't limit free speech. The certificates are user generated so they can apply to a domain or a specific article. Moreover, they can even contain metadata so rules can mandate user tagging, say for adult content. A crucial feature for journalists is the system's ability to protect anonymity while still ensuring accountability. Journalists can publish in full adherence to rulebook standards without fear of direct identification. By deploying a rulebook, the industry would be providing content governance as an information layer for applications, and so it becomes easier to discuss what is fair with respect to governance. Rulebooks will move us from asking how do we achieve an outcome to what do we want to achieve? We are grateful to publish here today because we believe the IGF is the appropriate forum to initiate this kind of bottom-up user-driven policy deployment. The IGF observes an equal footing between stakeholders and rulebooks empower groups and organizations to realize this equal footing. So if you're determined to address these challenges, we would like to hear from you. So please do get in touch. Thank you for listening. Great. Thank you so much, Mike Harris. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things that uh, I really like about the IGF as well is that we have people with the technical community, people with these types of expertise that that Mike brings to our group um, who, who uh, challenge us to think about opportunities and innovation in, in new ways. I now want to um, check and see if Prue Clark is online and um, is able to join us. I am, Dan. Great. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great to see you, Prue. So, Prue Clark is an international journalist, a nonprofit executive, and professor who has uh, reported from over 20 countries um, for leading publications such as the Washington Post, won awards including the Edward Murrow Prize, and Prue co founded and leads New Narratives, a nonprofit newsroom that collaborates with Global South newsrooms um, on investigative journalism and news business building. And she, along with her co-author, Maureen Shea, uh, 
wrote uh, uh, an article for the report called Digital Inno Innovation in Liberia's Media Sector, Challenges and Opportunities in Low-Income Democracies. So now, uh, if you could, if Prue, I'll pass the word over to you. Great. Thank you, Dan, and thank you to the Dynamic Coalition. I'm uh, really pleased to be able to have this opportunity to just flag something that's been really concerning a lot of people, I think, in low-income countries, that to a large extent we're being left out of the opportunities that are coming for digital transformation. And uh, I really wanted to highlight some things, some work that we've been doing in Liberia with new narratives. So I just wanted to highlight that there are 19 low income countries left in Africa, according to the World Bank's latest rankings. That's uh, out of 24 in total. And we're seeing countries like Nigeria and Kenya, South Africa, and to a lesser extent, uh, countries like Ghana, where there are opportunities for news media to build better digital products, to better serve and monetize their digital audiences. They're coming from foundations, they're coming from digital platforms, and they're coming from governments. And they're really not coming to these low-income countries. Uh, we've just done some work with Swedish government funding with Liberia's leading newsrooms. We brought business and editorial leads from Premium Times in Nigeria, which a lot of you will know has really been breaking ground in Africa on uh, digital innovation, um, great new digital tools to do uh, journalism, but also to build an independent business model. So we brought them to Liberia to do a sort of hacks and hackers, which had never happened before. And it was a complete revelation to the Liberian news media who had no idea that they could make money from social media, that they, um, they didn't have the te technical capacity to develop apps and websites or donation or membership offerings. And they'd never really even heard of these opportunities before. They're still completely dependent on government advertising and payments from newsmakers uh, for distorted coverage. And, and even when they really, really want to do great journalism, and, and there are a lot of very dedicated journalisms in these places, but they've not had the same opportunities to build independent revenue streams that Daily Trust or Premium Times have had in Nigeria or Daily Maverick in South Africa, for example. Um, and they've also not had the opportunities for grants to fund their journalism that media in larger countries have had. And of course, these are um, emerging democracies democracy is extremely fragile. We've seen eight military coups in the low-income countries of the Sahel region in the last two years. So I don't need to ha uh, tell you how important strong journalism is in these places to building democratic uh, resilience and to avert political instability, food insecurity that is driving migration to uh, Western countries now and is only going to increase um, as we go forward. So it's, it's, it's really vital. At the same time, news media in these countries have had no protection from the digital platforms. They're, they're completely consumed or subsumed by them. Facebook is the internet for two thirds of Liberians. Uh, the journalism content comes to them from Facebook. But to just to give you an example um, of how left out of the conversation they are, last year, the Daily Observer, the country's second biggest newspaper, was hacked and the hackers started sending out images of barely clad women from the Facebook page. Um, Facebook ignored all the pleas for help from the Daily Observer and it was only when Internews that was working in the country with a USAID grant stepped in that Facebook actually returned ownership of the uh, page to the media house. By that time they had lost masses of Facebook users and they, their rival now has seven times the number of Facebook followers. So I, I, I just want to say I understand why bigger economies have an appeal. They have a larger middle class to monetize. They have more technological capacity. But I think that misses some really important advantages of quality news media in low income countries too, really. They have a captive diaspora audience who can't get their news from anywhere else. Uh, they are relatively wealthy and they live in democracies that place a high value on, 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 the, on journalism and its role in democracy. Um, secondly, these newsrooms have very low labour costs. So one of the leading newsrooms in Liberia told me they operate on just $50,000 a year. So it you can imagine if they could convert just 1,000 audience members 
uh, in the diaspora to pay $50 a year, they would double their annual revenue immediately. But they've had no opportunity to develop a membership model uh, or, or any donation opportunities. Um, the media bosses estimated to us that just $10,000 would be enough to get them to the next level where they could really take advantage of the opportunities to monetize audiences. It's a small investment compared um, with, with the amounts of money that we've been spending to build these democracies in the first place. And I think it's uh, really essential that we, we start to think about these. So um, in my recommendations, just quickly, you know, that donors really start thinking about these, these uh, it, with more nuance about supporting news media in these countries, that they need to understand the opportunities that are available for digital transformation to build digital revenues, independent revenue streams. Um, they need to get away from this just supporting community radio, and that's sort of the end of the story. Um, <clears throat> they should fund give grants to fund journalism in low-income countries. They need to work a bit harder to find the quality media, but, but if it's true that funding, uh, donor funding is needed to support um, American journalism, it's triply so in Africa, obviously. Uh, uh, great, thank, also, thank you, Prue. We're gonna- Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we have to move on. I mean, I think this is great. I mean, I think there are a couple of things here, you know, one, to one point, you know, it's important that we, when we have these news conversations that we incorporate you know, not just what's happening in the EU or in North America, but the, the entire global South, including least developed countries. And also an interesting component is the way that issues around um, trust and safety and, and, and flagging can also have impacts on media sustainability and users. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm now gonna pass uh, to our, our next author, Juliette Nanfuka, who is sitting to my right and is a longtime friend of mine. She's a digital rights researcher and advocate who has worked on various initiatives to improve internet governance structures digital accessibility, and inclusion in Africa. Juliet works at the Collaboration on International ICT Policy for East and Southern Africa, also known as CIPESA, uh, a research center that helps policymakers understand ICT policy issues. And she contributed an article titled, Navigating the Uncertainty of Gen I in Ugandan Newsrooms. So I'll pass the mic to you. And if we could just keep our remarks to about three minutes. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. Please excuse me, my flu is acting up this morning. Okay, so I'm from Uganda, as mentioned earlier, and I looked at the AI landscape in the country. I was really excited to do it, but I found it was very limited. Um, and on top of that, few wanted to actually talk about it due to the uncertainty and um, perhaps limited confidence that they had to talk about it, even as media owners to some extent. Nonetheless, there were a few people who spoke about it. I was looking at it through the lens of their perceptions on it and the greater scheme of things for the media industry when it comes to the global um, media sector. And I found that in comparison to other countries, we are struggling desperately in the country. As uh, Pru has pointed out, some of the challenges in Liberia are similar to what we have in Uganda of media viability, trying to stay alive, what business models um, are we utilizing? How are we thinking about these things? Um, Uganda is right next door to Kenya, but behaves very differently in terms of how it structures itself as a business model, how it engages with its, media, with its journalists, how it manages retention. Those are issues that we're struggling with in Uganda. But now we're going into this whole AI realm, which is introducing yet another layer to this whole media industry, but it's something that is um, creating a sense of uncertainty, but at the same time is not has not spiked a sense of urgency in the sector, which I found rather alarming, especially as Mike pointed out, we, other countries are talking about rule books. They're at a very different level, while we are still struggling to get ourselves organized, even at a media guild level. At least that's in comparison to neighboring Kenya. So we are, as a media sector in the country, navigating way too much. We're trying to play catch up to models that other countries, more advanced countries have long since moved past. And um, we are not adequately thinking about what AI is going to do to the landscape. Um, at a global level, we're aware of that, but we're not really factoring in what it's going to do to the landscape at a national level. Um, when I interrogated some media houses on their investment into, or their interest at least, into investing into navigating the AI space, it was very apparent that the budget, the funding for that, is not quite a priority. 
and such interests have then fallen onto individual journalists who are already struggling with poor salaries, who are already struggling to stay afloat with much of the trends in the media sector. Um, those who can afford it have taken the leap and are educating themselves, but how they will apply it in the media house is again another issue that many are yet to make sense of. There is um, an appreciation of what, how AI can be used to do big media stories, to do big data analysis, but again, those are not necessarily stories that media houses are chasing. Um, we did have a lot, uh, one, one thing I picked up was there's a lot of reliance on the civil society uh, sector to upskill journalists in that regard and to push for a type of content in media. However, it is still a slippery slope um, as civil society should not really be pushing content to journalists to go out and actually look for, for the stories. But I guess they're looking at it in terms of skills development. But I, m one of the arguments that emerged there was that it is not necessarily the, ro the role of civil society entities to train journalists. You're letting media houses get off the hook in terms of developing models that will enhance media training, media retention, rather the training of the, the retention of journalists in the media houses. So that was one of the issues that um, stood out for me. Um, that's it? Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Great, Juliet. I mean, I think this is an issue that obviously everyone's talking about here, Gen AI, topic of the main session. So I think it's really interesting to think about it in our work and all the different angles. It's not just content production, it's business models, it's how people are engaging with news. Um, now I'm pleased to pass the mic to Courtney Ratch, who has already introduced herself, but she has uh, contributed an article that is titled Weaponizing U.S. Copyright and EU Privacy Law for Censorship Globally. Thanks so much. So I've long been interested in how um, tech platforms create an economic and political logic that constrain the viability and sustainability of news media around the world. And so what I recognized um, and, and, and found doing empirical work that included hundreds of interviews and surveys of journalists around the world, including technical um, assistance to get accounts back when they were closed because of um, copyright violations and increasingly privacy violations is that the techno-legal regimes of the United States and the European Union shape the visibility and viability of news media worldwide and yet there's an insufficient lack recognition of that by policymakers in those companies. Furthermore, the way that the dominant tech platforms, particularly the meta and Google um, platforms, which are the you know, create the publishing audience um, monetization platforms for the vast majority of news media worldwide, um, create a possibility and constrain or create potentiality. They, they have to translate policies into technical um, policy and content moderation rules that affect news media around the world. So um, the US and EU copyright, so the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, in particular the DMCA, and privacy laws like the GDPR, are inscribed into the global tech platforms through their AI systems, their content moderation procedures, their terms and services, and specifically things like notice and takedown or notice and stay down requirements, hashing and filtering. So we'll, we see that tech platforms will adjust algorithms to help reduce the visibility or the virality of problematic content, for example, or prevent its upload in the first place, which is what the DMCA does. YouTube has interpreted the DMCA to create hashing databases that filter content at the level of upload. So we see in the United States, for example, that police officers specifically play cop very popular copywritten music in order to trigger the automated filters that will prevent journalists and citizen journalists from filming them when they are committing police abuses, for example. And that, that has actually now been instructed to, organi to police um, in some precincts. And so this is really problematic that a legal regime that exists is being weaponized and there is no um, penalty for, for doing this. Furthermore, what we see is that because the tech platforms that are based in the US 
um, have a responsibility to implement the DMCA worldwide, this amounts to a global copyright regime. And because they receive statutory immunity, they only receive safe harbor if they prevent the, the copyright content from being uploaded. But they are not also responsible for ensuring that they are not weaponized by bad actors. Um, and, and there is also no meaningful action against content, content farms that plagiarize that content. So we know, for example, Facebook, as much as 60% of engagement comes from instant articles that are um, based on scraped content. So what we're seeing around the world is that criminals, corrupt officials, and a burgeoning industry devoted to influence operations and reputation management are weaponizing these techno-legal regimes to censor media with impunity. This is because of a failure of policymakers to rectify loopholes or enforce penalties like criminal pen penalties for false copyright claims and a failure of the technology platforms to redress recurrent abuses and improve safeguards for the media. Um, addressing these deep structural inequalities is essential if we're going to enable a viable news media around the world. Thanks. Great, thank you, Courtney. And uh, we now are gonna turn to uh, Juliana Harcianti, who contributed an article, Digital Regulation, Media Sustainability, and Freedom of, of Speech, which is a look at the situation in Indonesia. And um, Juliana is an independent journalist and researcher who has more than a decade of experience in the media industry. Um, she is a longtime contributor to Global Voices, a citizen journalism platform, uh, which advocates for a multilingual internet. And she has recently been active in Internet go Governance Fora and currently serves as the secretary of the Indonesia Internet Governance Forum. So, Juliana, I believe you're online. You have about three minutes to talk. Okay. So, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry I can open the video because it will be compromised my appearance here. Uh, I will talk about the regulation uh, about the, the digital law in Indonesia and the connection with the journalism uh, sustainability. Uh, when digital technology is immersed in Indonesia daily life, it's also affected in the journalism practice in many ways. Um, the Indonesia Press Board has recorded more than uh, 1,000 news sites in country with uh, nine, more than 900 operate predominantly in, in digital space. Uh, with all the changes, is uh, the, the digital space also uh, offering the new way for the journalists, the journalists and activists to express their voice in certain issue like uh, writing in blog, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and have a video in YouTube. As the digital technology is immersed in Indonesia, the government thinks it's need to have some regulation to make it more easier and much more safer for the citizen uh, who working and living in digital technology. Uh, uh, in 208, the government uh, has launched the in, uh, inter IT, IT, uh, IT law, in Internet tran and Transaction and Economic Law, with the main uh, subject is to protect the people who transaction in e-commerce. E uh, even though the main purpose of this regulation was to protect digital transaction, uh, the law is content clause that allow people to file lawsuit against other internet users who use social media posts they found offensive. Uh, this law, uh, apparently, uh, after a few viewers has been launched, has been used by power, powerful entities to silence and to silence and punish critical journalism and activists who who often voice their concern about the corruption and for, uh, violation by the government or the the private sector who has more more pro, uh, power in an economic section. Uh, the the most common reason is to allege defamation against media professional. Often after a journalist has published a news article to hold official accountable to allege corruption and violence. Uh, 
the last year uh, but the the regulation the, the formulation of regulation to protect the data data is still continue last year we the indonesia has the data protection law has been launched by the parliament uh, but it is still not clear it will be affected the the the, the journalism uh, sustainability and environment the uh, freedom of expression because the this uh, problematic ITE law is still in force and the, the civil society, journalism, and some organization uh, has still struggling to appeal to government to to revise some problematic clause and article. So it's for me. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. And we'll be paying attention as, uh, you know, there's elections coming up in Indonesia to see how these cyber policies are enacted and the ways that they may impact uh, news organizations, journalists, uh, and kind of the information system there. Um, and, and last but not least, I have a contribution to this year's report, uh, which was uh, Bridging the Gap, How Data Sharing Can Transform Media Development in the Digital Age. And essentially what I was looking at in this article was kind of a, a you know, we had identified, obviously data is very important. People often use the analogy that data is the new oil. And so it's kind of thinking, how can we mine this new resource for the, the, the media development uh, goals that we have? And oftentimes in, in our communities, we, th we think, oh, we just have the data. We need the data. We need the platforms to share data. But one of the questions that we really wanted to look at is exactly what type of data are we talking about? And um, what I've tried to do in this article is to kind of define the different buckets, because I think that there are different people working in the space on different topics who require different types of data and different da different types of data could be be useful. And so what I try and do in this article is what I do in this article is quite look at those buckets. Um, and so the first one is a bucket on audience engagement and monetization. This is, uh, d you know, data that tech platforms would have that could inform um, how, you know, un understanding better the ad tech stack, how much money is made off of news content. This is one that's the type of data that when we're talking about news media bargaining codes that is of quite interest to news organizations. So I kind of see that as one, one bucket. Uh, the next bucket is con uh, data around content narratives, user behavior, and coordinated behavior. So oftentimes in our space, we're talking about you know, online violence against journalists, especially female journalists. And the type of data that you would need to marshal to understand those kind of challenges is slightly different. Um, and this is also an area where there have been significant challenges in getting the, the um, tech platforms to share that data. But understanding what that data is is really crucial. And then the third one that I think has been talked about less in our space as I've had these conversations over the past year is data around cybersecurity. Oftentimes, these global platforms, you know, the, the big tech platforms or other companies like Cloudflare have a sense of what type of uh, cyber attacks are taking place against either individual journalists or news organizations, um, sometimes which, you know, if they're state sponsored even. But um, when security, when it operates in, in correctly, no one, we don't even know about it, that, that it's happening, right? But still that those attacks are happening could be really influential in trying to proactively protect organizations that are under attack but might not know it. So that was another set of um, of, of another bucket of data that I think could be really helpful. And I think this is an important issue because we can, it'll be easier to kind of engage with uh, the, 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 the people who possess this data if we have more clarity around what we're asking for and for what purposes. Um, I mean, I think that this is, uh, especially in this year in the kind of, uh, we're seeing actually, you know, backward trends in terms of data sharing in some ways as trust and safety teams have been decreased. They're, it's kind of less engagement by, by platforms there. It seems to be kind of a race to the bottom as we have more digital regulation and companies are now thinking about this as a compliance issue with laws, especially coming out of Europe. But there's also kind of some hope in there because some of these new regulations are in including transparency components that require the sharing of some types of data. So I think there's also the hope in that um, and these efforts as well. And so just as kind of the path forward, I see, you know, I think standardizing our data requests and having a better sense of what specific data we're talking about is going to be really helpful. 
I think that, um, you know, cross-sectoral alliances for equitable data utilization is one thing that we're thinking about. I know that um, Internews is Media Viability Accelerator in partnership with Microsoft, you know, there's some hope that these types of partnerships can can lead to something, whether that will pan out, um, it's hard to know. Obviously, data is becoming even more important and in the AI space, is a generative AI depends on data and that's one of now Microsoft's, you know, comparative advantage, so we'll see how that works. And then I think the other thing is that we need to have a, a global approach to data transparency and media support, and this goes to a point I think that Courtney was also making around how the policies that we develop you know, in the EU, in North America, in the global West, we need to think about what that data transparency policy, how it might impact other places uh, you know, in positive ways. So we've seen data protection laws implemented in places where when not done with the guard, right, the right guardrails actually impinges on press freedom. So we need to really think about what we're doing where we are and how that impacts others. Um, so that is, uh, you know, this is all a plug. Hopefully we've given you a little teaser of everything that you can find in the annual report. We have copies here that you can pick up after the session and we also have copies online. Um, that's all for, for, the, for this uh, portion of our um, of our agenda. I think we're going to need to skip the Q&A uh, or combine it because we have uh, a lot to get to in the next 40 minutes. So I would ask people to kind of hold those questions um, and, and as we move to um, the next session that I think the next section of our agenda that WACUS is going to uh, talk about the member spotlights and maybe we combine those all. Hear what some of our uh, DC sustainability members are working on and then we can have an open discussion that can include questions to the authors. So I'm going to pass it over to uh, Wakas. Thank you, Dan. Um, we will now invite one by one our coalition members who had expressed interest in speaking up at this session uh, to introduce the organization's work and share updates on uh, recent or upcoming initiatives uh, that they or their organizations are taking related to digital governance and uh, news media sustainability. Um, in the interest of time, we will request each speaker to limit their uh, interventions to three minutes so we can accommodate um, as many speakers as we can uh, and still leave time for some open, open discussion after this. Um, we also request our speakers, uh, and this is something that the Dynamic Coalition is really interested in, uh, is to share any inputs regarding uh, areas for future research or um, stakeholder engagement that may be facilitated by the Dynamic Coalition. Uh, first, I believe we have a written message from uh, Michael Mark. Uh, from the Gibbs Media Leadership Think Tank in South Africa, uh, who recently organized a, a conference there that resulted in the drafting of uh, global principles for uh, news media bargaining uh, with big tech companies. Dan, do we have a written statement? Yes, we do. And Nick Benacuesta from SEMA is going to read out uh, what Michael, Thank who, you. Uh, uh, who was unable to because of the time difference, uh, participated. Great. Thanks. Um, Hi everyone, Nick Benacrista from the Center for International Media Assistance. Just uh, reading out a message from Michael Markowitz, who is the head of the Gibbs Media Leadership Think Tank. Gibbs is the Gordon Institute of Business Science. Um, so uh, Michael wanted to draw attention to an important event that was held in July uh, in Johannesburg uh, entitled Big Tech and Journalism, Building a Sustainable Future for the Global South. And uh, that event uh, brought together 70 participants, journalists, news publishers, media organizations, scholars, activists, lawyers, and uh, economists from 24 different countries to discuss solutions to the crisis of sustainability of journalism and its intersection with the role of major tech platforms. <clears throat> that uh, event focused in particular on bar news bargaining codes, uh, such as the one in Australia, the one in Canada, uh, a model, a law being discussed uh, in Indonesia. And uh, the speakers came to a number of, of interesting conclusions, which he's outlined uh, in this written contribution today. I think owing to limits on time, I'm not going to read all of the conclusions uh, that they reached. But I, I did, I think the most important issue here, uh, or the most important finding to highlight is that, uh, or conclusion to highlight, is that they, they concluded with a, a statement on principles, uh, the adoption of principles of big tech and journalism, principles for fair compensation. Um, we can probably share the link if someone's online, uh, if they have it. Um, otherwise, we'll share it with the group later uh, if you don't have it already. 
Uh, these principles are not just applicable to the Australian style bargaining codes, but intended to be universal, serving as a framework for any country seeking to address media sustainability through compensation or regulatory mechanisms while enabling adaptation to unique contexts. So, so far, the principles have endor been endorsed by 101 individuals uh, and organizations from 28 countries. And the principles are intended to be taken forward in three ways. Um, that he highlights in his message to the group. Uh, first, uh, Michael and the, the signatories hope that these principles can be used as a campaigning document for all stakeholders in lobbying for new mechanisms to address media st sustainability through fair compensation. Uh, so they, they, they're keen to build alliances with networks that you may be involved in and other think tanks and civil society groups to work on this. Second, um, they hope to submit the principles as part of the civil society filings to the South African Compensation Commission's market inquiry. So they're using these principles nationally for some very interesting reform efforts in South Africa. And thirdly, uh, they believe that the principles and other conference outcomes have highlighted areas for further research. So look to the, for those who are researchers, look to those principles uh, for a, a, a continuing research agenda. Thanks. Um, thanks so much. And if anyone wants in the room wants to learn more, I was there, so happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Nick and Courtney. Uh, we've also shared the link for the principles in the chat. Uh, next up, I believe, um, if Anna Christina is in the room, um, she's Senior Program Specialist at UNESCO. Anna, if you're able to join us, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, so, um, as you know, UNESCO has been developing since uh, September 2022 uh, guidelines for the governance of digital platforms that will be released on the 25th of October this year. And I think th that it's important to say a little bit about how these guidelines are now um, related to the media sustainability and uh, recognitions of journalist safety. So the guidelines are affirmative about the need uh, to involve the media and its professional in the regulatory process in whatever kind of regulatory processes, uh, independently of is, is if it's uh, self-regulation, core regulation, or uh, a statutory regulation. The guidelines outline that any kind of governance system should promote the dialogue between the media and the digital platform for the investment of independent media and for the support of ecosystems by making data available and supporting actions to bolster media sustainability, diversity, and plurality. Third, the guidelines um, are very stre uh, stressed uh, a lot about the due diligence processes that the platform should put it forward in order to assess the human rights impact of the treatment of independent news publishers and journalist content, to ensure equal treatment of independent news organization, to establish procedures to guarantee, to guard against the potential misuse of reporting rules and moderation mechanisms, especially misuse in bad faith designed to censor journalists and finally, the guidelines say that the digital platforms are expected to provide access to data for researchers, but also to journalists when there is a public interest on the access in proportionate and necessary in the term context. But how? Now, we developed another set of consultations uh, specifically to identify the type, the type of data sets that should be released by digital platforms specifically related to the safety of journalists and media viability. Um, which uh, we will be releasing a policy brief that uh, that uh, mentions the specific data asked and the different uh, challenges that we are facing when it comes to data access. And 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 then we are going to uh, become, after the publication of the guidelines, we are going to start a process of implementation of the guidelines where we are going to define through a multi-stakeholder a network that will be established in different uh, regions, particularly Latin America, uh, Africa, uh, the Arab states, and Asia Pacific. Um, the definition of a work plan and indicators for the follow-up of of these principles. What we want to understand is to have uh, is, is is to know how this could be real and oper uh, operational in the different contexts and considering the different realities and what it is actually needed in, in, in each of the in each of the regions. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. 
next up, I will request Julius Endert um, from the DW Academy to yes, share the updates. Thank you, Julius. Please go ahead. Yes. Um, so could you could you show my slide here in the room? Is it possible? So yes. Um, so this is a. Um, so I'm Julius Ender from the DW Academy from the Deutsche Welle in Germany. So this is a, a, um, a call to action for AI media development um, because we see that AI is a disruptive technology for media. But we started thinking, so what is, what is the disruption for our sector the in, in media development? And it, it will be the as same as disruptive for, for us as it is for, for media. I think this is clear. And we started to um, with, with our own consultations about the question. Uh, and I think this is the, the, the strongest quote from Walid Al-Sakaf. Al uh, he's a uh, professor and senior lecturer from the um, Södertörn University in Stockholm, and he said that we need to build branches within the in media development explicitly for AI, otherwise we became uh, irrelevant as media organizations ourselves. So it's ob about the sustainability of the media development sector as a whole. And um, so I don't want to capture it, but uh, I, I think I it's good to visualize it and we developed as uh, a kind of pilot four-step approach for um, for AI impact in media development. So we have to ask ourselves the question, uh, how can we have and still have impact under the rule kind of AI, and how can we use AI to have more and maybe different impact? And and for us, it's it's crucial, and I learn this every day for myself, we need to understand uh, the, the, t the technology and have a deeper understanding uh, of the technology in the first place. And that also means that we need to build capacity within our own organization. So we need to have technical expertise, we need to have technical knowledge, we need to test things, otherwise we cannot build on, on AI or uh, mitigate the risk of the AI. And then even on the same level or even more important is we need to analyze re and research, and this was the question before, what is the impact on freedom of speech and human rights? There are so many aspects um, how AI is influencing freedom of speech um, and also maybe a philosophical, a philosophical question, do we need to, to vote for freedom of speech for AI? So this is also a question. And then uh, at the next level, we need to detect the gaps in every field of media development and develop ca capacity. So, so this is media viability, media sustainability. This is digital rights. This is media information literacy. This is journalism education and more, and also advocacy, uh, because every field um, will see the effects of AI. So this is also clear. And then on the, on the uh, uh, fourth level, we need to see what a, what impact could we have with AI and how can we mitigate risk from from AI and that mean that we we need also as a sector develop our own ethics we did we need to develop our own positions um, and also we need uh, so we need to be more innovative how we can use AI in our own uh, projects with our partners and the whole thing and this is wha what we hear a lot. Um, AI is so fast in its development and especially generative AI. This this needs to be an iterative process and uh, we, we need to do it again and again. And it's also clear that we can do it alone as one organization. We need to collaborate um, and involve our partners like um, like uh, um, you from, uh, from Uganda. Uh, I think you we are on the same page. In, in develop um, yeah these kind of approaches yeah and this is what I want to contribute thank you thank you Julius and thank you for pointing out you know the the opportunity for um, collaborations and engagements um, people uh, from different parts of the world working on the same issues uh, next uh, I'll request Michael Bach the executive director of the Forum on Information and Democracy uh, to please share their um, update. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so the, the Forum on Information and Democracy is the implementing entity 
of a global process called the International Partnership on Information and Democracy, which started a few years ago by a dozen or so democratic states. Uh, we've now reached 51 countries that have signed on to the partnership. Brazil was the 51st uh, at the end of August. Uh, and at the forum, as the implementing entity, undertakes a bit of work at the interface of research and policy. One of those areas is conducting working groups on specifically targeted issues to develop recommendations for states, uh, civil society, and other actors advocating for uh, the positive impact of technology on our democratic institutions and the information ecosystem. Uh, late last year, uh, sorry, earlier this year, we published a, a report from a working group around uh, pluralism of information in curation and indexation algorithms. It's a lot of, um, <laughs> very difficult to roll off the tongue, uh, but essentially the group was comprised of renowned experts uh, across the world who drove the writing of the report and the development of the recommendations drawn from uh, experts through networks of civil society and academia, really looking at um, how to improve the pluralism of news that we see uh, in our online spaces. More specifically, they looked at how to give us more control in enhancing the quality and pluralism of the news that serve to us on online services, to give us more transparency and control over how our personal information is used to deliver that content to us and to pave the way for more decentralized approaches that may differ from the sort of um, dominant models that we see in the marketplace. When that report is delivered, we then work through the state signatories to disseminate through regulatory agencies, uh, people who influence policymakers, and NGOs throughout uh, our networks around the world uh, to influence the kinds of policies that are being developed. And just a few weeks ago, uh, we launched our next cycle uh, policy working group on artificial intelligence and the impact on our democratic institutions and the information ecosystem. And that's uh, moving forward uh, and a report will be issued uh, in uh, mid next year, I think. Uh, another part of our team very quickly uh, works at gathering evidence under the umbrella of the Observatory on Information and Democracy. And we've just uh, launched the steering committee of which Courtney is a member. And we've only met online, so awkwardly is the first time we're <laughs> seeing each other in person. And the, the observatory really drives an effort to obtain a common understanding of the state of knowledge and what we understand uh, of the impacts of technology on democracy and the information ecosystem. Uh, the steering committee will be driving a process of several working groups, of which one is around uh, media in the digital age. Uh, and that will be a meta-analysis and delivered uh, towards the end of next year. And we'll be seeking contributions from uh, uh, NGOs with a research profile and uh, other academics. In terms of suggestions for uh, research areas and things that we need to do, I guess one of the themes that's really important to me is to ensure that we continue and do more to ensure diverse voices and experiences, backgrounds and disciplines make their way into our policy discussions. It's not enough that these take place in, in the North, in the typical research centers that we think about. Uh, I've spent most all of my life in the South, in Southeast Asia, and it, to me, bringing those perspectives uh, to the research centers is particularly important, and that's a priority for our organization. So thank you very much. Can I thank you, Michael. Um, we will now move online uh, to um, Sabanaz Rashid Dia, who works on policy, human rights, and AI uh, at the Tech Global Institute. Sabanaz, if you can please share your contribution. Thank you. Thanks, Vakas, and thanks everyone for having us. Um, so Tech Global Institute is a nonprofit tech policy lab with a mission to reduce equity gaps between the global south and tech platforms. We are powered by a community of policy, human rights, and trust and safety professionals who, are direct, who collectively have years of insider knowledge 
in leadership roles at the largest tech companies and government agencies around the world. Uh, our policy research currently focuses on disinformation, platform accountability, privacy, content governance, and AI through a global South equity lens. Um, with relation to the, to the content that was shared today, and I think I agree a lot with what Courtney has mentioned, I think our consistent finding across different bodies of work that we do is that the discrepancies and the systemic barriers uh, in how platforms organize and provide access to data to researchers and journalists in the global south. If you look at the publicly disclosed records of the largest US tech platforms, close to 80% of all research funding and data access have been provided to elite institutions in North America, Western Europe and Australia, despite the fact that they only represent less than 40% of the world's internet population. This creates a significant information asymmetry that prevents local journalists, researchers, academics from understanding, informing and influencing technology's impact on society, as well as the lack of local context in these kinds of research ends up reinforcing structural biases against underrepresented communities in these markets. Uh, this particularly impacts media because I remember a particular instance where during the pandemic, journalists from Bangladesh, Pakistan and Nepal, for example, were denied access to Facebook's data under its established data sharing agreements that prevented these uh, organizations from studying the impact of COVID misinformation, disinformation on the information ecosystem, and that broadly then impacted how they would then survive during the pandemic, as well as what their editorial policies could be to counter the negative information ecosystem. So this creates a, a lot of challenges across multiple layers. Um, in this forum, we talk a lot about some of the regulatory frameworks, and I think Courtney talked a lot about how these are being weaponized in many instances. I think I want to draw attention to the work that we are doing with the EU Digital Services Act, particularly recognizing that the regulatory obligations and data sharing uh, are there to encourage accountability, and there seems to be a lot of energy to actually position this as, as a gold standard uh, globally. However, uh, it raises critical questions on whether the same framework can be applied in other parts of the world. Seven out of 10 countries today are deemed to have hostile and repressive media environments under rising authoritarianism, which means that journalists and media professionals often turn to social and alternative internet platforms to express and dissent. Uh, therefore, if such a model is kind of taken all around the world, it raises questions on whether this, it raises questions on this backdrop on whether these would actually work in different kinds of contexts and whether we even want more government sanctions and scrutiny on user access to data or journalist access to data. Uh, particularly given the given our experience with the weaponization of cyber and data protection laws in, in many of global south markets. It raises questions around who will have access, how can states be held accountable on fairness and neutrality criteria, and would such an access inadvertently work against the media and research communities in less mature democracies. Therefore, I think it's important and our work is, is looking at these questions on whether uh, what kind of data access models would actually work in global south context how, how would they actually be able to navigate less mature democracies and what kind of questions and procedural safeguards should be applied when we think about data access in, in different kinds of um, contexts and jurisdictions. Uh, we recommend for further research that, and I think there's a lot of focus these days around um, solutions and, and what should be done. I think our focus is largely around how it should be done. We believe that imposing procedural safeguards, imposing more evaluations into processes into access as opposed to what the data is actually saying will actually make it a lot more meaningful and neutral and less politicized when journalists and media in different environments are able to access the data. Um, and uh, that will also establish more guardrails, particularly in less mature democracies, where there are these broad provisions copied from other, other jurisdictions in terms of data access that will actually provide guardrails in terms of how it can be accessed, who's getting the access, and whether it's actually ultimately serving the interests of journalists and media communities in these markets. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Savanaz. Uh, important points there. Uh, Dan, we have Ramiro Alvarez um, on the list, but I'm not sure. OK. So Ramiro is the vice director and researcher at the Center for Studies on Freedom of Expression um, from Argentina. Please go ahead, Ramiro. Thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Um, at CELE, we have been uh, looking at the issue of media viability, and we started out basically with a basic concern about freedom of expression and the need to have a quality journalism as uh, 
building block of democratic society. And what we started doing was just trying to understand where the conversation was going. Um, and what we try to do is try to understand um, the situation in Latin America. What we basically found was that there was a series of policy areas that was relevant to the issue of media viability or sustainability, which in Latin America in particular, uh, th there are a couple of areas that are very important. Subsidies, state subsidies that in Latin America are often uh, passed in the form of public advertising. Public advertising in itself is a huge source of revenue for uh, legacy media companies. Um, Government-run media is also a huge part of the conversation. Uh, the problem that we usually have in Latin America is that government-run media is uh, not independent. It's part of uh, parts of the government and are sort of partisan tools. Uh, and the other specific issue that we found is across countries that eth ethical shortcomings in journalism were a huge matter of concern. Um, and what we found is that all these policy areas were basically uh, talking to, were not talking to each other. There are uh, siloed conversations that really um, f fail to produce uh, consistent policy proposals. And, and what we have identified as a need for future research and advocacy and engagement is the need to build bridges between those different silos. Um, in, in that sense, we started with a hypothesis that was that perhaps regional conversation should take place, but because of the problems are very specific to every single country, we thought best that the best way to do it was to try to produce uh, conversations first at the national level to later move up the ladder to, to achieve some kind of regional conversation. Um, but one of the main biggest challenges that we found there is that all these different siloed conversations are crossed by deep and pervasive disagreements between different people who don't think that the solutions are about the same place. So critical scholars uh, working on media studies, for instance, are usually not willing to speak to media owners. Media owners think that uh, community radio operators are a fringe group of people who should not be included in the conversation. So that requires kind of policy work or politics uh, that it's really hard to achieve. And our initial conversations with people in different countries basically agree that our diagnosis is, uh, is correct. Um, so that's where our future research is going to go. But I do want to mention, because it came up during our conversation today, that uh, we're also working on that access uh, for researchers, because obviously it is a huge part of, of this conversation, and we believe that the DSA offers opportunities, and we're starting to build the case for that access to non-European Union members, which is difficult, it has its challenges, but we believe there is an interest in the Global South to do that, and we're, we're trying to be part of that conversation as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. That actually um, wraps up our, our uh, contributions from our members. So we're now gonna open up the floor to any kind of questions, either from the first session of uh, article uh, presenters or also uh, you know, something that uh, another member wants to say. So if, uh, if you just want to come up to the mic uh, and maybe get in line and then we'll do that. And also just to plug that we're gonna, you know, we have another annual report next year. We've heard a lot of really interesting topics. So we'll have uh, a call for uh, the next submissions coming out in the next couple of months. Thank you. Uh, excellent panel. Again, what a, what a great contribution you guys are making. Thank you. Uh, especially, I love the, the issues regarding uh, the DC. Could the you introduce here. yourself? Oh, I'm so sorry. I <laughs> Zai Jamil, I'm, I'm an attorney. I work in uh, policy and I work with uh, businesses in, in Pakistan. That's where I'm from. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, number one, uh, I'm going to talk about very quickly secret takedown orders. Uh, think about it. When the government makes a request to take something down, where does it get recorded and how do people know? It doesn't. Uh, there's a transparency report that the, that the tech companies do publish, but it doesn't tell you who and what and what happened. That's number one. The second thing I think, we are all concerned about chat GPT and we're saying AI, oh God, you shouldn't put this out there. If, this is so dangerous and we want principles against it. But when the EU put out GDPR 
and it's being implemented in countries where now they're saying the data protection authority should be under the Ministry of Security. I'm worried. Where are they? Where's the EU to explain to people that data protection is not about protecting data, it's about privacy. It's about protecting citizens' data against the government, not protecting the government's data, which is what's happening. Two points, that's it. Thank you so much. If I can just respond very briefly, the Christchurch call advisory, the Christchurch call process is really um, advocating for government transparency reports and working on them to report on uh, their takedown requests related to TVAC, terrorism and violent extremism content. So that might be something to look at in that respect. And I couldn't agree with you more on the data protection issue because we saw in several countries in um, Central Europe so that the data protection authorities leveraged GDPR to try to take down investigative journalism Correct. and the databases they're using to do that. So and thanks for that. Customization. Thank you. Um, hello, uh, this is Honda Noslu from uh, Turkey's uh, Intern Observatory, Gözlem Evi. Uh, so um, I have, firstly, a uh, product placement. So in Gözlem Evi, we also uh, create some creative methods to generate data when it's not available. And through our research, we identified some stuff such as we found that uh, Facebook's political advertisement was being micro-target 90% to men, mostly. So we have all of these findings that kind of intersect all of these issues that we talk about. And we also identified uh, phishing operations created by AI, cent AI central micro-targeting, lack of governmental action, and taking them down, in which government officials are being um, represented falsely, so phishing operations, two million Turkish citizens uh, affected, so much going on. So uh, Turkey can be a great space to identify, but also generate great uh, new data. And uh, we also have an algorithmic empowerment program, which uh, does exactly uh, try to address the problems that you pointed out in terms of empowering media, because as ex-Google employees, we also know how search engine optimization and other stuff work too, so we have this new program. My, uh, I actually had a, uh, in regard to the academic research areas that you uh, were asking for, I was just wondering if you're interested in investigating how big tech companies coordinate and comply with authoritarian governments and, um, and what that looks like and, uh, what, what do, and how do you think you can uh, generate data on things that happen behind doors and what could the potential impact be. I think this will especially be important considering that there is more than 50 elections, I think, coming up uh, next year. And finally, we also are going to launch an election monitoring workshop for other investigators that would like to do uh, monitoring on their elections since we just had one last year. And thank you so much for all of the speakers. It was great to listen to, thank you. I mean, definitely, I'm sure all of us are interested in that. And I would just encourage you, if you can come um, give us your cards so we can share your information online, even uh, at least for the name of your organization. Hi, and thank you so much for your insights and amazing inspirations. It's Juba from Georgia. I work at Forset, which is a nonprofit CSO. We help civil society with open data solutions. Uh, we work a lot with journalists in Caucasus and Central Asian countries to boosts their data collection, data analysis, and visualization skills. And I would like to, within one minute, reflect on media and open data relations that we talked a lot about today. Uh, we talked about making data accessible, but I think another issue and problem and question is what we actually do with this data once it's accessible, once it's open, right? We have worked with hundreds of journalists in these couple of countries, and they say that newsrooms are way too dynamic to afford spending two weeks on data investigations and data-driven stories uh, to publish them. Mm, they can barely afford it because they are not financially sustainable, right? And another issue is that in our target countries, state authorities are disclosing less and less data so that journalists can make sense of what's happening in, in, the, in the country. Um, so in response to this, uh, Forset with other CSOs started developing tech solutions that scrapes data from websites, news agencies, social media platforms, so that if state is not giving journalists data, we can give journalists data. But now what we see is that our tech solutions is losing uh, value because TikTok's data is I mean, Twitter's data is gone, API is closed, 
Uh, we have issues with Facebook's API as well because it is limiting API almost every year. We have issues with TikTok's data as well. So I don't like to be drama queen, but challenges are uh, growing instead of decreasing. And now we have generative AI coming in. So I think we should really, uh, of course, talk about making data accessible and invest in this, but also invest in actually utilizing this data for everyday work in media and academia. Thank you. I think that's a great point about you know data that there is so much data. What kind of organizations, and we need to think about it for, probably from an ecosystem standpoint. So what kind of can media support organizations do as well? Yes, next question. Hello, everyone. My name is Jenna Fong. I am an amateur uh, policy researcher and a casual policy observer based in Toronto, Canada. Uh, I want to bring up one thing um, probably covered in one of these research already, uh, but I hope that the audience here might um, you know, have, have like a basic understanding about the reason Bill C-11, the Online New News Act, happening in Canada, which uh, they require tech companies like Google and Meta to pay news outlet uh, for posting or linking their contact. And in just, if I remember correctly, in August 2023, Meta responds as to be complied with the law and by removing news completely from Facebook and Instagram, their social media platform that does not only include the domestic news, but international news. I am originally from Hong Kong. A lot of news outlets closed down due to the political uh, tension um, happening in, in Hong Kong in the past couple of years. And I moved a country uh, to access this freedom and end, end up I am receiving this from a supposedly democratic country. Uh, and and so um, I hope that you know um, we, what what will be the place and, and what should be in place to make sure that we can balance out the power that uh, the big tech is controlling because they are regulating uh, this publicly uh, privately owned public space that we lived on, and uh, make sure the policy is human centric and um, and you know. Um, and not jeopardizing consumers' right to access information and ensure the sustainability of media ecosystem. And, and, and take this as an example, how will other jurisdictions with even less comprehensive legal framework to deal with such backlash from uh, this kind of legislation and tension between big tech and government and ensure that um, the interests of consumer and media industry are truly considered and integrated? Thank you. Also, I would just note, it's not that the that Meta can't comply, it's choosing not to pay. It is not a lack of compliance um, issue. Thank you for that. Thank you, everyone. My name is Claire Mohindo from Uganda. And um, working with the African Center for Media Excellence, a media support organization. Uh, we've done studies around uh, media freedom, and one of the latest, uh, latest study was around um, biometric digital identity programs and how they've impacted uh, media freedom in Uganda. Biggest challenge while we were collecting uh, data for this study was um, the fact that journalists and uh, media owners that we interviewed did not have an idea about the study about biometric digital identity programs. So while collecting this data, you literally have to explain everything for them to give you the responses that you are looking for. So um, here to pick lessons from uh, people working in the global south. Um, what uh, lessons can we pick from you and what practical solutions can we walk away with on how you navigate such issues, especially seeing that uh, in our context, uh, people are navigating different issues, issues of media viability, sustainability, and then there's all of this, so you have to like sort of catch up, like Julie said. So there's just so much to deal with. The media houses are struggling, and there are all these is all these issues affecting them that they don't even realize uh, they're being affected. Because uh, some of our findings showed that yes. So after we explained what it's all about and showing that 
all these massive registrations going on and the government storing our data, people are being uh, surveilled on this ongoing surveillance of journalists, but people are not aware, receiving anonymous calls from people, threatening them and telling them, you know, you can't run this, and you're like, okay, where did you get this data from, and all these challenges, but they do not realize that. So uh, here to pick lessons from everyone working in the Global South. Great, well, we are at time, so I'm gonna take just a couple of minutes to try to summarize what has been truly an incredible uh, conversation that has, I think, spanned the entire globe and illustrated why this conversation is needed at the Internet Governance Forum, a global multi-stakeholder space where we have addressed today the individual level issues, whether that's journalists, news outlets, kind of the individual organizations, the need to build capacity to figure out how to transition to the age of AI, um, while understanding that they have a constrained choice set. They are bound by, an, by a logic, by technological infrastructure, by policy infrastructures, um, over which they often have very little impact or control over. Um, we've talked a lot about the global influence of national or kind of supranational in the case of EU level policies that you know you may be a, an organization working in a developing or low income country um, but you are forced to comply with and figure out how to build an audience to monetize etc and, and create viability and sustainability based on rules that are not of your own making, based on a logic that you have no control over, and oftentimes which you have no ability to even try to gain remedy to, as we heard um, in the case of content moderation, this constraining factor, the, the unequal structural inequalities between journalists and media organizations in different parts of the world in terms of their access to remedy when um, tech platforms influence their the visibility viability of their content or their accounts etc um, we heard about the importance of data on multiple layers what data what data do we need how do we get it and what do we do with it once we have it how could we come up with a global uh, maybe coordinated agenda we heard about the global principles for fair compensation that was a similar effort to see like Globally, where is there consensus about some general level of principles? I think we need to do that, it sounds like, for data. It sounds like we're hearing a call for this. What are some, what is a common agenda for the types of data we need? Um, how could we leverage institutions or, or existing mechanisms like the DSA um, and leverage those for both European and non-European entities? Side note, as an American, we also don't have any model for that, so we're interested in looking at that. So I think um, that, but then what do we do with that data? Um, as we heard uh, you know, from one of our speakers, well, okay, so once we have access, how do we both internally at the media organization level, um, how do we turn that into improved policies that improve safety of journalists? How do we improve monetization? What do we do with that data? How do we make that useful? Um, and we heard about the importance of working globally with local knowledge and local input and empirical based input, especially thinking about those who work in the global north or have access to the seats where policies are being made um, and discussed, that we represent and we create opportunities for engagement and access by those who don't typically get a seat at the table or are not offered a space at the table. And I will say that I think that's one of the things that I'm really proud of about this dynamic coalition, about the, all of the people in this room and online who are doing that. That is a fundamental core commitment of this dynamic coalition. And yes, we do talk about you know, the, the EU and US policies a lot because of their constraining impact. But we are also very interested, you know, we heard about Uganda, um, what is happening in Liberia. These are, as the Internet Governance Forum kind of conveys, they're local issues with global implications and global issues with local implications. So I would invite everyone to please consider joining the Internet Governance 
Forum's Dynamic Coalition on Journalism and News Media Sustainability. Um, join our mailing list. Use the mailing list. Um, we hold learning calls, as you heard from Dan. We will be organizing those over the coming year, and we will be holding a meeting in the next couple of months to determine what should the priorities for the coming year be. Undoubtedly, that will cover generative AI. We already heard a bit about some of the issues that we need to be thinking of. Um, you know, this, this, these four-part issues, how does media development adapt? How do news organizations adapt? How do we think about AI governance and its impact on news media? Um, I do invite you to our session at 1.30 where we will be talking about AI governance for the global majority. And with that, I would like to thank everyone. Thank you for the people online. Thank you to Wakas. Um, thank you to all of the presenters. And thank you to my co-coordinator, Dan. Great, yeah. Thank you, Courtney. And I, there are a couple other people we need to thank, those who are uh, doing the, the behind the scenes work, the people who are transcribing our session, and the, the people who are doing the video recording, and also the great assistance that we received in the room. We had technical issues that were not, not caused by them at all, but they really helped us uh, make sure that we had a session that was excellent. So thanks for all that background support. And, and Laura Bacal, uh, uh, who's online. GF, the Global Forum for Media Development is our secretariat. And so Laura, who is joining us online, you can see her in the middle. She's waving. She did a lot of the background work to make this session happen. It, these things don't just happen out of thin air. So we thank you all for all your hard work and for waking up in the middle of the night in Spain to join us for this session. Thank you all. If you want to connect with us, we'll be, I'll be uh, just standing out in the lobby here and would love to connect. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.
だからなんか私たちも全然知らないことだけは情報がなくて、うん、なんかあの一応もう始まって12時半からなんですけど、うん、今みたいに思うようとしたけど。Okay, I guess you can hear me now. Good, uh, great to great to see you. Uh, and uh, you're the in unique position, and uh, it's been on the perils of all who are going to miss this session, five thousand people, because this is a special session, <laughs> and this session is special because it speaks about something which is very uh, concrete and uh, also very powerful. It speaks about knowledge that has been developed over the last 18 plus years in the IGF community. Think just about all of the sessions discussion at this IGF, what was said, discussion, uh, questions that were made, and uh, what knowledge each of us gathered from it. Well, I'm writing uh, books and I have a few books and I here and there publish them and some people got interested in them, something I'm not, and this is the way of preserving this knowledge. But uh, generally speaking, this knowledge is not codified and made, made useful for our discussion, not only of us here, that's important, but people outside IGF community who are impacted by what is discussed here, or who may know, need to, need, need, uh, need to know more on the digitalization and issues. Now, Diplo, together with uh, Marcus Kummer, who is today with us, who is, for those of you who are not aware, who is one of the 
uh, real fathers of the Internet Governance Forum. There are so many fathers, you know, the successes have the many fathers, but he, he created the first IGF, and we started 2006, 2006 with the first reporting from IGF, a remote participation in the, uh, in the first reporting. Therefore, we have now 20, uh, well, 18 years of the reporting from the IGF, which is very powerful knowledge base. Now, from this IGF, we are reporting as well. Therefore, you can get, for almost any session, you can get, uh, including this session, you can get a few things. You can get a summary report lit uh, uh, written by, by experts. You can get a report written by uh, AI, drafted by artificial intelligence. And uh, you can have also daily IGF. You know how it is. First day, you try to follow the sessions and you're enthusiastic that you will grasp what's going on. At least my experience after the first day, I realized that it's not impossible. And you start uh, navigating the uh, lunch areas and the bar areas and connecting, which is great. I think this is a great purpose of IGF. But what we do every day, based on this reporting, we create IGF daily. Here is just IGF daily from yesterday which have a summary of discussions uh, and uh, top day picks. Therefore, with the help of AI system and our experts, we create a summary of what was discussed previous day. Now, we were very critical today because there are so many repetitions, you know. Technology will uh, op give opportunities, but also make risk, but also some new insights and ideas. And it's always that interplay between repeating, 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 but also having some new, new insights. Now, what uh, you can also consult here and you can, uh, you can see on, the, on this website, I'm introducing this way functionally because this is the way that you understand what we are basically, basically discussing when it comes to the, to the, to the AI. And uh, here is, for example, I know one interesting session. I'm, well, I'm sorry, but I found it. Here it was Climax, I think, one of the, oh, okay, I will, probably I will, I will miss, where you have the summary of the session, and you have also, also indication of the, of the, what was said, and how the uh, discussion space was, was framed. Therefore, you can, you can have it, and this is done by artificial intelligence, as we discussed, this session is also, codified and uh, translated by inter in, uh, artificial intelligence. And you can, you can see the main points from discussion. You can see, for example, what was, uh, uh, let's see, well, at least one session that I was in, let me, which is, uh, is a bottom-up AI. You can uh, see that uh, there is a report from the session and there is a knowledge graph how arguments which Sorina, who is here and I, made relate to each other around topics, around issues. Therefore, you can finish uh, this meeting as one big knowledge graph where you can see how discussion in this session relates to some other session. There were, this is a huge, powerful knowledge database which is uh, completely unused and it's a, it is a public good. It belongs to all of us. And this session aims to initiate this discussion together with our panelists, uh, with Marcus um, and colleagues from IGF Secretary then, and uh, Anya, and of course, Sorina. And Marcus, you, uh, when you started IGF, did you plan to make this big uh, AI system or not? Just a few uh, suggestions and few reflections from your side, and then we'll move. Well, AI was not a hot issue then. <laughs> there were other issues, but let's not forget, 20 years ago, the internet was not the same as it is now. I do remember when we celebrated the first billion internet users, first billion online, that I think was 2005 or so. Now we have more than around six billion internet users, so just the sheer uh, number, the sheer is a huge difference, but 2005, we didn't have video streaming, we didn't have Skype, there was no uh, Netflix, there was no YouTube. Uh, all these things have 
had and, and the apps didn't exist, there are no smartphones, so it was a totally different environment. But uh, what was already clear, uh, the, in the people, the internet users cared very much about the internet. And obviously, access to the internet was still a number one priority, but connectivity remains an important issue. I do remember when, I think it was 2008 or so, we started thinking about bringing more people online. And, uh, well, access was always a big issue, but the 2008, it was at the meeting in Hyderabad, somebody said, actually, the biggest challenge will be not the next billion people, but the last billion people, to bring the last billion online. Because the next billions will come almost automatically, industry will do it, and it has happened that way. Indeed, we have now six billion people online, but the last billion, that will be a challenge. And obviously, it was also mentioned in today's session on the way towards the GDC. There are digital issues, but there are also analog issues. And I think the languages remain an analog issue. Uh, to be really inclusive, I think the internet must become more multilingual. It's obvious that if the, the remaining people who are not online yet, they don't come from the English-speaking world, they come from the countries with different languages. And <coughs> changes will happen. The more people that come online, they will come from different culture, bring different languages, different cultural values and that will also have an impact on the internet. But back to your question, no, we didn't think about AI. We didn't also, we didn't really know what to expect. We just realized there was a hunger for having these discussions, and that manifested itself before WIS is during the working group on internet governance when we held regular consultation. There was a clear appetite to have these discussions on issues surrounding the internet and also let's then we had Tunis and the Tunis agenda remains very valid and uh, there were those who thought internet governance was just about naming and addressing but the Tunis agenda clearly spells out internet governance is more than naming and addressing more than the DNS and the allocation of internet protocol uh, resources and it says that the internet governance also is about issues relating to the use and abuse of the internet and that is a definition that is very broad indeed and that also obviously includes AI. Marcus, one thing which, which you mentioned and I think is a critical also for the future of AI is that there are so-called unintended consequences. You just start moving and you don't know where we land and you uh, end up with a great, uh, great event. And if you don't mind, that could be nice segue. And what you mentioned, different cultural contexts. Uh, uh, recently we did analysis of, for example, Ubuntu philosophy, African philosophy, which is, com which is not codified to the large extent but it, ca it should and can influence AI developments. I don't know if you had something else to conclude and then we pass to, 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 to Anya Sorina and then uh, to, to basically. Oh, pass on, yeah. yes. Good. Uh, Anya, you are uh, in the secretariat. You are uh, sort of uh, making sure that uh, everything works uh, uh, and it's great, great work behind the scene. Very often not noticeable. But how do you see this uh, knowledge uh, knowledge dimension of this huge pool which we're trying at Diplo to activate somehow? How, how does it look from the perspective of the Secretariat? Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana, and uh, also to Sorina. Thank you for organizing this session and to Tunis for supporting the idea. Uh, first of all, thank you for the kind words. I hope you share uh, your last words. I will not repeat again all this, what I said. I hope you could hear me, but if, if needed, I will. Uh, in any case, just a big thank you, of course, to, uh, to the organizers um, and for the kind words. I hope that you share the feedback as Jovan so far, that you're enjoying the IGF and that the program-wise, technically-wise as well, uh, fits your requirements to feel comfortable to navigate this very robust agenda. Uh, I fully agree with, um, uh, of course, Marcus and Jovan both said, the IGF is just one big database of everything and everyone 
uh, to say it in a very uh, blunt manner. If you look at the past 18 years of the IGF, and we internally, of course, have access to all its archives, uh, then it's a lot of terabytes of uh, data of different kinds of reports, documents that have been produced so far, um, a lot of just records of um, participation of the, of the world through the IGF and its multi-stakeholder model. And for us, those are precious resources because they are very important indicators uh, of the status quo, but they're also excellent navigators of where we want to go in the future, given the fact that digital inclusion is at the core of the IGF. So numbers, for example, are important. If you look at the reports on statistics of the participation by country, by different profiles, uh, then it gives you a very nice picture on who is participating, but most importantly, who are we leaving behind, and where do we need to concentrate our, for example, capacity development efforts to ensure that everyone's on board uh, with us. And uh, all those analyses are done to a good extent by a very small team uh, of the IGF Secretariat manually. And it's very good that we are now living in a phase of this rapid um, AI development where the AI, at least certain segments of it, if maneuvered, if in good hands, can be a trusted tool to deal with this big database and to ensure that the data are processed in a quicker way and to give you accurate um, result that you want to achieve. So we certainly welcome the involvement of these um, systems as long as they're trusted systems uh, in the IGF as we are seeing it as a great help to improve the process first of all, but especially to reach the inclusion level that we are aiming for years. And unfortunately, it's still very challenging. Uh, given regardless of the fact that of course we have a big um, portion of the world being unconnected, good portion of the world is connected, and that meaningfully connected world is still not active participant in the IGF processes. So the Secretariat is aware of that, we work on that, we map basically uh, through a multi-layered uh, uh, dimension of um, the stakeholder community who is missing. So we're looking at particularly certain countries that are missing, certain disciplines that are missing, um, target groups, for example. We're looking who are the marginalized groups uh, across communities, and you can imagine the complexity there. Not every uh, country, every community shares the challenges, resources, capacity. So that's the complexity, and uh, a small team uh, in Geneva of four or five persons working at the Secretariat certainly can't uh, manage that um, in, a, in a quick way. So we do welcome these types of um, support uh, into the IGF system, and I think it would also make the participation of the just regular participants in the IGS in sessional work and the annual meeting much more quicker and more comfortable and meaningful for everyone. Thank you, Anya. One point which, which came from, uh, f from your reflection is, if you count, I think count is something like 30 sessions discussing AI. And there is a hell of a lot of excitement. Everybody likes to, to become an expert on AI. And what we are noti noticing, a high level of cliches. Uh, whatever cliche is um, uh, that AI is uh, endangering humanity, will uh, um, kill us all in a few years, to, to all cliches. But what is one point is, and what, al what always uh, motivates us, at least as a diplo, is that we have to walk to talk, not only to talk about AI, but also to use AI as a practical tool. And it's a bit, uh, I expected a, a fuller room, but it seems that people like magic talk about magic of AI, but not necessarily to see how it works and how it operates. And what you're doing in the Secretariat with very limited resources is you're trying to walk the talk. And I think there is a need in the IG community more to walk the talk, to look under the bonnet and see what's going on. What are neural networks? How TCPIP functions? How, how you do that? It will make much more serious discussion. Here is our next speaker, Serena, who uh, is, as you know, a person who walks the talks on uh, so many issues, and uh, she is uh, probably a person who has the lowest uh, tolerance for any sort of cliches. Sometimes, uh, although I'm very careful about cliches, but sometimes I write something and Sorina just called me from the other office. What do you mean? It's another cliche. I said, be tolerant a bit, you know, uh, here and there I may use a cliche. Sorina, how we can walk the talk what, uh, what Anya started and... <laughs>
the mics apologies <laughs> technology is not helping us um, I think the idea is to use technology for what it's best at um, helping us not replacing us as Jovan was saying there's a lot of talk these days about how AI is going to destroy everything take our jobs well <laughs> we've had a bit of fun over the past few days with our reporting and I think I can say after two days that AI is not going to take my job anytime soon uh, <laughs> but beyond that, look at the IGF. So we're talking about how to make use of technology to show the wealth of knowledge that the IGF has acquired over the years. This is the 18th annual meeting. How many of you have read the, um, what's the most recent annual, annual report? Messages, let's call it like that. How many of you have read IGF messages for the past, let's say, three years? But be frank. But be frank. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> we should give you an award or something. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And beyond those three years, have you read all IGF messages? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well done. The point is there's so much produced every year. We have recordings from every single session. We have session reports. We have the messages. We have the annual report. We have policy network reports. We have best practice forum reports, outcome documents of the parliamentary track, youth dialogue reports. There's so much happening, but we produce it every we produce them every year and then we kind of leave them there. Can we try to unpack a bit all this knowledge and see you know, how the discussion on, for instance, digital divide evolved from 18 years ago when we started the IGF to now? How can we actually take advantage of everything that's being discussed here at the IGF to move the debate forward instead of kind of repeating the same things all over again? And we think technology can help here, can give us like a starting point. Okay, I want to have another session on the I'm speaking too fast, on the digital divide. This is what has been discussed about the digital divide at the IGF in the previous 18 years. Let's see how we take this forward and stop saying the same things all over again. I'm trying to respond to Jovan's question about how, avoiding, how to avoid cliches. Uh, maybe, yes, we can use technology for that. Be a bit more innovative, be a bit more forward looking into how we're um, debating these things starting from yeah, looking at what has been said before and taking, again, taking it forward instead of repeating um, the same points. So our hope is that technology is going to help us a bit in that direction. And um, I think it's also very timely in these current debates about, you know, um, digital cooperation forum, possibly or not, um, and whether we need something new or uh, not, again, showing the wealth of knowledge that the IGF has acquired over the years and how we can make most of it, the most of it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, um, uh, Sorina. We are working on, uh, with Sorina's help, on the uh, AI cliche, cliche detector, which will immediately uh, detect cliches in any speeches, and uh, sort of that would be interesting. We have to keep it a bit of uh, uh, discreet because then people could be annoyed. That, oh, I'm not, uh, I'm telling cliches uh, like myself. With uh, when Sorina detects cliches in my writings, you you feel like. Uh, Easy. Uh, we will uh, uh, conclude uh, this intro with Wim. Wim, you have been um, involved with the, uh, uh, let's say, knowledge aspect of AI as expert consultants, participants in the mag, w putting different hats. Uh, and what's your take on this huge uh, knowledge base, which was described by um, all our pr uh, pr uh, discussant, and possibility of tapping it, uh, need to tap it, uh, how to do it? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, just to, to clarify, well, I have been involved in a number of uh, intersessional activities, and I think they go back on the initiative by uh, Marcus, really to make a first step, uh, an important step, I think, that was also from uh, having discussions on topics at IGF to having discussions that start in the months before IGF and try to come up with already a tangible output, a tangible report. Uh, and I think that's, that's an important step already um, in, in the whole context, of trying to uh, codify and, and bring knowledge together. Uh, but now what we, and what my experience is, um, is uh, we are now a step further and the discussions are, are way more focused, but they're still going on in different, um, I hesitate to word silos because that has a whole different bunch of meanings in the, uh, in the context of, of IGF. But just, we had, for example, uh, this morning, um, a policy network on internet fragmentation. Uh, and one of the messages we say, it's important that stakeholders 
uh, work together and discuss this together because there are different views. But at the same moment, I'm aware, and I looked at the agenda too, that there were 10 other workshops uh, that are talking about the same topic. And in some workshops uh, have been uh, the days before, that I said, but they are actually same, exactly the same, uh, but with different words. Uh, they come up with categories, they come up with this message from we have to work together, we have to discuss together, but they just formulate it different. And it would be nice to combine these. And then coming back to um, the use of AI and the use of, uh, of technologies, um, if we, if I, or if we look at the schedule, it's impossible to do that, uh, even or, or even afterwards, or even making the links to uh, to last year. And I was just checking the uh, the tool that, the, um, that analyzed what I have been saying this morning, uh, and I must say um, I didn't read the text, but the fact that this tool took from the five or ten minutes that I was talking and divided that up into arguments, uh, three or four different arguments, and automatically uh, labels that from these are key topics. Uh, and then I see it also adds um, which SDGs um, could be linked or are linked to what I just have said. I think that's already something wonderful. Uh, what I am, I think, missing or what would be Great, but I think that was the graph you um, you showed earlier. If this w would also do the next step and then help with uh, comparing and linking what is being said in other sessions, uh, where you actually at the end of the week can say, well, we have had five sessions uh, that maybe I don't know if, if the tool would be able to do that or if technology is to be is able to bringing that uh, that uh, uh, or fine tuning. But at least say they were talking about the same. Go and check uh, whether the new ones actually is just the new ones or if they are talking about something different. So I, th I think that there are huge opportunities there. Thank you. Th thank you, Wim. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, it exists. We are fine tuning. As you said, this is approximation. And what is the beauty in this reporting system, which m our colleagues may show again? Uh, and what Wim uh, was uh, referring to is that you're always fine-tuning with the experts. As Sorina said, sometimes we are underwhelmed uh, with the quality, but when you correct, the AI system is uh, learning uh, how to do it in the next iteration. And as you can, what Wim was uh, referring to is, uh, is basically this type of, uh, if you can just display quickly, this, yes, this uh, report from the session that you can use where you have main points from discussion done by experts and AI, provided by AI, by fine-tuned by experts. Then you have knowledge graph, which I said, where you have blue points are about topics and the white points are about speakers. And that's probably the way if you put 10 sessions about s fragmentation related issues, it can cross reference and say, hey, this was discussion in the session which we moderated and the next session that can help even 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 visually and then you have this n obviously narrative report which is but what was also interesting and i i just uh, invite you to to look into this at the bottom you have uh, for each session uh, uh, what was said speed of speaking will have the fastest speaker at the igf which i'm getting since time is running out a length of speech, we'll have the shortest and longest speech at the IDF, speech time, and you have a report for uh, per speaker. Therefore, you can see if uh, what was said is basically useful useful for a discussion. Uh, no, and what I, I refer to, if you click for more, is exactly the, the point I was making, that you have the different arguments split out and automatically linked to SDGs. topic. Well, and link to topics, and I think that is a way you can compare with what is being said in other sessions. Kay. Thank you. Well, I guess this is all from uh, from us, except if uh, my fellow panelists do not want to say more. Anya, you are your body language. I am, I am so so uh, impressed by this, uh, <laughs> looking into the speech length, speech speed, and so on. And I'm very excited to see who wins this uh, mini competition here. You're I don't think you have me there, but I think I'll be among the first five for sure. By the speed, yes, the speed. But very interesting, and I think this is very useful for, for the IGF long term. We may have I even award for the fastest speaker at the IGF and slowest. If I may add a word, uh, 
I mean, I did not talk about AI, but we were aware, of course, of the knowledge that was all, and we published it in book form the first years, you know, a, a summary of all that was said, but who reads a book and a summary? And here, this is an amazing tool. I do remember back in 2011 in the Nairobi IGF, I was on a panel in the main session, and Windsurf then said, pointed out that this immense uh, data that accumulated, and he said, there is a need for data mining. And now we are a little bit later, but this is precisely that. And it is very impressive indeed, and a fantastic Thank tool. You. Thanks. I remember that session when that, uh, when that uh, transcriber or automatic system was putting windsurf instead of windsurf. <laughs> and then he had, we have to be careful because AI can uh, misspell, but this I can recall that, that point. Thank you, any, any comments? Uh, I think the preferred point will be given to the person who read the last three reports. And <laughs> I could say, it, you know, good friend and colleague, and it's so great to see you. A uh, bit of a legendary member of IGF awesome. community. Thank you, Giovanna, and, th and thank you for the wonderful panel. I, I would just to, to commend the fact that uh, the IGF became a knowledge base for us. Really, the beauty about it was because it was an independent platform that allows all stakeholders on equal footage to participate and uh, contribute and talk about policy and also uh, participate in capacity building and learning. Uh, the fact that it is non-outcome event gave it more soft power to influence all internet-related organization, all stakeholders. We were disagreeing, we agreed, uh, we reached a consensus, and that consensus flew to other organization. With time, it became a knowledge base. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's not only a knowledge base, it's also a, a soft power that uh, or a soft force that influenced all uh, related uh, internet governance uh, organizations um, and uh, we're blessed with resources that from all over the world that it, we wouldn't have the chance to know them if we wouldn't participate in the igf like the wonderful panel that we see here from all over so uh, these are all opportunities that has been uh, given to us by the IGF, uh, w which someone at the time of those is thought that it will not even continue to more than five years. And now we are 20 years and we're looking for 20 years more, hopefully. So uh, hopefully. Uh, and uh, actually it became a model that has been copied into other uh, uh, dimensions. So uh, th th that was the beauty of the IGF. Another idea, uh, since you talked about AI and cliches, maybe you can use generative AI to see how the IGF has emerged and evolved over the 20 years and how it can move to the next 20 years. Well, we won't ask uh, AI, we will ask you to write uh, this article because you are the living legend of the AI and uh, of the IGF. I think generative AI will do that. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, those of you who are on ChatGPT, you may ask ChatGPT what uh, it will, uh, how it would uh, ChatGPT would answer the El Guzain's uh, uh, questions on this this uh, this issue. Uh, well, if you don't have any other comments, questions, uh, it was also short and sweet uh, the session. Uh, we didn't uh, take too much of your time. We heard many interesting ideas. We had heard from history through uh, Anya's uh, uh, secretariat perspective, from Sorina no cliche perspective, to Wim's perspective of the giving concrete example of the reporting as it is happening. And uh, well, that's concluding a statement on the question of uh, rich knowledge, not only codified in the sessions, but also in the way how IGF has been uh, developing, performing, and uh, developing some sort of tacit culture and understanding of uh, thousands of people getting together and uh, generating some new knowledge, new sometimes ethics, new respect, new understanding. And we shouldn't forget it. We don't live, unfortunately, in society uh, worldwide which uh, cherish respect uh, and uh, for different views. And uh, the predominant view is that there are two views, my view and wrong view. 
and that's how the world is unfortunately developing. But IGF has been fostering listening culture, engagement, respect for the others' opinions, and I think for me personally, it, uh, it, was be, it has been probably the first achievement I IGF. And we take this idea to use AI and human expertise maybe to do another book on the, on the, on the, on the AI and uh, uh, share with younger generations who, are, uh, who should take it for the next 20 years. Thank you very much.
ya sacaron a las, ya sacaron, apenas va a ir el presidente por las chicas a Israel, no las pudieron sacar ayer, no, no les dieron permiso, no las dejaron salir, qué horror, imagínate tu hija yendo a una competencia This is working. It's working. Okay, thank you. Okay, it feels quite awkward sitting, but hi everybody. <laughs> um, thank you for joining today. My name is Alexandra Robinson. I'm the gender-based violence technical advisor for United uh, for the United Nations Population Fund (UNFPA). Um, and today we welcome everyone to our event um, on disrupt harm accountability for a safer internet. Um, so ending gender-based violence and harmful practices is at the center of what UNFPA do. Um, and increasingly in a digital world, we realize that we can't achieve that without ensuring that all women and girls are safe in all spaces, um, including online spaces and through their use of technology. So we're, we are hosting the event today uh, to explore those mechanisms through which law and policy and civil society movements are operating to disrupt that harm um, experienced by women in online spaces and technology. And we're going to hear from um, a really amazing panel. I feel really privileged to be sitting here um, with such phenomenal people. Um, but we will hear from a range of different perspectives um, their wealth and experience across um, their work in, in doing exactly this and disrupting harm. We'll then open um, for a Q&A both with online, um, we, we have an online presence, so we'll, we'll have a Q&A with you in the room, but also with Q&A uh, for people online. So, and we're a relatively small room, so please don't be shy in taking the microphone and, and, um, and asking. Um, with that, I will turn to um, our uh, first panelist, uh, who is Senator Martha Lucia Michel Camorena, known as Malu Michel. Uh, she is a staunch feminist. Um, she is the Morena Senator for Guanajuato. She is a mother. She is a federal represent, or has been a federal representative on three occasions currently a legislator in the Congress of Union representing the state of Guanajuato, and she will speak specifically around the legal measures and regulations implemented in Mexico for the prevention and response of technology facilitated gender-based violence. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you for inviting me. Nice to meet you, and thank you very much for this invitation. Um, well, good afternoon. I am Marta Lucia Micher Camarena and Mexican senator, and today I want to share the current situation of women, adolescents, and girls regarding information and communication technologies. Uh, I now want to address an important and troublesome issue, digital violence, which according to the UN, three out of 10 women internet users in Mexico have been victims of cyberbullying that is approximately 10 million women. In addition, the National Front uh, for Sorority and Digital Defenders, a Mexican civil society organization, an NGO, has indicated that uh, 19 five out of every 100 victims of digital violence are women, pointing out that 74.1% uh, of women victims of digital violence are between 18 and 30 years old, 72.3% uh, are university students, and 81.6% of the aggressors are a known person, mainly former partners. Among the main behaviors reported by this violence are dissemination of intimate content without consent, threats of dissemination, harassment, and or sexual harassment, extortion or sexor sexortion, sexual assaults not related to sexual intimacy, distribution of child pornography, production of intimate content without consent, dissemination of personal data offering sexual services without consent, and identity uh, theft. 
the main formats, formats in which uh, digital aggressions occur are intimate photo sharing groups of, uh, or websites, direct message, creation of fake profiles, and attack from fake profiles. Well, currently, I chair, I chair the Gender Equality Committee in the Mexican Senate, a legislative space that has allowed me to create, contribute, and adapt legislation, legislation to current times. Thus, we are not only concerned, but we have also dealt, dealt or dealt, dealt, dealt with legislating important reforms that provide safety of women in digital space. Well, the reform, and it was uh, approved in unanimidad. How do you say unanimity? Everyone. Aha. Uh -huh. See. Sí. The reform entails the following. Define digital violence as any malicious action carried out through the use of information and communication technologies by which images, audios, or real or simulated videos of intimate sexual content of a person without their consent, without their approval, or without their authorization are exposed, distributed, distributed, disseminated, exhibited, transmitted, market, offered, exchanged, or shared without cause, with, with cause, psychological and emotional harm, as well as damage any area of the person's private life or own image. It also includes those malicious acts that cause damage to the intimacy, privacy, and or dignity of women which are committed through information and communication technologies. Second, regulates protection orders for digital violence cases in which the public prosecutor's office or judge will immediately order the necessary protection measures, introducing electronic or ingriding the companies of digital platforms, the media, social of website, website pages, individuals or companies to interrupt, block, destruct, or delete image, Im image, audios or videos related to the investigation. And third, adds the crime of violation of sexual intimacy, intimacy punishable by a penalty of three to six years in prison to anyone who discloses, shares, distributes, or publish image, videos, or audios of uh, intimate sexual content of a person who is a legal age uh, without the person's consent, approval, or authorization, as well as anyone who videotapes, audiotapes, photographs, prints, or develops image, audios, or videos with intimate sexual content of a person without their consent, without their approval, or without their uh, uh, authorization. Well, I am convinced that one of the best ways to achieve women, adolescents, and girls' safety is to provide an applicable legal framework to face situations that cause serious harm to their lives. Never take one step back on women's rights. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I, I think that set the stage for the entire event very well. Um, I. I, well, we'll now introduce the other panelists who'll be um, who'll be speaking with us today. Um, we have Sherry Kram Talabani, who um, is uh, sitting right next to the senator, um, who is the executive director of the Seed Foundation. Um, Sherry is a human rights lawyer and has over 20 years of experience in as a policymaker, program manager, and advocate for gender and human rights and social justice. And today she'll be speaking to us specifically around um, contemporary legal frameworks and political discourses on technology facilitated GBV in Iraq. Um, and then sitting on the other side of Sherry, uh, we have uh, Carla Velasco Ramos, the policy advisor coordinator at the Association for Progressive Communications. And Carla has many ex years of experience in internet access, gender, and technology. And with the APC, plays a crucial role in convening CSOs, tech companies, and online platforms to address TFGBB. And then we will be speaking 
with our e-safety commissioner, uh, Julie Inman Grant, um, one of the only intergovernmental regulatory bodies in the world committing to, committed to keeping citizens safer online. Um, the e-safety commissioner has extensive experience in the non-profit and government sectors and has spent two decades working in senior public policy and safety roles in the tech industry, um, including at Microsoft, Twitter and Adobe. And as the commissioner plays an important role um, as the uh, global chair, glo as a, an important global role um, as the chair of the Child Dignity Alliance's technical working group, a board member of the We Protect Global Alliance, um, and the Commissioner also serves on the World Economic Forum's Global Coalition for Digital Safety and on their XR Eco <laughs> Ecosystem Governance Steering Committee on Building and Defining the Metaverse. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, and finally, uh, we will um, conclude our panel uh, discussion with Juan Carlos Lara, who um, is the executive director at Derechos Digitales, an organization working at the intersection of human rights and digital technologies, um, where um, he is a lawyer by training and has experience in legal and policy analyst and research on data privacy, surveillance, freedom of expression, and access to knowledge in the digital environment. So. With that, I will now turn um, to you, Sherry. Thank you yeah. for being with us. Thank you for hosting us. Um, I think at the at the conference. Surprisingly, I'm not very tech savvy myself. Um, <laughs> um, so what I really wanted to do is drill down um, on what online violence means in Iraq, but I think also across the Middle East, because I think it's an area where we see very high internet penetration, um, but also very high rates of gender inequality, extremely conservative norms, which creates unique vulnerabilities. It, uh, of people are, who already have high vulnerabilities, um, and it exacerbates those. Um, so unique vulnerabilities to TFGBV, and with real life uh, disastrous consequences for women um, and young girls. Uh, we see TFGBV uh, endemic and increasing across the Middle East and Iraq. So Iraq is the fourth worst country in the world when it comes to uh, women's peace, security, access to justice, women's rights, and their safety. Um, and that's according to the Women, Peace, and Security Index. <coughs> and it relates to their participation in every aspect of life. We have the highest rate of intimate partner violence in the world. 45% of women face uh, violence in their home. So women aren't safe at home. And we have conservative norms that shape and constrain how women and girls, uh, what they can do, um, and how they behave. Um, and we see adolescents and young women with extremely limited freedoms and spending a lot of their free time online. We have the largest gap globally. Um, it, it shows up in the economic sphere, in political participation, in education and health attainments, in their very survival. And we have very limited protections in place. At the same time, Iraq is very well connected. 75% of the population are active on the internet. Almost everybody has a cell phone. The gaps between women and men uh, exist, for sure, with uh, the biggest gap in connection with rural women, um, and uh, with women lagging behind in terms of digital literacy. Nonetheless, 50% of women and girls in Iraq uh, say that they have faced and experienced TFGBV or know someone who has experienced it. In this context, with these social and cultural dynamics, women and girls are extremely vulnerable to online violence with the high likelihood that this violence um, shows up offline as well. So what are we worried about? Much as what the senator just described, harassment, abuse, exploitation, trafficking, <laughs> Um, we also see these phenomena lead to murder, honor killings, um, and increased rates of suicide. 
So what do we see? We see image-based abuse, just what you just described, private photo or image or film, um, sometimes real and sometimes manipulated, used to exploit sextortion, uh, used to traffic, um, used um, in every economic strata uh, uh, in our society uh, for women and girls. And besides the violence that women and girls face from the perpetrator or the person that's abusing them online, um, we also see them face uh, extremely high rates of violence in their home life as a result of this threat and uh, of this violence. So it really, if their families find out, it could lead to, to honor-based violence and murder. And it has, and we have the many cases of this. Um, harassment, threats, and defamation. And it's against women and girls generally. Um, but it, it's especially um, a risk for women in the public space, academics, politicians, um, uh, NGO leaders, and women of every walk of life. And it's intended to inhibit and constrain women and girls' participation. Um, and so we see them being harassed and intimidated online. We've seen a spate of murders of social media influencers um, for dressing uh, what is perceived to be provocatively smoking. Um, and punishing them for going outside social norms. So it's violent and it's scary and it's intended to keep women's representation and participation low and it's very effective at that. We have other challenges with predatory practices, um, including of children through gaming, child porn, child trafficking rings, but these are less documented and well known. And of course the most obvious and horrific abuse is that we saw women sold like chattel by ISIS online, and that fostered the, um, the trafficking of women during the ISIS crisis, which continues even to today online. So what do we need to do to address it? My organization two years ago started a nationwide task force. I think it's the only nationwide task force called the TFGBV task force, and you can find out and connect to our task force here. Um, we're focused on human rights-based legislation. Um, and policy across the Middle East and Iraq. Legislation to protect against these harms is often used to, to uh, decrease public expression, um, free media, um, and the response tends to be rules that inhibit and, and criminalize public expression. So we need to focus on the crime, um, but not on expression. We need increased access to safe and confidential reporting along with investigations and protections from designated agencies with clear mandates and skilled personnel. Um, so we don't have that in Iraq today. We don't have a designated, uh, we do have some legislation, but we don't have a designated agency and we certainly don't have um, investigations that are skilled or experienced. We also need skilled and experienced NGOs um, that understand this unique kind of crime and how it impacts women and girls across Iraq and, of course, the Middle East. Um, and this requires uh, serious training, capacity building, which are, we are undertaking. And then finally, we need to focus on the tech companies. They need to have proper redress that is both survivor-centered, rights-focused, um, including child rights focused, that understands how this type of online violence manifests into real world violence across the Middle, e Middle East in a unique way and develop appropriate safe responses for the environment that we face. So to close, we really need a regionalized local response um, in whatever internet governance architecture that emerges from these forums, whether it's the, the Global Digital Compact or other, um, other thread, we need to address in these broad governance uh, mechanisms uh, the unique uh, and, and uh, unique uh, violence and, and considerations that we face across the Middle East. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sherry. Um, and to, to really to build on your work as, as a CSO in, in Iraq, um, I'll now turn to the Association for Progressive Communications who have demonstrated a long-standing ability to mobilize um, communities and community organizations around the issue of addressing tech-facilitated GBV. Um, I wondered if you could speak to the role of APC um, in shaping those movements, but also perhaps talk to some of the voices that you think might be missing from those movements. 
Yes, thank you. Um, so I am Carla and I'm the policy advocacy coordinator of the Women's Rights Program, which is part of the Association for Progressive Communication. So today I'm going to speak on behalf of WRP and ABC. Uh, the Association for Progressive Communications is a network organization. It's a members organization. Uh, we uh, have around 70 member organizations that work uh, in um, approximately 40 countries around the world, mostly of them <coughs> uh, in the global south or in, ma in the majority world. So the work that we do with our member organizations since APC's inception which, but which was uh, almost 30 years ago, uh, is through the women's rights program uh, to um, to work on women's rights, sexual rights, and, and feminist movements. And back then, when we started working um, with the women's rights programs, a language like online gender-based violence was something that didn't even exist, right? So. It is a celebration for us that um, 25 years after we get to see uh, these issues in the agenda and we get to see that different governments are taking this, um, this very important issues into account and are these are being mentioned right now in at the Internet Governance Forums, um, at the Global Digital Compact and the in the different feminist foreign policies that are currently pushing the, this subject, right? So for us, um, it has been a major achievement to have this. Uh, uh, in 2022, um, the term was successfully recognized as a human rights violation. And it was um, thanks to the work of, of member organizations together with APC and with other uh, organizations from the feminist movements. And it has been um, uh, a successful work for us to be able to find a pathway beti between feminist organizations and digital rights organizations, right? Because that's also a very big struggle um, right now. So uh, for us, um, it is very important to bring into the digital space the voices of women and people of diverse genders and sexualities. And the things that are very important and crucial right now uh, is that even though there is a discussion between online gender-based violence and uh, technology facilitated <laughs> gender-based violence, we need to go beyond uh, the discussion of the term and we really need to discuss the response and remedy to victims and, sur and survivors where they are. So for example, one of the things that I want to highlight here uh, is that we hear in many of the discussions um, th uh, the, the, the phrase, yes, uh, access and digital skills for women and girls as a possible solution to the problems that we have for gender. And my, my urgency here is to please go beyond that, you know, because access is only part of the problem. But what we really need to look at is the usage of, of the Internet and how women and people of diverse genders and sexualities are connected, the issues that we face online and how we have um, differentiated, um, differentiated effect when we are using the internet, right? And how that crosses intersectionality and how that crosses where we come from, where are we connecting from? And it in intersects with race, gender, identity, sexuality, class, ethnicity. So we need to take all of these things into account. So once you look into or beyond the gender gap, you get to see that there's a lot of complexities around that. And we really need to focus on, on this. And this is what the members are currently asking for us to do, right? To bring the conversation beyond that, to bring technology facilitated gender-based violence, to bring uh, gender disinformation into the discussion, but also to change a little bit the narrative because we always think about the negative things and we always uh, see the negative uh, effects and impacts that we have. But for example, in APC, we have a vision of transformation transformative justice. So we really, uh, the, the proposal that we have here and that we also um, show in our feminist principles of the internet is how through uh, bringing values such as pleasure, sexuality, joy, uh, freedom of expression, we, we get to change the narrative of how we see these issues um, uh, that, are, that we are currently facing as women and people of diverse genders and sexuality. So my time is up. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Carla. Um, um, and with that, I think, you know, an another pathway around how we achieve those safe spaces for women and girls to enjoy technology and online spaces, we have Commissioner Iman Grant. Um, it would be lovely to hear from you about what, um, yeah, what, what, 
what does a regulatory body look like and how is that disrupting harm so that women can in have a, a transformative experience online? Well, thank you. I'd also like to play off the really important discussion that has already been had and congratulate everyone for not using the term revenge porn. Uh, when I was announced as e-safety commissioner, I was asked to set up a revenge porn portal and I said, yes, I will, but no, I will not call it revenge. Revenge for what? and porn not for the titillating purposes. We can't be using language that trivializes or victim blames. So it's so good to see that in many languages, in many contexts, that image-based abuse is being uh, adopted as uh, a much more in empowered uh, terminology. Um, I think it's really important. Uh, the, the the role that we have um, actually gives me a legislative role to coordinate all online safety uh, activity across the Commonwealth, um, but also to be the educator and the regulator for online safety. Now, I, I think it's really important, we've heard this, there is no one size fits all. So when we're talking about prevention and education, um, it's really important to, to establish an evidence base and understand how the most vulnerable communities are being impacted and how it might be manifesting differently. So for instance, in Australia, uh, indigenous Australians are um, twice as likely to receive online hate than the broader general population. And the way the indigenous communities use technology is different. They tend to share devices, they tend to share passwords, it's a very um, familial base, but that also means then there are more imposter accounts and takeovers and letter violence. But you also can't say there's a one-size-fits-all for indigenous uh, communities. Um, the experiences of urban indigenous people are different from those in rural and remote communities. By the same token, in culturally and linguistically diverse communities, when we looked at technology-facilitated abuse, not only there are they experiencing the harm and the mental and emotional distress that the everyday Australian is experiencing from technology-facilitated abuse, they often have low digital lit literacy, low technology literacy. The man controls the technology in the home. There are additional threats of um, deportation. Uh, there may be you know, mistrust of police and government organizations um, and, um, and just general disenfranchisement from the community. Um, and then when we look at those with intellectual and dis uh, disabilities, um, these women are f afraid to, to tell the truth. They're afraid that they will not be believed. And it's often their carers or their partners that control their technology and um, threaten to cup th cut them off from their, their, their peers and their friends. Um, and they may not have the capability of knowing where to report to or where to get help. So we do have this in the intersectional nature that we have to um, make sure that we understand we need to co-design solutions for prevention with these communities. Um, when we get to the protection side of things, um, to echo the senator's um, comments, because we take complaints from the pub public along around child sexual abuse material, around image-based abuse, around youth-based cyberbullying, and adult cyber abuse, Every single one of those forms of abuse is gendered. Um, yeah, the average age uh, for, for girls um, being bullied used to be 14. We're now getting reports from p uh, girls as young as um, eight or nine years old. I've just issued end user powers against a group of six 14-year-old boys who are sending rape and death threats to another 14-year-old girl. Um, you know, we're helping women in Iran and Pakistan with um, Australian connections get their image-based abuse materials down um, because they're at risk of um, honor killings um, and um, you know a, a terrible shame that um, we don't experience it the same way in the Australian context um, and so we're now issuing some remedial, remedial directions against some of those people. Um, so using these deterrent powers and naming and shaming uh, does have an impact. We have a 90% success rate in terms of getting this content taken down and I can tell you that so many women that come to us, that's what they want. They've been to the police and um, they were told, why'd you take the I image in the first place? Why don't you just get off the internet? So. Again, we need, to, we, we need to learn from each other so that we can develop solutions that will work in every jurisdiction and every con context, and my time is up, but uh, I just want to offer um, that we're willing to work with all of you to help share our learnings. Thank you. Um, I will turn to our last panelist now, Juan Carlos. Um, 
to speak to the significance of um, some work where UNFPA and Derechos Digitales are doing jointly around what rights-based law reform looks like to address, uh, to address TFGBV and, and why this is an important piece of work. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you to NFPA for the invitation to participate in this. I am now saluting you all from uh, Derechos Digitales. We're an NGO working in the intersection of human rights and digital technologies working in Latin America. And I speak also on behalf of my wonderful colleagues who are working in this effort to provide guidance uh, for, uh, for law reform. Uh, I'd like to begin by highlighting the fact that as a civil society organization based in the global majority, we understand that the internet is indeed a place of risk, but it's also a place for opportunity, that uh, the di digital realm has meant and has allowed for more spaces to give visibility to social demands, to social justice demands, and also for the demands of combating and preventing uh, gender-based violence, especially that which is facilitated by technology. Um, at the same time, I do wish to acknowledge like the, the significant contributions to this panel, which are a big summary of the amounts and the diversity of the violence that women, gender non-conforming people, LGBTQIA plus people face daily on the internet. But at the same time, the work that Derechos Digitales is conducting is trying to address the fact that we need sensible legislation legislative efforts, standards uh, are being discussed right now. However, how that applies to the internet and to the complexity of the social background of this, these types of violence is a very complex problem and the legislative side of it is only one part of it. And we need to take it and, uh, into consideration in its right way to balance the rights and of course to provide um, the solutions that the legislation by itself is able to provide. We need to also understand that complex social issues are not going to be just solved by virtue of uh, enacting new laws, but that we also need enforcement and we need um, a level of understanding throughout the, the system that should be uh, reflected as well. So we need to develop legal frameworks that address technology facilitated gender-based violence from the perspective of balance. Um, and also taking into consideration that the privacy of the survivors themselves, their freedom of expression, their access to information are relevant also for them. It's not just a matter of the rights of the people who are committing the offenses. So because these are social problems that disproportionately affect people in situations of vulnerability and women also in the public sphere, we need to defend an intersectional approach that addresses contextual and social differences. And also that there are groups that we know from our situated perspective that may distrust institutions, that because of the history of marginalization, do not trust that the existing institutions uh, that enforce the law are sufficiently capable of addressing their needs or their expectations of reparation. And finally, that we need to consider the need to educate the operators of the justice system, from the police to the judges and everyone in between, because these are complex issues that are not solved just by text. Um, finally, uh, we understand also that criminalization of violence is not by itself a solution to a multi-layer multi social problem, and that we need further action to educate and to prevent violence. But when we decide to take legislative action, it is important not to create further violence nor further infringements of rights. Uh, again, going back to my initial point, the internet has become fundamental for the exercise of rights, including access to information, including sexual and reproductive rights, and the capacity to associate and to uh, defend those rights and to promote those rights and to create change in policy as well. Uh, and so it's therefore very important to combat violence. Uh, so we need to strengthen rights around technologies themselves with a strong focus on privacy, security, freedom of expression, including tools like encryption and anonymity and, and education, um, and to defend those as m ways in which we can use technology to not just promote rights, but also to create social change. Any type of legislation that aims to prevent and combat uh, technology facilitated gender-based violence need to take all of that into consideration and we expect that guidance to help in that effort. Thank you.
Thank you so much. I, I, with that, we've, I think we've heard across an ecosystem of stakeholders who are, who are working to hold, um, you know, to, to hold tech spaces um, to account to safety for, for women and girls. With that, I might turn to see whether there's any questions in the room or online. Oh, here we, I think. I think probably this is the most colorful panel I have seen so far. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, so my name is Samirat uh, from um, Sri Lanka. I'm working for Dialogue. Uh, it's a telecommunication company. Uh, so in line with you know what we discussed, and thank you very much for those uh, insightful stuff, uh, what we got from all the panelists. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so we have not to that extent, maybe Ar Iraqi, you know, what, what, what I heard, you know, like it's, my God, uh, we can imagine, you know, what's going on there, but we are probably lucky. But, you know, we do have challenges the all, all the way there in Sri Lanka as well. So what we do is we are c uh, c coming up with the uh, online security bill, okay, which has been drafted and it is getting, you know, kind of public opinions and it is uh, to be passed at the parliament. So I, I would like to ask from the panelists, you know, like maybe what the kind of experience in your respective countries on online safety, because maybe that uh, addressed a lot of challenges what we were discussing, okay? Uh, because even impersonate and, you know, like the trust and the women's safety, children's safety, and all those come into uh, that. So what is your experience? And in your respective countries, wh what are you, uh, where are you in terms of, you know, coming up with the online uh, safety bill? Is it passed in your places? You know, what are the challenges? Uh, any advice from the panel based on your experience? Thank you. Um, that's that's a great question. So um, we were established uh, in 2015 as the Children's e Safety Commissioner, and I think that actually helped us a bit because it came out of a result of tragedy. A well-known um, adult personality was terribly trolled on Twitter as I was applying for a job at Twitter. Um, to start their uh, Australian function, and she ended up taking her life. And a petition went to the government saying, we've got to stop, uh, we, government has to step in. Um, but the ICT minister at the time, who eventually became our prime minister, um, had not been an ICT entrepreneur, knew that if we started with children, nobody could argue that cyberbullying of children and child sexual exploitation was a freedom of expression issue. So we started there, and then we layered on different functions. Um, and we've already had a reform of our bill that has now given us um, systemic and process-based powers. But I, I also want to t tackle the issue of anonymity um, because it's more, much more complex than people uh, give it f credit for. And I think what we are struggling now is a, a range of um, human rights that need to be properly balanced. Um, and we see that playing out in the debate around um, child safety and their right to be free from violence and child dignity through the scanning of known child sexual abuse images versus the uh, privacy of adults. But I was asked by a senator, we should just ban anonymity. And I said, well, one, I don't think the internet is architected that way, and I don't think it's necessarily desirable. And when we think about dissidents and we think about women, most of these adult cyber abuse cases we take are uh, women being doxxed or experiencing um, uh, cyber, cyber stalking, uh, really serious um, online offenses. And what the government decided to do so that people couldn't cowardly hide behind a fake and imposter account is they've given us powers with lots of accountability and transparency provisions behind it to um, go to the platforms and ask for um, what is called basic subscriber information as the basis for um, further investigation. So most of the companies pick up things like IP addresses, MAC addresses, device IDs, only for the purposes of issuing um, notices when, when our investigators have found that they have violated the law. Um, but that doesn't mean you should undermine anonymity totally. We just need to find ways to eliminate that cloak of, it, of um, anonymity um, as a way of abusing others with total impunity. Sure, so in Iraq we do have mm -hmm. some existing legislation, um, but I would say that it's not well understood. I would say the crime isn't well understood. And the gaps in the legislation are it doesn't mandate an institution um, to handle this type of crime. And so uh, it's ill-suited to the, ki the kinds of crimes that are have, em uh, have emerged. And I would say that um, 
it is also being used on the other side to restrict <coughs> to restrict freedoms, to restrict um, participation in social media, so uh, to, to be used against journalists. So I think it's the, the legislation isn't really sufficiently targeted. I would say that in the public justice system, we lack confidentiality, privacy, um, and the skills to do the appropriate kinds of investigations that are needed here, the technical skills, the forensic ability. So I think we need a, a major overhaul um, and trying to find a way to, to get that legislation so that it is respecting rights at the same time um, really equips the government agencies with the, with the uh, mandate um, and the capacity to, to address the kinds of uh, violence that we're facing. <laughs> well, we had, um, tuvimos muchos problemas para aprobar esa ley. A mí me gustaría que lo dijeras. No fue fácil. Um, we had many issues when addressing, when publishing this law. It wasn't easy. Eh, hablamos con Facebook, con Twitter, hablamos con varias plataformas que no querían eh, sentirse involucradas en esto. We talked vi with various platforms like Facebook and Twitter and others that didn't want to get involved and participate. Mm, pero llevamos los testimonios de, de madres y de mujeres víctimas, madres de, de, de niñas y de adolescentes víctimas, y eso nos ayudó muchísimo a que Facebook y Twitter cambiaran mucho su, su situ la situación. And we took the stories of women and their daughters, uh, the, um, I forgot the word, the statements, the um, uh, testimonies, thank you, of sí. women and their daughters, and we brought them to Facebook and Twitter, and that made them ch change their minds. Sí. Y, y logramos finalmente esta reforma al, al Código Penal para que se transformara en un castigo, no nada más en, un, en una descripción de conducta, sino que fuera, eh, fuera eh, pues castigada. Pero además tiene la obligación la plataforma de no subir las escenas y si las escenas se suben eh, sin el consentimiento de ella, inmediatamente deben de bajarlo. Yes, so we took this and transformed it into a bill in order to um, mm -hmm. uh, penalize and criminalize this issue. And um, also platforms have the responsibility and they should be accountable of taking down um, this type of material that is compromising the, the safety of, of women and girls. Y finalmente decir que ha, ha provocado suicidios esta situación en el, en el mundo. Y por eso cuando dimos las, los, las gráficas, los niveles de, de suicidio, de intento de suicidio y suicidio de las adolescentes, esto sí ya pues, comprometió más a las plataformas. And also the fact that the suicidal rate increased a lot, eh, it was a very important factor for the platforms to, to take into account and also comply. And sorry, I also want to add something, and thank you very much for 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 those senator for your words. <laughs> um, I think well, in the sense uh, we've been working with this issue as well for for many years now, and uh, what we've seen with our members is that of course it's a multi-layered uh, problem, so it's it 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 needs a multi-layered response, right? It's not only responsibility of governments, but it's also responsibility of the society also for, for the platforms in that sense. So what we see is that first, national contexts are very important to take into account. Each national context is very different. So if you have civil society organizations or members from civil society or even individu individuals or women and girls that can participate in the, shaped in, in the, sh in the shaping of these laws or these actions, it is very important that these, these are taken into account. Research, a lot of research needs to be done um, to in order to face this problem. And one one thing that Juan Carlos mentioned was um, also uh, how everyone um, inside the judiciary system also needs to be trained. You need to be sensitive. Sensitivist. How do you say it? Like, yes, 
<laughs> you need to be gender sensitive, right? Because you're dealing with gender issues. So it's something that also needs to, to be uh, implemented, for example, in some criminal justice systems. Um, another thing that we worry about is that um, often states respond with conservative and moralistic protectionist measures, and this has the consequences of censoring and limiting speech. So it's also important to consider rights such as right to safety, movement, participation in public life, freedom of expression, privacy. Shame is often used with victims and uh, survivors, so this is also an important issue to take into account. But as I mentioned before, it's a multi-layered problem. We, I think in, in, in our point of view, we still need a lot of information, but we need a multi-layered response. Uh, everyone is responsible. We're all responsible for this problem, and we, we all need to... Um, we, we all need to be part of the solution, right? So, um, yes, thank you. Thank you. Juan Carlos, would, did you want to come in on that Sorry. question before I... Very briefly, I just want to point out uh, on the subject of legislation and how it can be misused. There was research that was published earlier this year conducted by Derechos Digitales with support from APC and also relying on, on prior research by other organizations such as policy and body and data and others that reflects also how existing laws can be used negatively and impact the victims of violence themselves, either through the use of the prosecutorial system in a, in a manner that is against the purposes of the same laws or because of the laws that are poorly drafted. So it's very important to also consider that the systems themselves are w something that goes well beyond just the institutional frameworks and, and we need also to see how they operate in practice. This is a consistent theme across the world in terms of um, law enforcement, understanding how this manifests. Uh, I, I mean, AVOs are hard, um, apprehended violence orders are hard to um, enforce anyway, but then when you put it into the digital realm, it gets even um, more difficult. Um, but we've just been having a discussion this past week in Australia about how few offenders of child sexual abuse are actually prosecuted. Um, and the case of women who have experienced image-based abuse, and let's be honest, there are still gendered double standards that exist that make image-based abuse the scarlet letter of the digital age. If you're a woman showing a, you know, a little bit of cleavage, you're a woman of ill repute. When it's a man showing his six-pack, it's, it's a totally different thing. And so when women, um, one of the reasons we focus on taking the content down as quickly as possible is that relieves, relieves the emotional and mental distress. If they decide to take um, a former partner um, because it's relationship retribution to court, not only do they have to face them and that family, they often have to introduce the images that caused them the distress in the first place as evidence in court. Um, so we really need to change these processes to um, minimize <laughs> the distress and re actually get some outcomes against the offenders and perpetrators. Thank you, I think that's such a valid point about having that intermediary between survivors and a very complex and often convoluted justice system which is quite difficult to navigate, particularly if you're a survivor of violence and already recurring trauma. Please, I might take one more question from the room or Angela, I think you also put your hand up. So maybe two questions from the room and then we have one more question online. So we'll we'll. Okay, hello, uh, thank you for the panel and such important discussions. My name is Emanuela, I'm from Brazil. I represent Instituto Alana, which is a child rights defense organization. And one thing that's a little on my mind and I would like if you guys could explore a little bit more, it's because when we talk about accountability, we are no normally talking about the need for data and the need for research and the need to understand the bigger complex. And my fear is to depend too much on the platforms for that and how can we integrate more and to generate data from our public system, from our assistance, and what kind of data would we need in that sense to understand and maybe not depend so much on the platforms? What kind of disaggregated data do you guys think that would be important? And what service could it be integrated so we had a, a whole picture that did not depend or maybe Maybe not people don't you know flag all the content that happens online. They suffer for violence, but how can we you know give more visibility to this topic through public system? So that's my question. Thank you. Um, 
I, I spent 22 years in the technology industry, so you know I have some knowledge about <laughs> uh, where systems lie and what com companies are doing. But in this role, uh, for six years, I was asking the same major companies, you've created photo DNA. It's been used for 10 years. Um, what services are you using this on? Are you eating your own dog food? Why are your, uh, you know, how, why is it so hard to report abuse? And are you scanning or not? And because I never got straight answers to straight questions, when we reformed our bill, I went to the government and said, one, we need to know that companies are following the basic online safety expectations, and I need legal compulsion powers. Um, to be able to ask the questions that need to be answered, not the selective transparency we see in the transparency reports. So um, we, we released our first um, transparency report in December of last year against um, Apple, Microsoft, Meta, Skype, WhatsApp, Snap, and Omegle, and found that the richest, um, most well-resourced and ubiquitous tech companies in the world um, were not doing enough, some not doing anything to address child sexual abuse. So I was frankly surprised that more people weren't more outraged um, when we came out with that data. It, that's starting to change. Uh, Professor Hani Farid, who invented photo DNA, just um, put a piece up in the San Francisco Chronicle today. There's something called the Heat Initiative in the U.S. where <laughs> they're, they're actually focusing on Apple um, and saying, you know, Privacy and safety shouldn't be considered false binaries. There needs to be balance. But um, you know, doing only reporting 234 instances of child sexual abuse when you have billions of handsets in the world, where whereas Meta um, reported 27 million, there's something wrong here. You're obviously either not scanning or uh, allowing reports, but probably both. And this is what our report found. So we'll, we'll have a big um, announcement next week around another seven companies. Um, so we'll slowly, slowly, just as Brandeis said, sunlight is the, disinfect the best disinfectant. And so we do need to shine a light on these shortcomings. But then we need all of you again, to build that outrage and to demand um, more change. Um, you know, we can do certain things as a small regulator, but we do need a global movement here. Thank you. I might, Angela, I might turn to you for your question and then we, are, we will have to wrap up the session. Um, thank you so much. My name is Angela Minayo. I work for an ICT policy think tank that is based in Nairobi, Kenya. I have worked on online safety for now two years. I'm a lawyer by training, and now I work on gender and technology. My question is very simple. I believe that there is consensus about the harms of online gender-based violence, but we do not see this consensus turn into any tangible outputs, especially on the global stage. I have attended IGF since 2017, and we have always had a session or another on online safety. But every time we come back here and we talk about the same issues and how uh, terrible it is, but we don't see movement at the international forum. What is stopping us, and how can we intervene in these international processes that can bring real change for women? Um, my second question is uh, around online child abuse and uh, women's safety. So I made an observation that online child abuse is uh, very much well understood, even in the law enforcement sector, you'll be surprised. So uh, we have in Kenya something known as the Child Protection Unit um, based at the DCI, and they understand very well how to handle child abuse uh, complaints. But then you ask them, how, how about women and girls who are above 18 years, and they don't, they don't even consider them as victims to be taken care of in the legal system. So there's almost um, protection to children up to the age of 18 in my country at least. And then from 18, you're a woman and your harm is normalized, violence against you is normalized and you're not even considered a victim. So those are my two statements, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, um, Angela. I, very quickly on the global stage, I think, we're lucky to have Ellen here from Young Women, but last, uh, you know, in March, the, the entire Commission of Status of Women was dedicated to gender and technology, and I think there was a really strong focus around technology facilitated gender-based violence, integrated into global outcomes documents and language. So I think at, at a global level, there is certainly movement around building international language uh, and, and policy, and I think at a national level, we're very much seeing, you know, movements around different countries implementing laws and policies. Um, I will pass to the senator. 
Sí, bueno, eh, let me tell you that I was in Beijing in 1995, 1995, and everyone told us that we were, que estábamos locas. <laughs> locas, crazy, they told us, you are crazy. They didn't want us to talk about violence against women or, um, or this kind of issues about uh, penalties and, you know, And now, it, yo, yo veo que hemos avanzado mucho, si lo puedes decir, pero muchísimo. Hace 30 años este tema era del brujas, era un tema prohibido y ahora vamos muy avanzadas. Pero yo creo que el reto es los juzgadores y los ministerios públicos. Creo que ahí es donde mm -hmm. tenemos. So, the senator sharing that she has seen a lot of progress in the last 30 years and that we should definitely take that into account. It has completely shifted for 30 years, so that's something to, to remember. And that the problem now is the judiciary system, um, public ministries and judges. This is the, the most important problem, uh, as she shared just now. Thank you. I, we do have to wrap up now, um, but I will ask um, Eiko Norita, the uh, representative of our Japan UNFPA office, to, to close us out today. I'll stand up so you can sit here, because I think there's a... Yeah. Well, well, thank you so much. Um, six is a great number here, but I thought I would be the lucky seven barging in <laughs> to close this session, but it's really you know, excellencies and, you know, all these leaders and, and wonderful colleagues and also friends, you know, within the community for being here to this really rich conversation around, d you know, disrupt harm, accountability for safe to safer internet. Um, since we keep talking about the importance of multi-stakeholder conversations over the last couple of days, I mean, what does that really mean? And I think you heard that here, right? More specifically, you know, we need to come together across governments, you know, regulatory bodies, CSOs, businesses, and rights-based organizations to really collaborate more efficiently to be able to disrupt this harm over the internet that we see so, so frequently. Um, I think we also have to acknowledge at this moment the awe and the power of civil society organizations. I think it's really important that they're here today at IGF and, you know, especially including those led by APC and Audrey. Uh, primarily, I, I think what I was talking to Alex earlier this afternoon and saying, you know, they, they belong here, right? They, they are entities that belong here to really make that voice be heard from the ground because that's really important. We're not just talking sort of in theory. So just going over what we discussed today, we learned about the experiences of one of the only intergovernmental regulatory bodies, the e-safety commissioner of Australia, and also from the legislative scenarios of Mexico, all these steps taken, and from feminist digital rights activists whose global work you know, inspires really all of us and from community leaders in Iraq, one of the you know, toughest countries to really handle and face this gender-based violence issue, not only in online, but on the ground in person. And I think what this event did was to really put a human face over topics that are often so high up in the techno technology world. And I think that's really important that we put this human face to it. And I think it's interesting for me because we, we use you know, this online digital technology, the accountability of it is unlike other crimes like human, you know, crimes against humanity like genocide. They're accountable. Who do we per put kind of accountability to it? Um, when we have things like AI, suddenly that accountability is really much more difficult to put a finger to. So at UNFPA, you know, we're really working hard to try and as one of the transformative goals to end gender-based violence. And as Maria Ressa mentioned earlier, it's not okay, if it's not okay to do it in person, that it's not okay to do it online either. So, you know, I think we work with governments, policy makers like yourselves, and I just want us to finally maybe say that you're all here in your own positions, whether civil society or not. I think it's good for us to continue to use this platform as a way to interact and also 
continue the momentum of movement so that this becomes a place of exchange and also amplifying the voices of you know what is really important. So with that, I know I have to do this. I have to extend my gratitude to everyone who made this event possible. Special thanks go to our Honorable Senator Kamarena and also Julie Iman Grant, Sherry Kraham Talabani, Juan Carlos, Lara and Carla Valescos Ramos, and also Alex, Stephanie, and Eva, our team from UNFPA, and to all of you who have come here today to really make this conversation very rich. So thank you so much.
Hello, everybody. Is it on? Yeah, okay. And welcome. If you would like to discuss civil society uh, participation in international uh, fora on internet governance and the inclusive inclusiveness of these spaces, you're in the right room. Uh, I see that this is the time where everybody would rather take a nap with a jet lag than <laughs> <laughs> discuss serious topics, but uh, we do have a wonderful panel and a good topic today, so I hope you will all be engaged. Um, and um, we see this uh, as an open forum, as a dialogue, as a learning experience, and we'd like to hear as much from you, and I see a lot of uh, expertise in the room, as from our panel. And let me kick us off then with um, introducing myself. So <laughs> my name is Pavlina Edelson. I'm the executive director of Diplo US. And I'll be moderating this session and also speaking on behalf of Diplo Foundation. Um, we have Peter Marion, team leader of digital governance, uh, unit five in science technology innovation at DG INTPA. We have Teresa, IGF MAG member, GFC outreach manager, and esteemed board member of Diplo US. Um, then we have Victor Capillo, member of the Board of Trustees of Kenya ICT Action Network. And Marlena Wisniak, Senior Advisor of Digital Rights of uh, European Center for Nonprofit Law, ECNL. We also have online participation, and uh, my colleague Sita Laxmi is as a moderator who will come in with the questions from online. So, what are we going to be talking about? We will discuss in this session um, a new initiative by the European Commission, where Diplo Foundation is a part of, um, and a new project, Civil Society Alliances for Digital Empowerment, CAID, led by Diplo Foundation, working with nine partners globally that aims to increase participation of the civil society in international IG processes, which is funded by European Commission. We have partners at this table and some in the audience as well, uh, they are Forest International, ECNL, CIPESA, Kiktonet, Savorda, Fusion, Vision Ch for Change, SMEX, Fundacion Carisma, and PICAISOC. So quite, quite a big group and uh, quite a diversity of views on our ends. So our aim is um, to discuss how to improve and enhance engagement of civil society organizations in multi-stakeholder forums. What challenges do civil society face in meaningful engagement? And also, how can we bring in the perspective of Global South civil society into the international multi-stakeholder forums? Specifically, we'll talk also about standardization forums at ITU, IETF, and ICANN. So, um, with this, I would ask Peter to start us off with a short introduction, please. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody, or maybe people online 
good morning or good evening. Um, thanks a lot for for giving me um, the f you know the, the mic. I'm I think I'm probably the least um, knowledgeable in the room on the topic. Uh, so, but anyway, I'm I'm glad to to kick it off. Um, so maybe a bit of context, uh, because uh, as was mentioned, we are we are going we are moving into um, uh, a new project on this topic, and I'd just like to shape a little bit how we got to that point. So about three years ago, the topic of digital became a priority for the European Commission, and uh, in my DG international partnerships, we were looking at how to best uh, approach uh, this topic to work at this specifically. <coughs> um, we're looking at this topic at the global level, national level, regional level, and of course at different thematic uh, levels. Um, and when we looked at this specific topic, um, we always look at this through our lens of a human-centric digital development. And that means that of course, uh, you know, the, the human is centric, not the state, not the company. And also, um, as you've probably heard many times before, we, we are aiming at tackling the digital uh, divide. So very soon we, we came on this topic of you know, global uh, digital governance. What, what does this mean? Uh, this was quite new to us. This is also why I have to stress we are in still in learning mode. Um, <coughs> and um, another uh, aspect of our approach is that we wanted to look at this topic from a multilateral point of view and also from a multi-stakeholder point of view. And um, this is key. Uh, you know, EU is a very strong proponent of the multi-stakeholder approach, IGF processes and others. But we also looked at this through the multilateral approach. And when we um, started looking at this multilateral level, we noticed that um, even though everybody claims to be proponents of the multi-stakeholder model, uh, maybe not all the actors in the multi-stakeholder you know, uh, prism are there. And so specifically, we thought that uh, maybe on the topic of um, civil society, um, that that could be um, a topic that we would like to see uh, worked on. So I was talking about digital, but of course, on the other hand, the EU is a strong proponent of civil society in general. So I won't go too deep into that, but um, for us, it's clear that in the absence of a strong participation of civil society, um, we tend to see, if you look at history or even today, we, we tend to see societies drifting off in, in directions that are not uh, aligned with our human-centric model, let's say, or with our free democratic societies. So, okay. um, so this is a bit where we come from. So then the question was, okay, on global digital government, who, who needs to be around the table? Uh, we were looking at this UN agencies um, and, um, we also noticed that there are actors out there which are pushing some of these discussions into the intergovernmental sphere. Uh, also at this IGF, I think this is a topic uh, that's coming up quite a lot. And um, so we just want to emphasize again that, that we really would like to have certain discussions, global discussions at the multi-stakeholder uh, level. Um, we're the first proponent worldwide for the multilateral system, don't get us wrong, but certain discussions should not just be intergovernmental. And so um, this is where we are. Now, when we looked at, um, okay, how shall we approach then the topic of civil society? I'm sure we will get back uh, in more detail into that later, but just a few things. On the one hand, we noticed um, possibly a lack of uh, know-how on the topic um, and a lack of capacity. Now, I have to say, we face the same issues internally. So this is not something that is only for civil society organizations. Even in our own DG, in our own unit, there are very few people that actually know this topic. And we actually barely have resources to cover this. So it's not unique. Um, that's the first thing. The second was that um, even though civil society was present, then maybe not at the, the, the volume, so at the amount that we wanted. So I'll not go too much into that now. Um, okay, just to emphasize also that for us, in our perspective, when we talk about digital, we link this to the topic of rights, fundamental rights. So this is fundamental for any of our discussions that wherever, whatever we talk about, in the end it has to be aligned with our views on, on a rights-based approach, um, basically also aligned with the UN Charter of Human Rights. 
uh, and that underpins many of the discussions that we that we can have uh, afterwards. And then um, another thing is that we wanted to make sure that the Global South is involved, because when we looked at the capacity, there are actually actors also in civil society that are very knowledgeable, uh, that have a track record, but that was not, uh, I mean, we saw then maybe gaps in the, in the Global South. So we wanted to work on that. Last thing, I'm almost finished. This program <laughs> for us uh, has to be, we position this in an, in an overall program where we work on digital and multilateral. So digital and multilateral. And so in that context, just for information, we're also working with ITU and UNDP. So I mean, we have, um, you know, we're funding them for ac actions on, on digital and multilateral. ITU, UNDP, also OHCHR on, on rights, UNESCO. And we're also working with the, with the tech envoy. Um, of course, we're working with EU member states. And then as was mentioned, and this is quite new, so this is the first time for us, on this specific topic, we, we now have two actions that will start soon, and one is indeed with under the leadership, well, we, uh, you know, the chaired by, by Diplo, as was uh, explained. So thank you so much, and I'll pass the word back. Thank you, Peter, and uh, we certainly appreciate your insight on how European Commission views the participation of civil society. I think it uh, resonates a lot with what we see in the field as well. And we certainly uh, agree, working with the small and developing states, that the capacity problem is not only on the side of civil society, but with fragmentations of different forums and shifting things, uh, it, it is an overall problem which needs addressing. Um, with that, let's go to Teresa <laughs> uh, with her IGF mag hat to tell us more about how um, the International Forum sees this problem. Thank you very much, Pavlina. Thanks also, uh, Peter. Well, uh, first of all, congratulations, uh, not only uh, to the grantee, and a good one, and with excellent consortium, but also for um, you, know, you as the donor recognizing uh, the issue and the problem, uh, and deciding to make it a priority, because it is important. Um, you know, I will start with a few reflections on why I feel, in general, inputs of civil society um, are essential <laughs> in, uh, in the various policy processes uh, that, uh, that we are dealing with. Uh, you know, of course, um, you know, many of the deliberations uh, that are happening here um, uh, at Fora, like uh, Pavlina has mentioned, you know, uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, impact the individual. <laughs> and it's often the civil society organizations that, uh, uh, that have uh, the interest of, of the individuals uh, uh, really close, uh, close to their heart. Um, but beyond this kind of existential reasoning, uh, I feel that more and more uh, we are moving in some kind of a general culture uh, of multi-stakeholderism and uh, you know, that leading hopefully uh, to a kind of more efficient coordination mechanisms. So um, you know, basically with a few exceptions of some very hard policy issues, uh, it's very difficult uh, to think of a policy process that wouldn't benefit from multiple perspectives, from uh, multiple stakeholder groups, uh, obviously uh, including uh, civil society, which can uh, ultimately lead uh, to better and more informed uh, policy making. So, um, you know, even if you, like, we are talking here about civil society, but, you know, uh, think also about other stakeholder groups, like, for instance, how, how absurd would it be to discuss uh, some digital policy uh, developments without um, uh, being in touch with the private sector, you know, so uh, I, I feel that the same absurdity would stand for not consulting the civil society. So uh, I'm wearing a couple of hats today, <laughs> as Pavlina mentioned, uh, you know, uh, one hat is uh, ex-Diplo, uh, current uh, board member uh, of Diplo US. Uh, the second one, uh, Pavlina said, um, uh, IGF Mac member, but actually as of this morning, that's not the case because uh, <laughs> I have served uh, my, my three years, yes, but um, uh, I hope uh, that uh, it still allows me to um, provide some perspectives uh, on, on the current forum. So um, IGF, uh, 
is very traditionally dominated by civil society uh, participation. <laughs> it's not the stakeholder group that the IGF is struggling with. There are actually other stakeholder groups where, uh, where the struggle is, uh, is more, uh, more of an issue. So in this sense, really, I feel uh, it is a safe stay space and also the magic space <laughs> in a way um, for, for civil society uh, to allow uh, to engage with others without the pressure of necessarily kind of having a negotiation or, or a very concrete uh, outcome uh, in this uh, in this regard so mm. And that's something that definitely uh, should be protected, uh, you know, and I'm really curious once uh, this IGF is over, you know, how the chart of the various stakeholder representation will, will look like. But, uh, but uh, as usual, I, I, will, I will expect very, very heavy domination of civil society. Um, that's also why civil society, and maybe rightly so, uh, is very defensive about any kind of, um, yeah, uh, how to how to put it? You know, maybe some concerns uh, about the the future of the of the IGF. Yeah, so you will you will really hear uh, a lot of voices uh, you're hearing already, and will will hear in the in the coming months um, uh, even more. Because at this moment there is no equivalent uh, to uh, to a space like the Internet Governance Forum, where where civil society could have so much uh, opportunities uh, to express and in a way to also influence uh, the the discourse uh, on the on the issues uh, that are here uh, i'm happy then to go more in detail about how it actually works what's the role of the mac uh, in this sense but uh, but that's uh, that's maybe if we have time uh, and the last hat I'm wearing, and allow me just a very, very short mention. Uh, I currently work with the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, uh, the GFC. Uh, for those of you not familiar, we are actually also like a platform or a member organizations for various actors that are involved in uh, especially capacity building issues and particularly related to, uh, to uh, cyber security. Uh, and I think from, from the whole vision, how the GFC wants to bring these actors together, it's also one of the organizations that has got how how crucial it is to have uh, various uh, you know actors from all across the stakeholder spectrum uh, to get together and exchange uh, on issues related uh, related to cyber um, uh, in particular. So I'll probably stop here and look forward to the discussion. <laughs> all right, now I'll turn to Marlena because uh, we did have a very extensive. Uh, position from Teresa on, on the engagement of civil society. So from the position of ECNL and advocacy position, could you bring your perspective on the topic, please? Sure, thanks so much, Pavlina, and hi, everyone. It's great to be here today. I'm Marlena Wisniak. I lead the emerging tech and AI work at the European Center for Nonprofit Law, um, a civic space and human rights organization based in Europe, and I live in San Francisco, so a lot of interaction with the tech companies um, which I assume you mentioned as a stakeholder is often missing. Um, so just a couple opening remarks and we'll dive deeper into the conversation. But um, at ECNL, we really see stakeholder engagement as a cross-cutting and necessary component of any kind of policy making at the national, regional, and global levels. And we really um, see it as a collaborative process. So it's not um, just a one-time mechanism where we hear f someone speak, but it's an iterative process where folks have different um, ways to intervene depending on where they are, what their capacity is, what their resources are, and fundamentally that they can meaningfully influence the, um, the process. And that's like something that's hard to quantify for now. Um, it's one thing to listen. It's another thing to actually have our voices heard and implemented. Um, and of course, the, you know, in terms of beyond IGF, just policy making and regulatory mechanisms in particular, lie within the state. So decision making is um, member state or governments. Um, but I think there's there's more evidence um, that should be, or evidence uh, based research that should be done to really see how much of these consultations are impactful. Um, there's something also like stakeholder fatigue where we have lots of consultations. And to be clear, ECNL always pushes for multi-stakeholder participation, and we are deeply concerned also about um, the future of IGF in particular, um, in including where IGF 2024 may be, um, for those who have heard. But um, uh, all this to say that um, it, it's not enough to just have multi-stakeholder. It has to be properly resourced 
including not only financial participation, but also trainings, especially for organizations that aren't digital rights organizations so that they can meaningfully participate. And I'm thinking especially here, marginalized groups like feminist groups, qu queer, um, um, race, uh, racial justice, immigration, refugee groups, so that their vo voices can also be heard in a way that is meaningful. And um, fundamentally, there is an asymmetry of power between stakeholders beyond the resource and financial access. Um, I don't think it's a secret that there's no level playing field between civil society, private sector, states. Um, and within these sector, these sectors are not a monolith either. So there is no such thing as one singular civil society or one private sector. There's obviously a regional disparity. Um, I'm very privileged to work for a European-based organization living in San Francisco. So I can f pay my way to come to Japan. I don't even need a visa of a US and EU citizenship. So pretty much open to the entire world in terms of travel. That's not the same for most of my, my colleagues. I'm also generally much safer. Um, that's not the case for a lot of activists and human rights defenders around the world. So having in place mechanisms that enable safe participation is just as important as enabling participation in and of itself. And um, I will just end here. I know the rest of cons um, the conference, ah, the rest of the session will continue on these topics. That stakeholder engagement comes hand in hand with transparency. And that means that while closed door meetings are important and often necessary, there also needs to be public, um, transparent information about where to participate, how, what has been discussed, what are the outcomes of it to enable true accountability. Thank you. Thank you, Merlin. I will certainly hear you on the um, running uh, marathons on sprint muscles, you know. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so, uh, we do face the same uh, issues uh, where the engagement of civil society in international fora is a long term engagement, long term work, often decades. Uh, so, the proper mechanism, not only on the sides of um, international organizations, need to be in place, but systematically within the civil society organizations and within the funding scheme as well. Um, now, you mentioned also being from the Global North uh, organization and having certain privileges. I would like to turn to Victor from the Global South part and to tell us more about what challenges are faced in the Global South and the civil society organizations participation. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, from uh, Kicktonet, which is um, you know think tank based in Nairobi, uh, we seek to promote uh, the multi-stakeholder approach um, in the work that we do, and uh, to ensure that you know uh, outcomes are actually meaningful for communities at the local level. Um, we believe that the multi-stakeholder model is important, uh, not just. Um, in, um, in 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 governance, but also in IG governance, and some of the lessons that we've had from the internet space, we are trying to now um, <coughs> replicate in other policy making forums. Just for example, in Kenya, we have the um, uh, constitutional provision on public participation, which requires government bodies to consult the public whenever they're making public policy um, decisions, which is useful uh, for us, but it's not there in all the countries that, uh, you know, we are working in environments where, um, you know, the relationship between civil society and government is not always good, which uh, can affect, um, you know, the, um, the feedback or the responses to civil society proposals because civil society has sometimes been labeled as noisemakers, and therefore when you present views, you're just those noisemakers. So y in as much as um, you know, we have uh, the challenges at the local level, I think it is more difficult in um, global processes where you have the burden of getting the air ticket and the visa, and all those many kilometers that you have to travel to make your point which um, sometimes is not the case for Global North organizations. Um, the, um, for, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, where we come from, 
um, the challenges of financing and uh, the cost um, is, is, is a challenge to, uh, you know, is a barrier to access. Um, issues around the technical capacity. We are aware that many organizations, uh, at least the internet reach hasn't been much, and mainstream organizations had not focused a lot on digital rights or internet governance issues. And um, as a result, you have very few organizations that are working in the internet governance space, and um, they, they, they cannot solve all the problems in as much as the problems are well known. So you have few organizations which not, they're not always uh, adequately resourced to with the capacity, whether it is human or financial or technical, to respond to all the challenges or emerging challenges in the region. And so only you're able to perhaps uh, take, um, I don't know, um, deal with, the, um, what is it called, the, the ice, <laughs> the, the tip of the iceberg, right? So maybe that's what they're able to deal with, but the bigger problem sometimes uh, remain unaddressed, yet we have an increasing population that is getting online uh, across the continents, and that means that uh, we need to be able to get more people on board to speak up uh, for all these new communities that are joining. Um, a new challenge is that you know previously the int it was easy to have multi-stakeholder for internet because there weren't so many users. So now everybody uses. So who is the stakeholder? Who should be in and who should be out? And how can we bring these uh, conversations to everybody? Because everybody with an email account is, is a stakeholder, right? So getting people to actually recognize that they do have a voice and they should be able to speak up and engage, um, I think that realization has not um, uh, come for many people because then of of these uh, uh, barriers. And I think the other aspect is that, um, you know, for local organizations, you have very, very unique context which you're working in and different realities from those of the global south. And um, these perspectives sometimes are not always, um, you know, it's not always possible to have them articulated in the spaces where the decisions are being made. Um, for example, I've participated in uh, OEWG sessions and um, other sessions where um, you know you ha you are in the room but you don't get to speak, uh, or <laughs> you're in the room but you are allocated only three minutes to say what uh, you need to say, and that's n not always enough. Um, we are grateful for hybrid participation because it's a, it has really opened up um, the space for participation, but not everybody is uh, aware of the situation, and I think. Sometimes organizations in our countries are dealing with other problems like internet connectivity. So most of the time they're looking down, trying to connect rural communities and trying to deal with the digital rights challenges at the local level that they forget the big picture that actually there are global and regional processes that they need to pay attention to. So you end up dealing with home solutions or home problems. And when you hear that decisions are being made, you you're like, but how how am I supposed to get there and get my voice heard? So that um, challenge of the disconnect uh, between the local work and the regional and global processes, and even just being able to to deploy resources to keep up with the number of initiatives that are that are ongoing at the same time. You know, even for some people, you speak to them on the corridors here, and you know the confusion. Which session? Uh, you know, you're one representative. And there are how many meetings at IGF, and you are the one person who's come and you want to make an impact. So uh, you may not have the capacity to attend, uh, you know, or figure out where to make the most impact. So, and of course, that's a resourcing or something challenge. Of course, now people can participate virtually, but there's that mountain that um, uh, global processes, original processes seem like a big mountain uh, to overcome. But I think um, not to paint uh, all gloom picture. The situation has really changed from 10 years ago. We now have more people, we have more voices, and we have quite a number of local initiatives and organizations that are actually working on internet governance spaces. Um, just to give an example, Kicktanet, we have been running a Kenya School of Internet Governance 
for the past six years, and we have trained almost 500 people on internet governance, and that's only in Kenya. And we hope that with more people knowing what is happening, then they can be able to make at least a chip on that iceberg uh, to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. There is a lot of points I could reflect on, but um, from the position of Diplo Foundation, that is something we see. And the main three main issues we see is uh, the fragmentation of forums where the internet governance is discussed. It's more and more. Also forums which where the internet governance is discussed are going into more detailed discussions requiring more resources, both uh, on capacity, both on civil society organizations and governments, because when we work with small and developing states, they just say, like, I don't have the capacity to go in and speak every other week somewhere on this. Uh, so we, we definitely hear that. Another point is the lack of capacity, of understanding of human rights impact, of technological development, of standardization, and um, of course civil society is also the technical community. On that side, it is from the other side. It is from the side of the human rights implications where the understanding of technology is there, but the implications uh, of what that technology wanted its lounge can affect is, is sometimes not there. So we, we do have this gap we're trying to bridge and that is with capacity building, that is with outreach and advocacy and basically creating networks of civil society organizations in the global south and connecting them to global north organizations which could support them and, and uh, help help each other basically because global north organizations also do not you know possess all the knowledge in the world and bring those uh, issues which are not currently at the internet governance uh, forums but are on a regional or local level related for example to indigenous groups to to women's rights to certain cultural or language aspects of uh, internet governance to the global level so with that what can we do? <laughs> uh, w we all agree it's beneficial to have civil society at the table. We all agree there are challenges to that. And what can we do? So Peter, if you could uh, maybe uh, expand on that and uh, explain to us where the uh, European Commission stands. Thank you, thanks very much. Uh, <coughs> again, I think I'm not sure that I'm the best to, uh, to, to respond to that, but I'll, I'll give some, some thoughts. So I think actually that quite a few things have already been said, so I, I might be re repeating a few things. Uh, but OK, how can we make sure that there, there, that there is more participation of civil society when if, if indeed that is needed? I think the first thing is that, um, well, not the first, but one of the main things is that the capacity has to be there. I mean, to participate in the discussion, um, you have to have the, the, the know-how to participate. Um, or I'll say it differently, if you want to participate meaningfully, because indeed we can all participate, but to participate meaningfully you might um, need to have a little bit more knowledge on certain topics. doesn't mean we have to become ICT specialists, far from that. Actually, not at all, but we need to know um, the broader implications, where does it fit in society, in the processes, what are the political implications, who do we need to contact to have an impact, and all these things. So I think it's it's about capacity. Um, efforts are being done uh, at all levels, but you know it's simply the the scene is moving so fast that we're probably uh, running a little bit behind, especially maybe with the last few years. I'm just guessing, but I think maybe also with the COVID situation, the shift from society to move online has been quite dramatic. So and uh, this has maybe increased the world's uh, attention to, this, um, to these issues. And so to deal with this more adequately, you know, your, this capacity has to follow. So I think it's the first thing. I, I hope I'm responding part of the question. <laughs> Second is then, of course, apart from the know-how, even if you have the know-how, and it was mentioned here, then there's still the question of resources. Now you can follow hybrid, uh, or you can participate. We can do so many things uh, thanks to digital technology. Nevertheless, um, even if you don't travel, you need resources. You need people dedicated to, to the work. 
uh, but even and then if you want to participate of course to to events uh, you need other resources maybe to come back to um, one of the elements in this project um, that um, will start um, soon is that the idea is to participate that CSOs have a meaningful participation at IGF but also at other fora such as um, fora of organizations if I can say yeah, such as IETF uh, ICANN ITU well to to meaningfully participate in ITU working groups uh, it takes time uh, and so you need resources for that uh, simple at the moment it's companies and states backed I think mainly yeah, mainly operations that that are able to do that and therefore influence same for standard setting and so on <coughs> if you don't have the, the resources financially also then then this is difficult so we try to with this project but there's many others ways other ways maybe to to partially respond to that um, and then maybe to to also underline uh, how come that maybe the voices were insufficiently heard. Just maybe reiterate that uh, maybe there has been an um, um, acceleration of events in the last couple of years because of COVID, <coughs> but also simply because the ado adoption of technology. We've spoken also about connectivity, access. But then, of course, there's the new technologies. A AI is now the hot topic. <coughs> maybe another day it will be something else. Um, I mean, it's a hot topic, but it's fundamental. Huh? I mean, I'm not um, <laughs> diminu uh, diminishing it. But uh, to, to be able to participate also in the discussions of AI, okay, and the big principles, I think everybody can do that. But to have a, to really be on, on top of it, uh, again, um, you need to be able to invest in those uh, topics. Um, thank you. Now I, uh, I heard, and part of the project is, uh, is um, basically the involvement of civil society in different standardization for, as you mentioned. So ITU, ICANN, IETF, and as we all know in this room, not all of them are equal. Some of them are more open to civil society participation and um, transparent and have human rights uh, principles set in place for standard setting. Um, ITU and ITUT is, is uh, another one where the civil society, when the door is closed, they go through the window, basically, and become part of the government delegations and find different ways to, to get into one mm, example is Consumers International, who do it through the consumers' rights. Um, so there are ways to get engaged. It's not an easy one, I would say, but there are ways to get engaged in the ways that once you have the capacity to understand where the connections are, how, how to advocate for certain human rights and human-centric values. Um, but let me t turn to Marlena to explain to us more o on this uh, from the advocacy perspective again. Thank you. Sure, thanks. Um, so at ECNL, we participate in some of the standardization processes, mostly on AI, which is what my team focuses on. And um, like Peter said, it, it can be highly technical. So talking about things at the um, high level standard, at uh, high level principle level, such as um, transparency, participation, that is easier. But then, you know, what does tr transpa transparency mean in practice? What do we want to be transparent on? And we talk about the standards, um, it becomes much more technical, and that's something that we've seen as a struggle, especially to get more um, orgs involved. So m my team has expertise on these issues, but it really is a small group of people. And by small, for example, at the EU level, we're talking about like 10, um, comparing to hundreds, um, if not thousands, of representatives from the private sector, for example. So even you can, you know, you can see there quantitatively the difference. Um, in numbers and AI, for example, as you mentioned, Peter is a hot topic now. Um, I we started working on it um, in 2020, and I've been focusing on it since 2017. For a long time, it was incredibly niche, so even more close to civil society, and it was a handful. And I literally mean a handful of people working on it. And this year, probably with ChatGPT, um, that's my <laughs> um, un non empirically tested theory. Um, it has become a big topic on the policy level, right? So um, I don't know if anybody was here at UNGA in New York. AI was the topic uh, focus for everything. And, you know, UNGA is not even digital focused. So how do we ride these 
waves of hotness to <laughs> take your uh, piggyback on your hot word, Peter, um, while at the same time having meaningful participation is a struggle. So um, specifically at ECNL, we participate in the ISO standard 42005 on impact assessment of AI systems. So you can hear already that here, um, how nerdy that sounds. Um, and when we have expertise in human rights impact assessments, which I think is a more broadly shared um, expertise among civil society, but still highly technical. Um, those working on the UNGPs, for example, should participate more. We're, we're also part of the uh, IEEE, which I don't even know what it stands for, International Electronic something. <laughs> um, I can Google it. On AI risk management, um, subgroup on organizational governance. Um, so all of this is you know, very technical as well at the EU. We, there's the SEN Senelec, which is the standardization bodies, and actually um, we managed to um, um, we managed to get the European Commission to let me get this right mandate that the SEN Senelec includes civil society, and actually um, they have allocated resources. So SEN Senelec, the standardization bodies, have allocated resources to include external stakeholders, and yet they still don't do it. Um, so even when they are required to do so by the commission and when they get funds, they're still very reticent. And when it actually does happen, it's really, really hard to participate. Right now, to give you an example, it's mostly ECNL, Article 19, and Center for Democracy and Technology um, that participates in a handful of academics. So it, it's, really, um, it's really a closed space. And when it, per, when, when I'd say, honestly, pretends to be open, it's not, even though they, um, if people have the best intentions. And um, I'd say one positive case study that I've seen is in the US NIST, National Institute for Standardization, Standards and Technology, I think. Um, they have been very inclusive in um, engaging some stakeholders in the risk assessment framework um, and also have made it more a little bit more welcoming. But again, you still see a disproportionate participation of not only digital rights orgs, but those uh, with expertise on AI specifically. So um, there's always this push and pull between inclusiveness versus needed expertise. In the DCNL, we really try to, um, to train other CSOs, both digital rights and non-digital rights on these issues. If anyone here in this room is interested, check out our learning center. So shameless plug for <laughs> ECNL Learning Center on Google, where we have a couple, um, like basically courses specifically for CSOs um, on AI with some specific things like surveillance technology or platforms um, so that you can participate a little bit more. And this is just the technical expertise in addition to obviously the challenges of um, visa and funding and everything I mentioned before. Thank you, Marlena. I'm happy there's also some positive <laughs> examples because it, it did for a while sound like doom and gloom here. Um, we do not have any questions online, but if there are any questions in the room, please feel free. Uh, we'll also have a Q&A se session uh, at the end of, 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 of this uh, block of questions. Um, I, I see a lot of familiar faces, so please don't be shy to come to the microphone. I know it's a little scary to go in the middle of the room sometimes and ask a question, but uh, feel free to also share your experiences if you have any with, with these processes and how they relate. Um, any takers so far? Okay. It's a bit tall for me, sorry. Hi, my name's Don. I'm with Article 19's uh, Global Digital Program. We've uh, worked to support civil society organizations and individuals, primarily from the global south, to participate in technical standards setting bodies. So like everything you've said like really resonates. Um, just also, also what we've found has been useful when we're working with civil society organizations is being able to identify their priorities and then aligning it with what would be useful within technical standards bodies because we recognize, as you said, it's like a whole fragmented um, landscape. And even within, within standards developing organizations, there are just dozens and dozens of working groups and study groups within each one. And it can be quite overwhelming for um, organizations to jump into, say, like the IETF and work out which of the 36 meetings they should be attending, like you said. 
Um, so we've actually been working to develop engagement strategies, so being able to support them. Um, and we take on a lot of the, um, we institutionalize a lot of the support structures. So like in terms of the financial capacity, in terms of like working on the visa processes, like we kind of take care of that. So that organizations and individuals from the global south don't need to necessarily have to like put in time and effort to focus on that, but rather scope out the work, be able to understand the concepts that are being brought up. Um, and then we've also done a lot of one-on-one -on -one mentorship and engagement because we also recognize that these standards bodies have a monoculture. It's a very like technical space, but it's also very like e Europe and US dominant. And so being able to have someone to go with you to these meetings um, really helps because I think after these meetings, a lot of the times people are often processing what they've learned, what they've heard. Um, and so being able to have like someone to be able to bounce ideas and thoughts with um, post this. So it was just, some, just sharing some of our experience. Thank you, that resonates very well with, uh, with the project we're about to start, where it, there, there was a big study done by, by one of the partners for us, which found that um, specialist standardization bodies are male-dominated, white-dominated, English-speaking, uh, inaccessible to any type of variety of opinions. Uh, uh, by design, uh, so the the that's why we're talking about the running the marathon, that um, it it needs to be slowly chipped off and and introduced uh, the different opinions from presented by the civil society organizations. Um, you also mentioned, and I know Victor spoke about it, the participation uh, from the global south organizations and how we can help them. Um, Part of what we will be doing is um, there's a three-prong approach. This part is capacity building. Diplo will be responsible for. Um, one part is advocacy and bringing in grassroots opinions and networking between the uh, civil society organizations, um, but also helping those who are ready to do so in engaging w with these forums, in engaging uh, through guidance on on uh, and on how to write a briefing for example how do you go in and and present it what is the best strategy of in being involved in these processes to achieve the goals of your organization um, with that i would like to turn back to victor maybe and ask you about um, if you could elaborate a little bit of the benefits of building partnerships between the organizations both global north and global south and global south global south civil society organizations? I think there the are various uh, advantages to this uh, collaboration. I think first is it addresses the, the, the problem of uh, the lack of linkages that uh, existed with, with, you know, across the various digital rights organizations. We realize that coalition building is very important and collaborative approaches are equal, even more important because we are working to solve the same problem or similar problems, if at all. So having that alignment um, that um, you know, we are able to share our concerns collectively and figure out what are some of the, the, the key emerging themes that we want to address, I think that's, that's, a, that's, that's an important win. Um, the second is that um, it takes advantage of you know, the competencies of, of both organizations. If, for example, um, there is an event in, um, in um, you know, Geneva where one of the Global North organization is based, it's easier for them to cross the road and uh, present uh, the views or ask for a meeting uh, than it is for me from to come from Nairobi to get visa and you know, struggle through trams to make the point. So that scaling uh, becomes easy because uh, of physical presence and uh, understanding also the local dynamics. The Global North organizations which work closely, whether it is at the UN in New York or EU in Brussels, they have built relationships with the various uh, policy makers in those various offices. And therefore, when uh, we come there, it's easy to, you know, this is the person to talk to. Don't <laughs> go around. Or the office is on fifth floor, room number five. Simple things such as that make a big difference because when you arrive uh, 
at the UN, it is a big uh, space and having someone who has that local understanding really helps. Um, the other is that it also helps in terms of uh, capacity building and uh, knowledge exchange between the two organizations. Global North organizations may not understand perfectly 100% the context in uh, Global South countries. And so this discussion help in terms of sharing knowledge and exchanging ideas like what works for us and what works for you and how then can we build on this. Uh, we're able to um, you know, present um, you know, sometimes um, access to our government officials is usually difficult uh, at the national level uh, because you, know, you can't access a minister uh, easily. But sometimes if you're able to participate in a global forum, then you're able to meet the, the delegation there and still be able to articulate the issues. So um, there's, a, there's the benefit of um, learning from the organizations that have done it before in terms of even knowing what to say and how to say it and maximizing that two minutes that perhaps you will have with that person before they dash into the next meeting and say these are the three things that we need you to do and also leveraging on the other partnerships that you know we know within the uh, global circles there are influential governments and so on and all these alignments and the mapping the power mapping that perhaps that skill the global north organizations have already done and have understood who the power brokers are uh, i can have my three issues and know who to tell them to as opposed to going there and wondering where to start from 200 member states you know so that uh, beneficial um, partnership is very useful it's an uh, advantage and of course uh, more importantly the resources uh, they are able to uh, leverage um, the technical resources in terms of skill um, for example some of this the ITF the IE they're very technical and global south organizations we might not have a technical person like an ICT person because now it is becoming uh, an, an important component that a human rights organization is not just lawyers, you must have the techies there and you must <laughs> have the engineers and you know so on because some of the issues, I remember once one a government official told me we are discussing spectrum and I'm going there, I'm saying yes we want to hear about human rights concerns with this spectrum and I'm like okay so who do I <laughs> bring to <laughs> say these things and to break down what spectrum actually means um, for the ordinary citizen on the street. So leveraging on a partnership, we were able to get uh, engineers who've done it before and have best practice that then they could be able to review the submission that we were doing and give some perspective. So there are some uh, unique benefits to those alliances. And if we're able to build um, strong coalitions between Global South organizations and also with Global North organizations, because I think there is a certain power that we can have when we work collaboratively. And I think lastly is um, um, for funders, because we, we have, there's a significant problem uh, when we have different funders who are funding different things and you know, it's all disjointed and fragmented and they're supporting the same organizations who are competing for the same basket of funds to do the same problem, to attack the same problem and so, when they are not coordinated, it is also creating problems for civil society organizations in terms of coordination because, uh, you know, we are competing for the same EU grant. Uh, so do I partner with you or do I partner or do I go solo? And does collaborating affect opportunities? And are the, f are the donors, um, you know, goals aligned with the specific needs of people to help organizations collaborate? And I think it is important that funders appreciate the dynamics of Global South organizations and the impact of uh, the funding and how they model those funds in terms of the ease of access and how they can help build and uh, strengthen uh, civil society in the Global South to actually make a strong impact. Thank you, Victor. And I'm having a stereo here, one side Teresa and the other side Marlena, who want to both chip in <laughs> on the what you said. So, Teresa, you start and then I'll give word to Marlena. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, no, I think what you raised uh, is very, very important, Victor, because um, 
Mm. There is a problem, and I, I will comment a little bit on on the on the donor experience. Yes, because uh, you're you're very right. You know that um, first of all, like for civil society organizations to be able to be involved in some of the policy fora, it has to be a deliverable in a project. You know, because otherwise, yeah, no no way <laughs> how to make it work. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, among donors, there might not be kind of sufficient um, the coordination of the priorities, you know, uh, in this uh, in this sense. So, uh, uh, if I can also encourage donors, you know, who um, are interested in uh, more meaningful participation of civil society in, in various uh, various policy policy fora, like you have probably identified already, um, uh, it's really important also to talk to other donors and to uh, and to try to. Uh, not overwhelm also uh, civil society organizations with each donors coming with a specific narrow vision, uh, you know, project uh, perspective. Uh, it could be ultimately more impactful uh, if uh, if this is done. While I'm aware that it's not uh, it's not an easy and intuitive uh, intuitive task. Another point that uh, I would like to elaborate on super quickly is what you, Marlena, actually raised, uh, and that sometimes uh, this bad habit of like tick the box uh, approach of like consulting civil society you you also mentioned it actually in your in your intervention it's actually tough to consult civil society because the civil society is not like okay i i have consulted civil society no it's uh, it's so many various organizations with various agendas uh, various um, uh, various objectives so uh, it's uh, certainly not easy but on the other hand uh, we are sometimes sliding or experiencing this tick the box like you know there is some pro forma consultation that not necessarily leads to anything, but you can you can say that you've done it, yes. And yeah, let's be honest: some policy fora are more prone to this uh, than uh, uh, than uh, than others. So yeah, I, I don't have a solution, uh, but um, just raising uh, the voice of the civil society more and having having donors that uh, that have realized and identify uh, this issue is a, is a strong start. Uh, thanks. Um, and following up on Victor's intervention, I wanted to bring another perspective also from um, a Global North organization that the corporation, cooperation and collaboration between Global North and Global South or majority based orgs isn't only like or, and definitely should not take this like white saviorist approach um, where we uplift global majority based orgs. But also, there's a lot to learn for Global North orgs. Um, there's so much resistance in many countries outside the US and Europe with really creative advocacy strategies. Um, and I and my team learn constantly. And I think the, the global coalitions are inherently better when there are diverse perspectives as well. And it can be pretty easy to, to become complacent or even lazy to some extent when you live in the US or Western Europe, you forget many of the fundamental issues of organizing um, and, and influencing policymakers. So that's something um, to remember. And another aspect is that a lot of the interna uh, international governance mechanisms, um, even like UNESCO recommendations, for example, rarely, uh, actually, I, I will not offend UN people here, but they don't have as much influence in the EU and US. However, they do have a disproportionate impact on national regulation in um, the global majority. So for example, UNESCO guidelines for digital platforms are often portrayed to be a Digital Services Act or DSA-esque version of the EU. There's also the recommendations on ethical AI. Um, the EU has its AI Act, so there's reg binding regulation in the EU. The U.S. is, you know, a bipartisan politics aside, also has its own regulation. However, a lot of the um, the recommendations from these um, these entities, including then like UN Angaroid CHR, really can influence and often are weaponized to um, enforce problematic regulation at the national level around the world. So that's something to consider when we have these coalitions. Um, and then fundamentally, I mentioned before that civil society is not a monolith. The global majority is definitely not one either. It's multiple regions. The regions themselves are not homogenous and um, even in terms of languages. 
if one individual country, India has, I don't even know how many languages, 60, how many? 27, okay, I thought it was more than that. Um, official, yeah, so plus the dialects, right? So um, differences between, with um, differences of languages, um, social norms, economies, um, between and within countries. So that's something to consider, and I'll give an example, um, um, which is something that ha uh, we've been working on with Access Now, uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation, and a lot of other organizations, including, I think, Article 19, on um, the SA Human Rights Alliance, which is involving global majority-based orgs and the implementation of the DSA, which is the leading um, EU regulation on digital platforms. And what we're trying to do with Diplo um, and the orgs that presented here is really to bring in um, learnings from that experience um, and others into um, international, governan international governance of uh, the internet. Thank you, Marlena. And uh, we have questions in the room, so Jovan, please start, and then the lady in the blue dress. Uh, both. You go. After you. <laughs> You're going after okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, you're next. Okay. Uh, ju just one building on what, what Victor said, what we can call power of triviality. We very often think, uh, discuss big system, but sometimes to navigate the UN corridors in Geneva, New York, or knock on the office. Or I remember still when uh, we had the program for the colleagues, students from the developing countries, even where you leave the jacket during the winter, or what do you do? I mean, it sounds completely trivial, but it impacts the feeling of being part of the process. And I will bring you a few examples that we have been recently focusing on. PDF is dominant format of the UN, European Union, and other actors. With PDF, you cannot do a lot if you want to interact, if you want to display it nicely. We took the European AI Act, and we were in Brussels discussing with different negotiators. If you try to consult European EU Act draft, which is now negotiated between Commission, uh, Council, and Parliament, you simply, uh, you're lost. On the very trivial level, not on knowledge of AI, but on displaying three columns, four columns, one PDF, 300 pages. The, what we did, uh, we basically organized it in the simple way that you at least can read it and then have, obviously, expertise to analyze and to have a context. The similar applies for the UN Secretary General policy briefs. If you read these policy briefs and you can consult on Digital Watch, they're d done by designer who wanted to have nice printed publication. And this is the mindset, you can see the mindset. I said, who is going to, maybe a meeting like AGF, you, they will distribute, have a nice publication, as we are doing, all of us, you know. But in reality, people will consult it online, or they're mobile. Therefore, uh, this power of triviality, which ultimately shapes people's participation, is a big thing. And we plan during, uh, in this project, to focus on these things. And one of the elements is the reporting from the IGF. You have here the paper. This session will be reported by mix of AI and experts. You have yesterday's sessions with main points. And why is this important for the civil society? It is important because you simply have a limited resources to navigate such a flow of information and sessions in Kyoto, but also last 18 or 19 years. And frankly, some issues, digital divide, were basically rehearsed every year and you have the more or less similar, similar narratives. Therefore, this is again one small thing. If small NGO, we had discussion two days ago from Brazil with two or three persons, wants to know exactly what is about child protection discussed during the IGF. Not necessarily AI, not necessarily other issues. They should have the access. And it's not as easy as it looks. Therefore, we are trying uh, with, uh, with this reporting, you can consult it, to use a mix of AI, deploy AI system, and our experts, mainly to bring to the help with the small uh, developing countries, who are the, our main uh, sort of, to, to bring them substantively in discussion, but also small civil society and marginalized groups. Therefore, those are a few points we write, which I invite all of us here to reflect on this uh, power of triviality, and there are tools, 
and also to create a space, uh, I call it AI hallucination of human hallucination, to think, I won't go too far with the way how to hallucinate, but to create a space for a bit of alternative thinking. My criticism of all actors, and mea culpa, is that we sometimes become domesticated in global fora. We basically start integrating thinking of the IGF governments, which is very human. You interact and you basically develop the thinking. And the time which we are facing, you open Al Jazeera, CNN, news, and you see the world is not in the best shape. And we need alternative thinkings, and we need the uh, creative inputs. And I think this is the role for civil society and academia where they are not contributing. I'm sorry to say, but we are not contributing uh, to this. Therefore, those are just a few points which uh, um, influence Diplo's approach, and we hope that together with the partners in this project, we'll try to do this power of triviality, making things accessible to people, and also trying to create a space where we can think a bit uh, out of the box for the benefit of the governments, uh, public, and uh, global public good. Well, should I ask some question? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. We'll have a lady in a blue dress and then the gentleman in a blue shirt and Mehwish and four questions coming up. Thank you for interesting um, thoughts from different perspectives and different, um, different experiences. And I'd like to ask you about, the uh, uh, about a question uh, regarding capacity building. Since I, I, I am Emmy from Japan, <laughs> working at a, um, a private company um, giving um, OSINT-related service, uh, giving more reliable information to mainly researchers, um, I think capaci capacity building is, cannot be made one day. But um, for, for example, since I'm familiar with climate change um, issues uh, uh, process, um, there were uh, uh, around the Paris Agreement, uh, there were a, a, a citizen assembly, citizen congress, uh, with uh, randomly sampled uh, citizens um, without any expertise um, discussing uh, the very important issue about climate change. And that didn't really solve all the problems, uh, but it moved forward um, somehow. So uh, how would you think about such process in uh, regarding this um, issue and also uh, the possibility or threats or uh, limitation of such, uh, what do you say, uh, citizen participation in, in uh, very, uh, local level, and I, I, I my, my uh, personal hope is to have such uh, congress in different um, areas, different parts of the world, and then they can make have capacity building and also participate in global level. And so I'd like to know the opinions. Thank you. Any takers? Nah. It should be me on capacity building, but Peter, go first. <laughs> I'll, I'll try, <coughs> but I, I'm, I'll, I will pass to you afterwards for sure. Well, first of all, thanks a lot. Um, shall I take, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to that and maybe give some feedback on other points. So, um, first of all, yeah, I, I, I don't know if this <laughs> is planned or has been done. I, I do think it's interesting. Uh, you make me think of, I think, what of the one of the speakers in one of the other panels recently said, I forgot her name, the, the Nobel uh, laureate, um, journalist um, who said that she had um, she hasn't done this, but she had interviewed, um, if I understand correctly, quite randomly a few hundred or a few thousand people, uh, and and she said, uh, if I correctly remember the the topic, randomly, like you say, uh, just citizens which are not experts, right, and that and and also have their impact. So, I mean, I think that's interesting. Okay, as part of the consultation process, I'm not an expert in all these consultation process, but I'm, 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 I think there can be space for that. I'm sure academics will have more to say about that. Um, I do know that in in the EU processes, when it comes to legislation, there are consultation processes, quite large ones, but maybe they're not so intimate. Uh, maybe they're like, uh, look, this is online, and you can uh, you can share your opinions. I know that on some of these 
um, consultations. We do have thousands, if not tens of thousands of inputs from society. Some of them are even indeed analyzed partially by AI because it's not possible to you know, read every one of them. Um, so I, th I think there's some interest for that. Now, I think um, specifically it's more to our partners in, you know, in the CSO organizations who might give a bit more. Yeah. Yes, so um, it makes me think of two things. One is the capacity building we're talking about is institutional capacity building. So when we uh, talk about increasing the engagement, it, it is in a way we're training people, but we are increasing the institutional capacity of civil society organization. Person may come, may go, but you need to have within the organization the knowledge, the expertise, whether technical or policy, to engage. And we have ways to do that. Well, I'm not going to go into that because we're running out of time in, in general. But going back on the consulting um, regular people on in the process and also Jovan's point on the basic triviality of things, I remember one example on accessibility where a blind person was able to access government's um, website going through accessible government website, going to get their ID. They went through everything and they got to the end and we're supposed to tick the boxes with the bicycles to prove that they're not a robot. And the person is like, it's a trivial thing which can be replaced by a small technical solution. But because that trivial thing is not in a forum and it's not addressed, it causes issues of accessibility on a wider scale to certain groups of, of uh, people. So it, it is a two-way two -way thing. Now the fora we're speaking about, the Internet Governance Fora, Standardization Fora, are way less um, open to, to uh, direct uh, engagement with the public or with uh, individuals. Um, in the environmental sector and uh, also in youth, and uh, rights of youth to, to their future, that, it, that is way more open uh, to do this. And also there was a uh, court case in Germany which established the right of youth to their future uh, in relation to the environmental rights. So the movement there is uh, a little bit different. I think the burning planet might have something to do with it. There's a little more urgency. But we do have three more questions in the room and I don't want to forget about them. So gentlemen in blue shirt, Oh, okay, and then over there. Uh, hi, Arjun Adrian D'Souza, uh, Legal Counsel at Software Freedom Law Center. I'm here with my colleague. Uh, just wondering, um, so we have spoken about uh, capacity building as well, and we are a civil society based out of New Delhi, India. So India presently is at an inflection point, a very opportune time also. Uh, we've had a Personal Data Protection Act which has been uh, enacted, it is yet to come into force, uh, and a Digital India Act which will regulate platforms. So the stakes are high. We are uh, going to be dealing with 1.4 billion people who will be regulated through these provisions. Uh, just as a civil society, we've seen the pushback that is there in terms of engagement. So my question is twofold. Firstly. Uh, in terms of putting forth a consolidated front on behalf of civil societies and think tanks. Uh, any strategies, any advice on that? And secondly, uh, to the gentleman's question also, any alternative uh, points of engaging with um, parliamentarians and government for the simple fact that uh, this may be a jurisdiction-specific issue to India, but the consultation process prior to the introduction of a bill is much more fruitful than the one that usually, uh, um, uh, pres uh, which comes for, uh, for, for after that. So just wanted your views on that. Anyone? Yeah. Victor, go, then I'll go. <laughs> yes, that's a very interesting. We face uh, similar situations uh, in Kenya with consultation. I think some of the strategies that have worked for us, uh, one is um, to build a relationship um, with uh, the legislators. I think it's important to have that relationship uh, with them uh, before you submit the view so that they know that there is this body and this is what you do. 
Um, I think the second is uh, usually to demonstrate the expertise that, that is being brought um, to the table. I know it's usually a higher standard for civil society organizations being placed, but I think demonstrating that you actually have value to add and you bring that value uh, will add some weight to the, to the um, comments that um, uh, you present. And I think the third is uh, you know, to work collaboratively with other civil society organizations. I think sometimes it helps when you have 20 sign-ons as opposed to one. And so identifying the common issues across the various groups is, is essential in as much as there could be uh, variances in terms of positions, but at least there should be some key things that um, everybody wants that you know fee or feel is important to articulate and coalesce around that. And I think lastly, just to say that um, be ready for you know the the marathon. So you know you need to go to the gym and work out. So have your arguments and counter arguments you know prime because you need to be ready for the views of the other stakeholders, you know, not everybody will agree with your positions. Just because you're civil society doesn't mean you're always right or that your position will be taken. So uh, it's important to build the, the watches in terms of understanding the arguments or potential arguments and other scenarios that the other stakeholders could bring forth. And the other push and pull factors that uh, and drivers, uh, you know, what is driving this and who is driving this and understanding um, that local contest, which you, which you probably do, and then it helps that when you get to the floor and the question is asked, you understand and you're able to anticipate and then have a very good response to um, to any scenario because at least you have prepared for it as opposed to just walking in and thinking that it's going to be a smooth ride. It, most of the time it's uh, not always, at least from our experience. Thank you. Peter, did you want to reflect on that? So I, I want to be, how should I say, a bit sensitive in uh, in what I say because, of course, your question is to CSOs, and uh, and, and <coughs> I'm I'm speaking in name of co commission. But maybe just to say that from experience in some other countries, um, we have had um, governments in other countries, including Kenya, for example, um, knocking on our door to discuss exactly this kind of topic, and um, in an open spirit where we have then engaged some of our experts, for example, our Director General Justice, um, to go into dialogue. And they even came on a, on a visit. And, and so uh, I think if, if there's a way of creating this trusted uh, relationship and, and this willingness for open dialogue, then of course it is, of course, difficult for you to create this. But I mean, if, if that can somehow be found, the right people or the right uh, entry, then um, maybe um, that's um, uh, helpful. And second, but here again, I want to be really careful that I don't give any wrong message, but you might also indeed knock on the door of ad other organizations that, that you think might have uh, the entry. And uh, it can be a, a national organization or an international organization that's locally present with an office and uh, that m might have better channels of access. And then through that way, maybe uh, open the dialogue. Um. Yes, we have the last question. And while you're going to the microphone, I'm just going to quickly reflect on the on the um, calls for common inputs by CSOs in different uh, processes. And I would like to maybe caution and um, say that there needs to be a balance between one input by several organizations and basically leaving the variety of uh, uh, opinions and variety of perspectives behind because you are eliminating certain aspects of that in, in the process. So that is something as a CSO you need to be aware of. W what is it that you are not presenting in a way when you are trying to make a certain different point stronger? So that, that is a balance exercise, at least in our opinion. Please go ahead. Hi, so this is less of a question and more of a comment that speaks to kind of everything we've discussed here, but uh, my name is Ariel McGeed. I work with Internews, and um, congratulations on your proposal. Uh, we actually also just won a very similar proposal um, from the Department of State working in South Asia, so I'll be 
implementing that as well and would love to kind of collaborate with you guys um, working on bringing our civil society organizations together but also to speak to your um, topic one of our parts of our activities are creating an online space where all of our civil society and human rights groups can kind of come together and work together around what they're learning um, and at the final we have bringing them to this, um, sessions such as IGF and really being able to advocate. Um, I had one other thought as well. But yeah, so speaking to how donors are not collaborating with each other, and so you have the EU, we have State Department, very similar projects, um, and obviously the work needs to be done everywhere, but would be great to kind of bring together inner news into the reflection as well. Yeah, absolutely, thank you, and I would love to talk to you in the corridor afterwards. Um, it is um, our intention within this project to actually harness what is already in place and what is going on to create a wider network of CSOs and um, kind of build up on each other and cross-pollinate whatever is in the space currently and whatever is going to be in the space in the future because we do believe that beyond the project itself that that is something we will be dedicating more and more time in the future as well. So, and with this, you can find us all individually if you want to talk more. But I believe we can we can close this session if that's okay with everybody. Or is there more questions? Oh, okay, sure. Go ahead. I just wanted to um, share something. Uh, just to build on what Victor and Marlena said, I come from SFLC India, and like you mentioned, that we have a lot of languages. I think the one problem that we face is um, with my legal team and my technology team, they come up with these brilliant blog posts or write-ups to you know, share information or create awareness. But sometimes the language is so complex that the people they're trying to make aware find it difficult. So one of the, yes, uh, one of the benefits of local partnerships is that um, you know, when I meet other um, CSOs for these kind of events, I realize that all of us are facing the same issue, especially from the comms and PR team. So yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, thank you for bringing that up because these kind of local partnerships help up, help you know bring issues to light that sometimes I think go unnoticed. So I just thank you. No, thank you, thank you for that point, and it's uh, another one. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, we do. We do have, I believe, still eight minutes to go, so we can go ahead. Perfect. I'm Camila. I'm from EDAC in Brazil. And Pavlina, you were mentioning that uh, beyond the substantial issues on how to participate on this space, we have formal rules to uh, to interact on this space. And this is so hard. We don't have a book on that. If you are in the UN, you have a way to interact. If you are in other spaces, you have other ways. So how can we... Uh, share more information about that. You were mentioning, for example, that we can make a workshop on how to make a briefing, uh, briefing on all these spaces, but how can we share this kind of knowledge? Thank you. No, and you're absolutely right about um, each of the processes, each of the open work, uh, open-ended working groups uh, uh, having a different way of engaging civil society. Uh, we have seen it, for example, on the open-ended working group on cyber, how from the first uh, session to the second one, uh, the temperature in the room changed and all of a sudden civil society is not automatically included in the conversation. So it is a challenge from the procedural side to see where are the ways to get engaged and that is part of what we will be doing in different fora. For, for example, within the standardization processes and. Marlena, I know you do a lot of work on there, so if you, if you feel later on uh, chiming in on that. Um, there are, as I mentioned, certain standardization bodies uh, which are more open to civil society participation uh, beyond, beyond the technical community. Um, they do have principles uh, in place, human rights principles and human-centric standard-making uh, processes in place. There are other ones which are not open. And there are certain ones which are just multilateral. And that is the world we live in. It would be very ideal to have one way uh, within, for example, UN or any other body to have um, this is how you, how you go ahead and uh, do it and put your input. Um, 
Another part to that is once you overcome that challenge of how you are going to participate, how are you going to put across your points, is whether those points are, as, as Teresa mentioned, are tick on the box mm -hmm. or they are taken seriously. And that is um, a question of building partnerships. At least in my opinion, it is a question of working in that space for a long time, knowing who does what, knowing uh, the trends, knowing what's coming up, where where is the place to be, and which forum you need to be strategically engaged to, to achieve your civil society goals. Um, so not an easy one, <laughs> definitely not. Marlena, but you did some work on that, so maybe some lessons learned. I mean, I was going to bring up your last point that unfortunately it's a lot of informal networks um, that we see, so you know, many of, I mean, many folks in this room um, I know, right? So that's both a good thing and a bad thing. Um, same people on panels, m generally bad. The, I'd say one good thing is that we do have tight networks between civil society, so we're able to, you know, text each other um, and, and have monthly meetups. Like, they're different. I think there's also a lot of uh, coalitions. <laughs> So it's hard to know um, who does what and like how to be coordinated um, and aligned. That's always um, always a struggle. I mean, a um, colleague from Internews mentioned that there's a similar initiative and we work very closely with Internews. We're even part of the global internet freedom, I think. Um, and we didn't even know about this, right? So, <laughs> um, so I think there's definitely, it, it's, it's incredibly difficult. Um, and also unfortunate because it can become a cool kids club of if you're in it, then you have, and uh, generally to be to have these connections, you already are privileged and well networked, and then it gives you an even bigger boost to actually be, um, to have the platform, right? So, um, so uh, yeah, I think it's our responsibility of the orgs that are in this room to actually bring in new voices. Um, something that I've been experimenting with is if I'm invited to a panel, I either decline and give my spot to someone else or I say yes under the condition that um, the other person comes. Um, I didn't do that at this panel. Um, apologies, <laughs> <laughs> or like apologies, are, you're welcome. Um, but yeah, so different, I think, yeah, bringing in more people, but unfortunately it is informal. And then, like you mentioned, uh, I forgot who mentioned, some of the orgs are better at um, inclusion than others. Um, the UN is, is really, really difficult. I do a lot of UN advocacy and I don't really understand it. <laughs> um, we have a UN advocacy um, officer at our organization that we're very lucky to have. Um, so he, he knows a lot on the procedural side. Um, and then he doesn't have the substantive expertise as much. And my team is the opposite. We know um, AI and human rights, but don't really know where to intervene or what, unless it's the very specific, like everybody knows IGF, right? But the, the smaller ones, it's hard to know. So sorry, it's not a satisfactory answer. Basically make friends, be social, <laughs> and share your contacts and your privilege. If I can quickly, just a story from earlier this morning, yes, on the kind of encouraging everybody to be more experimenting in panel compositions. I was on a panel and probably I had some calming effect on two other uh, ladies uh, speaking in the same panel and they were like, this is my first time doing a panel, this is going to be a disaster. And I told them, no, <laughs> first of all, it's not going to be a disaster, but you belong on this panel much more than, than I do, for instance. And um, by the way, they did great. Yes, <laughs> so so uh, don't be afraid uh, to experiment uh, when when you when you put panels together because um, yeah, it might uh, seem easier to go with people you know or you have worked before, but actually it might get much fresher uh, look um, if you if you get new new people. Thank you. And with this, there were three people on this panel I didn't know <laughs> so so far. <laughs> So only Teresa, so with this I will invite you to get to know each other and we'll close up. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.
Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're just starting out one last issue with Zoom, but I'm going to start off with this session. Um, welcome to the town hall um, that's called Protect People and Elections, Not Big Tech. Um, as an initial disclaimer, this town hall is being organized by Digital Action. Um, we are the conveners of the Global Coalition on Tech Justice. And this is a brand new movement um, that's discussing big tech accountability, how to safeguard elections, and trying to bring in a new conversation or improve the current ones about why should we care um, about elections and why should we make this conversation even closer to social media companies, right? Um, um, the Global Coalition for Tech Justice is a movement with over a hundred organizations and individuals from all over the world. Some of them are with me, actually all of them, a few of them are with me at this panel. Um, but we do have um, more and more organizations and academics joining um, this space to discuss um, some of the things that we um, are planning for today. And as um, for those of you that don't know Digital Action, um, we were founded in 2019 um, with the mission to protect democracy from digital threats. So um, this is gonna be a, a one of those heavy conversations, right, about how social media affects um, democracies and how the other way around works as well. Um, but our work has been um, evolving some work, some like, catalyzation of collective action, building bridges, and also ensuring those directly impacted by tech harms are those um, that are actually in power, are those the ones that we are listening to. The Global Coalition for Tech Justice and the Year of Democracy campaign has this general goal of bringing in the perspectives of the victims or of the places in which social media companies um, invest less or much less in, in, in the day-to-day -day lives. Um, so that's a little bit um, of what we want to do. I want to first bring in Alexandra Pardal. She's um, the Global Campaign's director at Digital Action, and then she's gonna open this panel for us and explain a little bit more about um, the Year of Democracy campaign and what we're all about. Alex, um, I think you're in the room, right? Yes, I am. Thank you, Bruna. Uh, and wonderful to, to be with you uh, here. So welcome to all our um, panelists and participants in Kyoto to get today and uh, those joining us from, from elsewhere remotely. Um, this is a global conversation on how to protect people and elections, not big tech. So I'm Alexandra Pardal from Digital Action, a globally connected movement building organization with a mission to protect democracy and rights from digital threats. In 2024, the year of democracy, more than 2 billion people will be entitled to vote as US presidential and European parliamentary elections converge with national polls in India, Indonesia, South Africa, Rwanda, Egypt, Mexico, and some 50 other countries. The largest mega cycle of elections we've seen in our lifetimes. But our information spaces and the ability to maintain the integrity of information and uphold the truth and a shared understanding of reality are more vulnerable than ever. From foreign and malign in influence in elections to the use of new tech like generative AI, making it easier for domestic or foreign actors to manipulate and lie, to financially motivated globally active disinfo industries, the threats have never been bigger nor more pervasive. Elections are flashpoints for online harms and their offline consequences. Now, over the past four years, Digital Action has collaborated with hundreds of organizations in every continent, supporting the monitoring of digital threats to elections in the EU and elsewhere, and led large civil society coalitions demanding a strong Digital Services Act in the EU and better policy against hate and extremism from social media companies globally. This experience has taught us that there's startling inequity between world regions when it comes to protections from harms, uh, from disinformation, uh, hate and incitement to manipulation of democratic processes. Uh, online platforms just aren't safe for most people. 
We know that the platforms run by the world's social media, media giants, Meta, Google, X, and TikTok, have the greatest global reach they've ever had and are at their most powerful. But safeguarding efforts have been weak to protect information integrity globally. For instance, Facebook says it's invested $13 billion in its platform safety and security since 2016, but internal documents show that in 2020, the company plowed 87% of its global budget for time spent on classifying false or misleading information into the U US, even though 90% of its users live elsewhere. This means there's a dearth of moderators with cultural and linguistic expertise where Facebook has been unable to effectively tackle disinformation at all times and most consequentially during elections where when disinformation uh, and other online harms peak. Similarly, non-English languages have been a stumbling block for automated content moderation on YouTube, Facebook or TikTok. Algorithms struggle to detect harmful posts in a number of languages in countries at risk of real world violence and in democratic decline or autocracy. What this means is that the, the risks on the horizon in 2024 are very serious indeed, at a time when social media companies are cutting costs, laying off staff and pulling back from their responsibilities to stem the flow of disinformation and protect the information space from bad actors. If some of the world's largest and most stable democracies, the United States, Brazil, have been rocked by bad actors mobilizing on social media platforms, spreading election disinfo and organizing violent assaults on the heart of their democracies, imagine next year where we'll see democracies under threat like India, Indonesia, Tunisia, alongside a whole swathe of countries that are unfree or at risk, where citizens hope to hold on to spaces to resist the manipulation of the truth for autocratic purposes. How can online platforms be made safe to uphold information and electoral integrity and protect people's rights? So the challenge of 2024's elections mega cycle is a calling to all of us to show up, ideate and innovate, bring our skills, talents and any power we have to the table and collaborate. As an example of what's in the works and background to the perspectives we're going to hear today, together with over 160 organizations now, experts and practitioners from across the world, we've convened the Global Coalition for Tech Justice to launch the 2024 Year of Democracy campaign in order to foster collective action, collaborations and coordination across election countries next year. Together with our members, the Global Coalition for Tech Justice will campaign, research, investigate and tell the stories of tech harm in global media, supporting and amplifying the efforts of those on the front lines and building policy solutions to address the global impacts of uh, social media companies. So we're going to be actively collaborating with stakeholders and this conversation today is, um, is an opportunity uh, to, to further these conversations and get collaborations off the ground with all those who um, share goals of safe online platforms for all. So I'm delighted to um, introduce this session uh, for this important global com conversation on how we protect 2024's mega cycle of elections from tech harms and ensure social media companies fulfill their responsibilities to make their products and platforms safe for all. So I'm really happy to hand back to Bruna to introduce our panelists and the discussion this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex, um, and welcome to the session as well. And as um, she just brought up, um, this is really a global conversation, right, that we want to do. We want to spark a discussion on how can we collectively ensure that big tech plays its part in protecting democracy and human rights in 2024 elections. It's not just one, it's 60 elections, as everybody has been talking about this week. So um, it's a rather key year for everyone. 
So um, we have two um, provocative questions, uh, kickoff questions for the panelists. Um, and I'm going to bring you, Ashna, into the conversation first. Um, Ashna is programs coordinator, right, for CIPESA. And um, the first question for you would be um, whether, s in like, if you consider that social media platforms and content moderation, or the lack of it, are shaping democratic elections, and if so, how? Thank you, Bruna. Uh, good evening, everyone, or good morning, like Alex said. I guess we're all in very different time zones at the moment. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Digital Action, and uh, the opportunity to have this very important discussion. Uh, once again, my name is Ashna Kalemera, and I work with CIPESA. CIPESA is the Collaboration on International ICT Policy for East and Southern Africa. We are based out of Kampala, Uganda, but work across um, Africa, promoting effective but inclusive technology policy, but also in its implementation as it intersects with governance, good governance, obviously, uh, human rights, uh, upholding human rights, uh, as well as uh, improved livelihoods. So um, I like to start off these conversations on very light notes. Uh, very often these panels are, are dense in terms of spelling doom and gloom. Um, so first, uh, I'd like to emphasize that technology broadly, uh, including social media platforms and the internet, uh, have huge potential for electro processes and systems. Uh, they are critical in ensuring that voter registration is complete and accurate, uh, enabling remote voting for excluded communities or remotely based uh, voters. Uh, they have been critical in supporting campaigns and canvassing, uh, as well as voter awareness and education. Uh, results transmission and tallying, <coughs> monitoring malpractice, all of them critical to electoral processes and uh, lending themselves to promoting legitimacy and inclusion uh, of elections in states that have democratic deficits, which for most of Africa is many of the states. So uh, I think that light note is very important to highlight uh, as we then go on to the doom and gloom that, we'll <laughs> that this conversation will likely take. Um, and now we start the doom and gloom. Uh, unfortunately, despite those opportunities, there are immense threats uh, that technology uh, poses for electoral processes in, in Africa, and I guess for much of the world. Um, increasingly, we're seeing states, the authoritarian governments especially, uh, leveraging the power of technology for self-serving interests. A uh, critical example there is network disruptions or shutdowns. I see Keep It On coalition members in the room, uh, and they work to push back on that excess. Uh, on disinformation and hate speech, uh, users, governments, the platforms themselves, as well as private companies, PR firms, um, are actively influencing narratives uh, during elections, undermining all the good stuff that I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, and very often we ask ourselves at CIPESA, and I imagine everybody in the room, why disinformation thrives, right? Because <laughs> pretty much everybody is aware of, of the challenge that it poses, but uh, in Africa especially it's thriving, and thriving to very worrying levels. Uh, one of them is again something positive. It's because technology is penetrating and penetrating very well on the continent. Uh, previously unconnected communities now have access to information at a click of a button, literally, which again, in the context of elections is great, but uh, in the case of disinformation, it's, it's a significant challenge. Secondly is the youth population on the continent, with many of them coming online via social media. Uh, there's always jokes uh, in sessions that uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I've attended where there's African representation that for many Africans, the internet is social media. And that uh, challenge is uh, enabling so, uh, disinfo and hate speech to thrive. Third is conflicts. Uh, the elections that we're talking about are happening in very challenging contexts uh, eth uh, that are characterized by ethnic, religious, and geopolitical conflicts. Again, all the, the, the nice stuff I mentioned earlier on is then cast with a really dark shadow. Like Alex mentioned, that context that I've just described is going to be a very significant stress test uh, come 2024 and beyond uh, for the continent. And we're likely to see uh, responses that undermine the potential of the technology to uphold electoral legitimacy, but also for citizens to realize their human rights. 
uh, one of those reactions we're likely to see from a state perspective is weaponization of laws uh, to undermine uh, voice or critical opinion online, which again uh, undermines uh, electoral processes and integrity. Uh, and unfortunately, given the context around conflicts, uh, we were likely to see uh, a lot of politically, sorry, uh, el fueling politically motivated violence, uh, which restricts access to credible information and ultimately perpetuates divides and hate speech and can lead to offline harms. Now, bringing the conversation back to big tech, uh, on the continent, unfortunately, we're seeing very limited collaboration uh, between tech actors and media and civil society uh, in, for instance, identifying, debunking, or pre-bunking, uh, depending on which, <laughs> which, <laughs> which fence side of the fence you sit, uh, and moderating disinformation. Uh, also, the processing and response times to reports and complaints are really slow, and this is discouraging reporting and ultimately uh, maximizing, in some cases, uh, circulation of disinformation and hate speech. Um, there are also significant challenges around the opaqueness in moderation measures. Uh, we've seen the case in Uganda during the previous elections where a huge number of, um, what's the word around the automated accounts, uh, were taken down uh, for otherwise not very clear reasons, and that uh, led to a, a response from the state, i.e. shutting down access to Facebook, which remains uh, inaccessible to date in Uganda. So. Uh, Given those pros and cons, and either side of the coins I've just described for the African continent, uh, it's important uh, to have collaborative actions and movements, just like what uh, Digital Action is spearheading and we're really honored to be a part of. Uh, and efforts in that regard should uh, focus on showing up and participating in consultation processes, just like this or others, where the opportunities to uh, challenge or provide feedback and comments, I think that's really important. Such spaces are not many. Um, we at CIPESA host the annual forum on internet freedom in Africa. We marked 10 years a couple of days ago. And uh, for the second time, we were able to have the Meta Oversight Board uh, present and able to engage. They admitted that uh, cases from the African continent are limited, but spaces like the forum on internet freedom in Africa that CIPESA hosts is providing that opportunity for users and other stakeholders uh, to deliberate on these issues. Uh, I cannot not say that research and documentation remains important. Of course, we're a research think tank and we're always churning out a lot of uh, pages and pages that are not necessarily always read, but I think it's important because evidence-driven advocacy is, is critical to this cause. Uh, skills building, again, digital literacy, fact-checking, and information verification, that, that remains uh, critical. But also leveraging norm, norm setting mechanisms and raising the visibility of big tech challenges uh, in new end processes, the Universal Periodic Review, the Africa Commission of Human and People's Rights. These conversations are not filtering up as much as they should do. So they should be uh, interventions that are focused on that. And interventions that, of course, promote and challenge uh, private sector to uphold uh, responsibilities and ethics through application of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Lastly, uh, is strategic litigation. I think that's also an opportunity uh, that's before us in terms of challenging the excesses that big tech uh, poses for elections in the challenging context that I've just described. Thank you. Thanks, Ashna. Thank you very much. Just speaking on two of the, the topics you spoke about, which is um, the weaponization of policy-making processes and politically motivated violence. I think that bridges very well with the recent scenario in Brazil, right? Um, with, unfortunately, the repetition or a yet another attack on a capital. And um, after the, a load, like a lot of discussions on a fake news draft bill and, and regulation for social media um, companies. Yasmin, I'm gonna bring you in um, now. Yasmin um, is from FGV Rio de Janeiro and also the co-coordinator of the DC on platform responsibility. Welcome. Thank you so much, Bruna. Uh, could you please display the slides? Thank you so much. So uh, addressing the first question that Bruna posed to us here, uh, are social media and platforms content moderation shaping democra democratic elections? I'm sorry. 
uh, to answer this, qu this question, I'd just like to give a brief context about the elections in Brazil, the, sorry, about the Brazilian legislative scenario regarding platform responsibilities. There are two main pieces of legislation that deal with content moderation issues. Specifically, uh, since 2014, we have the Brazilian Civil Rights uh, Framework, called aka Marco Civil da Internet, probably known by many of you here. Uh, it establishes our basic principles for internet governance, such as free speech, net neutrality, uh, protection of privacy and personal data, but also establishes liability regimes for platforms regarding UGC in its article 19 to 21. To sum up really quickly, uh, article 19 created a general regime in which platforms are only liable for illegal, con uh, illegal UGC content if they not comply with a judicial order asking for the removal of a specific content if it is uh, within the platform's capabilities to do so. There are only two exceptions to this rule, one for copyrights and one for non-authorized intimate imagery dissemination, for which a mere notification of the user or their legal representative is a uh, surface. The second one is the Code of Consumers Defense, aka CDC, which considers users as hyper-sufficient and vulnerable in their relations with enterprises. In its Article 14, CDC establishes an objective li liability regime, a restrictive, uh, strict liability regime, in which enterprises or service providers are responsible regardless of the existence of fault for repairing damages causes to consumers to due to the facts or insufficient or inadequate information about their risks. So, in this sense, these two pieces of legislation can give users many protections online regarding harmful activities and illegal content. Nevertheless, users are still unprotected of the many online harms that are not clearly illegal, such as disinformation, or that are not even perceived as uh, harm to them, like algorithm gatekeeping, shadow banning, micro-targeting of uh, problematic content. Regarding the first issue, given the non-existence of a legislation that deals specifically with coordinated disinformation, our electoral superior court has been enacting resolutions to set standards for political campaigns and else. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and else. Uh, so, also, the, the Electoral Superior Court established in the scope uh, of its fighting disinformation program uh, partnerships with the main platforms in Brazil, such as Meta, Twitter, TikTok, Y, WhatsApp, and Google, that sign official agreements uh, stating what their initiatives would be. In these documents, most of them committed with creating reporting channels, labeling content as electoral related, and redirecting users to the electoral court official website and promoting official sources. Instagram and Facebook also developed cute, cute stickers to support users to vote, in spite of voting being already mandatory in Brazil. Uh, nevertheless, we don't have enough data to see the real impacts of these measures. Just the generic data on how much content was removed in a given platform. Also, generic data on how they are complying with the legislation. This sort of data is offered to by the main platforms in Brazil since the establishment of partnership programs with fact-checking agencies in 2018. I'm not saying that they are not removing enough content. What I want to highlight here is that we don't have data or metrics to understand what these generic numbers means, nor do we have uh, knowledge on the content, if the content is being removed fast enough to not reach enough users. Furthermore, in fact, some of these efforts to combat falsehood on YouTube, for example, were themselves a risk for democracy and elections in 2022. By the official sources program, this is the, li the slide that is displayed right now, a hyper-partisan news media channel, Jovem Pan, was being actively recommended to YouTube users. To give an example, the election day, uh, Jovem Pan was disseminating a fake audio, allegedly from a famous Brazilian drug dealer, Marcos Camacho, aka Marcola, in which uh, he was supporting Lula's election. 
Justice Alexandre de Moraes from the Brazilian Federal Supreme Court, which was presiding the Superior Elector Court, ordered for the removal of the content, but not before it had already reached 1.70 million visualizations. Supporters also shared this video at least 30 in 30, 38 WhatsApp groups uh, and Telegram groups monitored by the fact-checking agency Auschwitz. So to Bruna's question, are social media and platforms content moderation shaping democratic elections? I tend to answer no, or at least not significantly, as either we have not significant <coughs> I'm sorry, data, or we have enough information on their actions and results. That's it, thank you. Thanks a lot, Jackie. I'm gonna bring it to Leah right now as well. Leah is representing Ipanitech, right? Um, and also a, a fellow Latin American, um, yet another region of the world that's facing a lot of those um, discussions, right? In terms of proper um, resources, deployment, and also um, policy making as well. So Leah, welcome to the panel. <coughs> Okay, perfect. Uh, well, uh, because Ipandetec is a digital rights organization based in Panama City, but working in all Central America. So I'm going to refer mainly to the recent electoral process in Guatemala and the next electoral process in Panama that will take place in May 2024. And the first thing is that I want to send all my support to the Guatemalan people where they are mobilizing in the streets because they are demanding democracy in their past elections in the country. In Central America, digital platforms make tools available to our electoral public entities because they they try to help them to verify the information and to avoid any violation of our digital rights, our fundamental rights as protests, freedom of expression, freedom of press, privacy. But con currently in countries such as Panama, my country, a digital media platform and a journalist were ordered to remove information from their platform by the Tribunal Electoral, is the Panamanian Electoral Public Entity. And, and they got a fine because they were posting information about Ricardo Martinelli Berrocal. I don't know if you know about Ricardo Martinelli. He's very famous. He's so famous as Lula and Bolsonaro in Brazil. Well, he was a former president of Panama and he's a candidate for the next elections in Panama because he wants to be president again. And by the way, he is the most violator of the privacy in the country. So the electoral uh, entity in Panama ordered these journalists to remove information about them because it's against the democracy and it's against their, uh, against their privacy, their uh, own image. So the question is, if big techs are given tools to our public enti electoral public entities to promote democracy, to promote access to information, to promote fundamental rights, why electoral entities put barriers to the citizens, to journalists, and to communicators who their main fulfill is legit legitimate the duty to inform, the duty to communicate to the citizen what is happening in the countries, and more in these cases of corruption because this former president is very corrupt. So freedom of expression, freedom of information, and freedom press are limiting in Panama when journalists try to communicate based on the principle of public interest that we have in knowing the good the bad of the ugly of our candidates in our electoral process. Digital platform must match their words because with their actions, 
because even though they don't have any autonomy in the country, in the decision of the, uh, the electoral branch, they should not become like part of the problem and limitate constitutional warrant guarantees such as freedom, freedom of <coughs> press. So mainly this is a very recent case that we are uh, follow in Panama and thank you so much Bruna for your space in this panel. Thanks so much Leah, um, very interesting that this kind of like, right, there's an ongoing line of major interferences with um, expression, with conversations online, and it's not just like one or, or two countries, but, it, but it's often the lack of, um, either sometimes it's the responsiveness, sometimes it's the ongoing conversation or the cooperation that um, social media platforms should have with authorities, that, and that should be interesting to be developing that. But there are also downsides to those um, partnerships w when it, like goes towards the the path of like further requests for data and access um that or even like privacy violations right so it is a it definitely a hard and deep conversation um i'm gonna go now to dan daniel arnaldo from ndi um then so welcome to the panel as well and same question as the others yes thank you thanks for having me uh thanks for everyone for being here and we're uh, really pleased to be a part of this uh this coalition um for those who don't know, uh, I'm from the National Democratic Institute. Um, we're a nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan, non-governmental organization that works in partnership with uh, with groups around the world to strengthen and safeguard democratic institutions, processes, and values to secure a better quality of life for all. Um, we work globally to observe elections, strengthen elections processes, and uh, my work particularly is to support a more democratic information space. Um, and in this work, we engage with platforms around the world, both through coalitions like this or others, such as the Global Network Initiative, the Design for Democracy Coalition. Uh, we help highlight issues for platforms. We uh, perform social media monitoring. We engage in consultations on various issues, ranging from online violence against women in politics to data access and crisis coordination. Um, I think as was mentioned, 2024 will be a massive year for democracy. And from our perspective, I think we're particularly concerned um, about contexts uh, we work in throughout the global majority and, and particularly small and medium-sized countries that do not receive the same attention in terms of content moderation, uh, policies, research tools and data access, and many other issues. Um, this is all in the context of, I think, what is a serious disinvestment in civic integrity, trust and safety, and, and related teams within these organizations. Um, so just in the region, I think you have Bangladesh, uh, Indonesia, India, Pakistan, and Taiwan that will all hold elections in the coming year. Um, I know there will be some resources devoted to larger countries, but um, on the other hand, they are massive user bases. and. Uh, the smaller ones are gonna receive very little attention at all. So I think this is a consistent focus for um, our work and, and for considerations around these issues. Um, I think one of the, the main kind of recommendations that, that I would have would focus around data access. Um, and, and in the context of this disinvestment, I think we're seeing a, a serious pullback from uh, access for third party researchers. Uh, we are very concerned about changes in the APIs and in uh, different forms of access to uh, data on the platforms, as I think uh, some of my other panelists have discussed for, for research and other purposes, particularly Meta and, and Twitter or X, um, and, and continued restrictions in other places. Um, they are building mechanisms for access to traditional academics in certain cases, uh, but not for researchers or broader civil society that live and work in these contexts. They're often provisioned through uh, mechanisms that are controlled within uh, large countries in the United, like the United States or in Europe. Um, and there aren't really systems in place both um, for documentation or uh, understanding those systems um, and that there are you know, huge barriers to that kind of access even when it's enabled in that sense. Um, so that's something that I would really uh, urge companies uh, in, in the private sector and, and, and groups such as ours to coordinate around in terms of figuring out ways of ensuring that access in future to shine a light within those contexts. Uh, secondly, I think they're ignoring major threats to those who make up uh, half or more of their user base, uh, namely women, 
and particularly those involved in politics, either as candidates, policymakers, or ordinary voters. Uh, research has shown that they face many more threats online, and, and platforms need to institute mechanisms that can uh, support them both to protect themselves, to understand threats, to report and escalate issues as necessary. Um, we have conducted research that shows both the scale of the problem, um, but also look to introduce a series of interventions and suggestions for the companies and others that are working to respond to these issues. Um, but I think this is really a global problem that we see in every context we work in globally, and I think uh, many in the room will understand uh, th this threat and this issue. Finally, I think there's a need to consider critical democratic moments and to work within those uh, specific situations, um, how they can work with the broader community to manage them, uh, not only elections, but major votes or referenda, uh, and also uh, more critical moments uh, such as uh, coups, uh, authoritarian contexts, protests, uh, really critical situations. If they cannot appropriately resource these contexts and situations that they may not have greater understanding of, they at least need to engage with organizations that understand them and help to uh, react and, and effectively uh, make decisions in these challenging situations. I think retreat from programs such as the Trusted Partners in the case of Meta um, and a consistent whittling down of their teams that are addressing these issues will have impacts uh, on these places, on elections, on democratic institutions, and, and ultimately these companies' bottom lines. Uh, the private sector should understand these are not only moral and political issues, but economic ones that will push people away from these spaces as they become hostile or toxic to them in different ways. Uh, we understand the trade-offs uh, in terms of uh, profit and, and uh, you know, organizing systems that are, that are useful for the general public, but we would encourage companies to reflect that the democratic world is integral to the open and vibrant f functioning of these platforms. Um, as with 2016 and 2020, uh, 2024 will be a major election year and, and also likely re represent a concomitant paradigm shift in, in its moderation and in information manipulation campaigns, in regulation, uh, which is another kind of threat I think that, that companies need to consider, and a host of related themes that will have big implications for their profits as well as democracy. So I think they're gonna ignore these realities at their peril. Thanks a lot, Dan. Um, and also thanks for highlighting some of the things that right that are um, the year of democracy campaign. We issued a document that's the campaign ask. So some things we require, require would like to require from social media companies such as streamlining human rights or even um, bringing in more mechanisms to protect users and addressing the problem at the real scale, right? So we are not just saying like, issue um, plans for elections. We're also saying like deploy th the solutions, um, invest the money. It's not just Brazil that matters, but it's also Brazil, India, Kenya, Tanzania. So that's, that's, that's what's really um, core and relevant about this conversation for sure. So thanks a lot, everybody. I would like to ask if anyone would has any questions for the panelists um, or would like to add any thoughts to the conversation. There is a microphone in the middle of the room, so yes. Thank you for giving me some space and uh, ability to express myself. So I'm um, from Russia. We have like a digital election system in Russia. And we were talking about like threats which are posed by global media platforms all around the world, preferably it's Meta, it's like Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Google, and et cetera. But uh, we didn't talk about cyber threats to these digital, pla uh, so di these digital election systems. For example, like uh, two months ago, we had an uh, elections all over the Russia and our digital election system was attacked by a denial of service attack by Ukrainian party uh, to disrupt elections and elections were disrupted for like three or four hours uh, and citizens were not able to actually vote. So this is not something about like harming Russia as a state. It is something about harming Russian citizens as citizens. That's no number one problem. Second problem is, I think you have mentioned before, but I think it's a little bit deeper because we have talked a lot about uh, global media platform involvement in information manipulation, fakes and disinformation spread, etc. But we didn't talk about global media platforms position 
which is tend to be neutral, but is not always neutral in terms of conflict, because there are two sides, and sometimes global media platforms choose sides. And uh, what we see and what we talk about a lot is that global media platforms have some very, like, closed, very secret recommendation algorithms, which basically forms the news feed for users. And the situation is that, for example, in some countries in Africa, Facebook, and I think you can approve me, Facebook actually is represent like internet for some people, and Facebook can do a revolution in a click, just altering users' news feed with their like algorithms, recommendation algorithms. And nobody knows how these algorithms work, and I think internet society and global international society and IGF included should put more pressure on global media platforms for making these algorithms more transparent because people should know why they are seeing this or this content. That's all. Thank you for much uh, for giving me some time. Thanks a lot. Um, any other questions? Uh, hello. Thank you for the panel. My name is Laura. I'm from Brazil. I'm, uh, I'm here with the youth delegation, but I'm also a researcher at the School of Communication and Media and Information at Getulio Vargas Foundation in Brazil as well. And uh, I'd like to hear more about uh, the issue of uh, of that data access for academic research and social uh, civil society research as well uh, as a center specializing in monitoring uh, the public debate in social media we are very concerned with the recent changes mentioned by Arnaldo and mentioned by Yasmin as well uh, regarding the the data access for 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 us and uh, I'd like to hear more about what kind of tools and mechanisms can the academic community and the civil society community community in general access to to fight uh, those restrictions uh, and to to face these these issues not only in the regulatory sp sphere uh, where this this debate is present but also in a, in a more broad broad way thank you thanks so much Laura. and the last question mm, yeah okay man two points um, uh, I'm Alexander from a country uh, in which, uh, neg in spring of which next year 150 f uh, uh, 145 millions will elect Vladimir Putin as uh, president. Uh, and I have two points. Uh, first of all, I would like to say uh, thank Timofey uh, about uh, information on the DOS attacks because Russian uh, Central Election Commission did, did not confirm any issues with um, electoral si uh, electronic electoral systems. Unfortunately, such system as Russia, uh, in Russia was created by Russian big tech uh, Kaspersky, created one uh, system used in Moscow and Rostelecom, which could be considered um, as a big tech, created another one. Uh, systems completely intransparent, uh, does not comply to uh, Venetian Commission recommendations and other kind of recommendations for uh, digital system. And on my point of view, uh, intended for just faking results. I hope. Uh, um, so if you are, uh, if you are interested about such details, please ask me later. Uh, but I would like to ask, maybe not panel, uh, but everyone, have uh, have somebody participated in elections last times? Yeah. Okay. Tr uh, have you tried to use uh, platforms for your promotion? Uh, okay. Nowadays. Uh, um, uh, I also would like to inform Timothy Facebook is not possible, is not legal to, to be used uh, in promotions, but before I've created a political activist or political candidate page on Facebook uh, and would like to advertise myself in constituency with about uh, 20,000 voters. Uh, so I asked Facebook, please make a suggestion, and they suggested me two new contacts for 10 bucks. Uh, so uh, I think uh, in some cases, uh, either platforms don't understand requirements for candidates, if, if it's not presidents, something like, uh, either we need to work with this, uh, either they will, will want too much money for promotions, because okay, if, if I would create uh, pret a -pret cakes, maybe two contacts for 10 bucks is reasonable, but not for uh, the one uh, who wants to advertise uh, himself uh, in a constituency. Uh, so I think uh, such work uh, with platforms uh, and platforms helping candidates, especially in restrictive regimes where, where advertisements on the physical media is no longer possible, 
uh, uh, is also should be done. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alexander. Um, we have one extra question from the chat that I'm just going to hand out to you guys. And you don't need to answer all of them, the ones that speak to you the most, I guess. Um, the one that's on the chat is, um, what should be done legally when some cross-border border digital platforms like Meta refuse to cooperate to national competent authorities regarding cybercrime cases like incitement to violence and promoting pornography for children, children and private images, and even in serious crimes, and, to refu and refuse to establish official representatives in the country. Rather dense question as well, but um, I will give it back the floor to you guys. And, and as we move into to the very end of the session, you only have um, 12 more minutes. I would maybe also ask you to, in a tweet, um, if you could summarize, um, what would be your main recommendation for addressing this so-called um, global equity crisis and big tech accountability? So I don't know. I know it's it's difficult to summarize that, but if you have a tip, an idea, um, a pitch for that, it's very much welcome. Um, I'll start with you, Ashna. Thank you, Bruna, uh, and thank you for the very, very rich questions. Um, I think they highlight that this conversation is not uh, limited to elections and misinfo and dis, uh, disinfo or hate speech, but there are very many other aspects around it. Uh, the DOS attacks that you pointed out, which speak to uh, tech and uh, the resilience of not just civil society organizations, but even electoral bodies uh, and commissions or entities that are state owned or run and uh, leverage technology as part of elections. Um, as well as other conversations around um, accessibility and exclusion because some of that technology around elections uh, uh, excludes key communities which brings about apathy uh, and low voter turnout, all of them uh, critical to the conversation around elections. Similarly, the point around positions and, and the power of these uh, tech companies uh, to literally start revolutions, uh, to borrow your word, uh, I think that too is an area that uh, is, is critical to uh, deliberate more on. The answers are not very immediate. Um, some of the work that we've done uh, in researching how disinfo um, uh, manifests in, in varying contexts has highlighted that the agents, the pathways and the effects vary from one context to another. Uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, uh, in contexts where there's conflicts, religious, or border conflict, or electoral, um, electoral conflict, the manifestations are always very different. The agents are always very different. So we're not necessarily pointing a finger only at big tech, but um, I think we are all mindful of the fact that this is a multi-stakeholder uh, conversation that must be had uh, and should be cognizant of all those challenges. There was an issue on research. I think that's something that we've felt uh, on the continent, the inaccessibility of data. Uh, previously at CIPESA, we've um, leveraged uh, data APIs, I believe that's the technical term, uh, to document elections and, and, and monitor elections, social media sentiment analysis and micro-targeting. That capacity is now significantly limited, so we're not able to highlight uh, some of the challenges uh, that uh, emerge during elections around big tech. That's not to say uh, documentations through stories or humanization would not have the same effect uh, if the access to data is limited. Um, what else did I want to talk about? Now I forget because there were so heavy, heavy questions. But yes, the conversation is much broader than just elections and big tech alone. Uh, we all have a role to play. Uh, and engaging uh, the m least obvious actors like electoral bodies, um, regional, uh, regional economic blocks, and, and other human rights monitoring or human rights norm setting mechanisms is also critical to the conversation. So, uh, regarding <laughs> recommendations, I think it's only possible actually to have really real accountability I if we have like specific legislation and regulation of platforms. It's not possible to have like a multi stakeholder uh, conversation if we have like the sort, the, the 
power symmetries are just too big for us to sit on the same table and discuss with them and talk to them. They set all the rules that are on the table, on the table, so it's not possible to talk to them without regulation. Uh, in Brazil, for example, uh, during the elections again, the journalists Patricia Campos Melo and Renata Gauff asked Facebook how much it w they were investing, uh, not only Facebook, sorry, Facebook and YouTube, how much they were investing in content moderation in Brazil to see how much they were uh, complying with their own uh, memo agreements that they made with, that they signed with the Superior Electoral Court. And they did not answer. They just said that this was sensitive data. And this is uh, like we are talking about aggregated data of how much they were investing financially to improve their content moderation in Portuguese. Uh, so if we don't have this basic information, if we don't have like how to assess how much con how much harmful content is being recommended by their platforms, it is quite difficult to uh, be to for us to be able to uh, make pol proper pol public policies to address these issues. So I'd just like to display the slides again, just to do some propaganda. Sorry, sorry. Can you display the slides again? Just a minute. Just to make a, prop a brief propaganda, uh, we <laughs> have at the CPR our Dynamic Coalition on Platform Responsibilities. Uh, our outcome uh, last year was a framework on meaningful transparency, meaningful and interoperable transparency, with some thoughts for policymakers and uh, regulators, sorry, worldwide if they want to implement, and also platforms if they, wa they are uh, able and eager to improve their best practices, so they also can adopt this framework. And this year, our outcome we are going to release tomorrow, also focusing on human rights uh, risk assessments, and else, so this is our title, it's like a, a, a collaborative paper with uh, best cases and also discussing legislation in India, DSA, DMA, the Brazilian legislation. So we are going to release it tomorrow. Our session is at 8.30. So thanks. I'm sorry for doing the propaganda. I just wanted to show the document. So this is what I would recommend for people to. Yeah, uh, thanks for the questions. Um, I think certainly algorithmic transparency can be a good thing. You just have to be careful about how you do it. Um, and to create systems to understand the algorithms. I think they can also be gamed in different ways if you have a perfect understanding of them. So it's a tricky business. Um, I think uh, definitely on need for better protections and systems for smaller candidates in different contexts. Uh, there's a, it's a part of the system, right? It's not just the individual users and what they're seeing and how these systems are, or these networks are being manipulated, but also how candidates can have access to information about political advertising or about even basic registration information. I think every country in the world should have access to the same systems that are used uh, by Meta and by other major uh, companies, Google and others, to promote good uh, political information. And I mean very basic political information about voting processes, about uh, political campaigns um, anywhere in the world. Um, I think on data access, certainly, um, you know, you're, you're seeing a revolution right now in terms of how the companies are providing access to their systems. And I think it's focused on on X uh, and Twitter uh, that has changed the way that uh, any sort of uh, research is being done on those platforms. Uh, it's much more expensive. It's more difficult to get at. Uh, I think companies need to reconsider what they're doing in terms of um, revising those systems and making them more difficult for different groups. Um, Meta in particular, I think, will be really critical. So I think we need to work collectively uh, to make sure that they make uh, those kinds of systems like APIs available to as many uh, kinds of people as possible. Um, I think, you know, certainly there, there are issues around um, placing company employees in certain uh, countries around the world, and, and that can be problematic in certain ways because they could also be authoritarian contexts, and then uh, the, the, the employees become... 
uh, uh, bargaining chips uh, potentially within certain kinds of uh, regulations that they want to enforce. So you have to be careful about that. But I certainly understand the need uh, to enforce uh, regulations around privacy and, and content moderations and other issues. Um, so I think it's something that has to be designed carefully. Um, I think, you know, certainly there's there's a huge crisis um, in terms of how uh, companies are addressing different contexts. And they need, I think, ultimately to better staff and resource uh, these issues or, or these different contexts. So to have people that speak local languages, that understand these contexts, that can respond to issues and reporting, that uh, know what they're doing. But this is, this is expensive, and I don't think uh, you're going to be able to, um, you know, work your way out of it through, through AI or something like that, as many have proposed. So I just think it's something that, that they need to recognize that reality or they're going to continue to suffer, as unfortunately we, we will all. Just one minute. <laughs> well, I think that it's necessary not just to empower the electoral authority. It's most necessary to empower citizens, civil society organizations, human rights defenders, activists because we are we are really working to promote and to conserve the democracy in countries so this is the main recommendation and regarding your question about the data in for example in our case we are working in a monitoring uh, digital violence based uh, against human candidates in the next election in Panama and everything is very manual because the digital platforms they don't make available the tools to the civil society. They make available the tools to the government. So we are trying to sign like an agreement with the electoral authority to maybe have access to that tools because it's necessary to finish the work before the elections. And in another case, the data is not clean. They don't use open data uh, standards. So we have to find and um, sometimes guess the information that they have uh, mm, not upgrading in, no in, their, in their website. So it's a bit difficult for us to work with the, this kind of data. Thanks a lot to the four of you and Alex as well that is following us um, directly from the UK, um, thanks everybody for sticking around as well. If any of this conversation um, like struck a note with you, um, go to the yearofdemocracy.org. That's the website for the Global Coalition for Tech Justice campaign. And um, have a nice rest of the IGF. Thanks a lot.
Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, very glad that you've decided to join us competing against receptions and other responsibilities uh, for this session on technology and human rights due diligence at the UN, from guidance to practice. My name is Peggy Hicks. I'm the director of the thematic division at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva. Um, and I'd like to very much uh, welcome all of you and thank our, our co-sponsors, the Office of the Tech Envoy in the European Union, for their help um, in the session. Um, we thought it'd be good to, to reconvene around these issues. Many of you have been involved in this process for some time. Um, we are working on the human rights due diligence guidance uh, for the UN, and we're nearing the finish line is the, the phrase that I'm, I'm, I've been told to use. Scott Campbell from our office will tell us more about what that means in practice. But I do want to emphasize that while we've been working on this document, it hasn't stopped our, our partners within the UN from applying human rights due diligence on an ongoing basis and uh, as they have rolled out and, and used uh, new technologies. And you know, through that process, they're also sort of seeing some of the challenges they face in, in implementing the need to harmonize approaches across the UN system. So it's sort of reinforced our desire to move forward on, on this process. And we'll talk about that more um, as we go forward. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to give the floor to Quentin Charles Lambert from the Tech Envoy's office for some opening words. Thank you very much, Peggy. Um, yes, and thank you all for being here. Um, my job is very simple and short, just to give a couple of welcoming remarks and to frame this discussion. Um, so this human rights due diligence for di digital technology is really about the United Nations walking the talk when it comes to its own use of digital technology. Um, grounded in the roadmap for digital cooperation back in 2020, this was already uh, on the agenda for the UN as technology was coming into the UN's work. Um, and 
Since then, the UN's been grappling with this issue internally, like many other organizations. As you can imagine, the different areas of the UN's work across the peace and security pillar, sustainable development, and of kind of human rights work itself, but also in its internal operations. So the use of digital technology in things like UN recruitment or uh, you know, recruiting UN personnel, uh, UN procur procurement, IT services, and that kind of thing. So obviously there are challenges which um, all organizations are grappling with, and this is a really good opportunity to uh, take a rights-based approach and talk, walk the talk when it comes to digital technology in the UN. So back over to you, Peggy. Great, thanks very much. We're very glad to, to partner with the office on, on this important area of work. Um, as I said, I'm now going to turn the floor to Scott Campbell, our senior human rights officer uh, with UN Human Rights who leads on this process, and he'll give us an update on where the process currently stands. Over to you, Scott. Thank you very much, Peggy, and just a quick uh, sound check to make sure you're hearing me okay in the room. All great. Fantastic. So very pleased um, that we're that we're here today, um, and as as Quinton I think you know, very rightly put, um, seeing us all moving forward at the United Nations on on walking the talk, uh, and also pleased as as Peggy mentioned to be nearing the finish line on on this process. Um, the drafting and consultation process for the guidance has been quite lengthy. Uh, it's involved multiple rounds of bilateral consultations, of open forums uh, like this one, other public events. Um, and we've consulted heavily with UN entities as well as with external partners, uh, including member states, tech companies, um, and diverse members uh, among our civil society partners. Um, the process internally, uh, while it has been lengthy, I should underscore it's been very useful in giving us an opportunity uh, to engage on human rights with a large number of entities across the full UN family. And some of these entities are very familiar with human rights mainstreaming, uh, human rights due diligence, we'll hear from a couple of them today, other entities far less familiar with human rights. So the process has really reinforced a broader mainstreaming of human rights due diligence efforts across the UN and has assisted us in, in building more understanding and aligning, aligning approaches across the system. Uh, the process externally, uh, the mandate given to us by the Secretary General to develop the guidance called specifically for consultations with external partners. Uh, and in particular, those most affected by digital tech. And I think this has really added a lot of value to where we've landed on in terms of the content of the guidance. And I want to give a shout out to Access Now uh, for having facilitated a number of public events and consultations uh, with civil society partners. Um, just quickly on the timing, uh, a fourth draft of the guidance was circulated back in July to the Secretary General's Call to Action uh, Interagency Working Group, which is a UN body. Comments uh, were received. We've done some consultations in August and September, uh, and we are, as, as mentioned, nearing the finish line. I just want to mention one, one note before handing it back over. As the process has evolved, um, alignment and policy coherence across the UN system has really been forefront in our, in our thinking. And this guidance on digital tech intersects with another parallel and very much related process. Uh, which is a study to examine the implications of expanding the scope of the current human rights due diligence policy of the United Nations. Uh, and as many of you may be aware, this is a, a policy that's been in effect since 2011, but has a narrow focus on UN support to non-UN security forces. Um, so this study on expanding the existing policy, which was also mandated by the Secretary General's Executive Committee, uh, was begun before we began our work uh, on this non-binding guidance for our use of digital tech at the UN. Uh, and in discussion with many actors along the way throughout the process, there was broad agreement uh, that in drafting the human rights due diligence guidance, we needed to first uh, be grounded in the parameters for the broader expansion of the existing human rights due diligence policy, which is a binding policy. Uh, and that that first, that groundwork, that foundation first needed to be set. Um, we're very, and of course, the, the, the guidance that we would uh, develop, which is non-binding guidance, should of course align with that broader policy. So we were very pleased to see back in June at the Executive Committee um, agreement on the parameters of the Human Rights Due Diligence Framework Policy, agreements on the next step to draft that policy and to develop an implementation plan and to seek resources. Um, so with that set that we're now uh, 
we now have the space to move forward on finalizing the draft guidance for tech, ironing out any remaining details, uh, and preparing for consideration of the guidance by the Secretary General's Executive Committee, uh, on which we are now trying to get on the, the calendar for that, uh, that committee's meeting. Uh, following uh, consideration by the Executive Committee, uh, and we, we trust with their endorsement, uh, the Secretary General may decide to share the guidance with the Chief Executive's Board for their consideration and potential use across the full UN system. So I'll uh, leave it that on, on the process and hand it back over to you, Peggy. Thank you. Great. Scott will stay online for, for uh, interpretation of, uh, of all of that, which, which some who are maybe not as deep in the UN system may need at some point. Uh, but before we do to, uh, move to that, I'd, I'd like to beg your indulgence for one more uh, member of our team who will give us a substantive uh, update on, on the issues that have arisen through the consultations and, and where we stand and on the guidance itself. So Katie Shevin, who's our senior project advisor on the project, will come in now. Over to you, Katie. Thanks very much, Peggy, and uh, everyone. It's, it's wonderful to be here with you. Um, as, as Peggy mentioned, I'm a business and human rights specialist, and I've been working with Scott and his team uh, to support the development of this guidance. Um, I thought I would very briefly just uh, offer a description of how the, the guidance has evolved through these rounds of consultation um, and share a few um, lessons and insights that we've gained uh, throughout the process. Um, sorry, my computer's a little slow today. So in terms of the process itself, as, as Scott mentioned, we've now circulated four drafts of this guidance for feedback with both UN and external stakeholders. And we've been very grateful for the time reviewers have given to this process. Um, we've received a, an enormous amount of very constructive, thoughtful and um, helpful input, which has really supported us to strengthen the guidance, but also to ensure that it responds to the needs in the different contexts of UN entities. And it's also given us some insight to inform early planning to support the guidance's implementation, uh, if indeed it, it goes forwards. For those who haven't been following this process, um, earlier rounds of feedback really focused in on seeking clarity about the status of the guidance. You know, is it a guidance document? Is it UN policy? Will it be mandatory? Is it there to support entities? You know, what is the guidance about? What is it trying to achieve? Um, we also gained some insight into the different levels of familiarity um, that UN entities have with human rights due diligence processes which has really helped us tailor the language and the approach to the guidance, particularly for those users who are newer to working with these types of concepts. Uh, some of the earlier feedback provided um, an opportunity also for us to reflect on and to discuss with entities the appropriate scope of the guidance, what's practicable, um, what best helps us steer towards um, a, a strong uh, longer term uh, approach to managing uh, the human rights risks of digital technology use. Um, we received some requests for uh, more concrete examples to help bring the material to life and give people a sense of, of what it would actually look like to, to implement in practice. Um, and some of the UN entities actually worked with us to develop some examples that are hypothetical, but also realistic of the types of situations that they face or anticipate facing um, as the digital technology use grows. Um, we've also had some opportunities to explore how the guidance can be applied in sensitive contexts, for example, by entities involved in the provision of emergency or humanitarian support. Um, so we could tailor it to enable those entities to apply the guidance while navigating, you know, often very challenging and, and complex um, contexts and considerations. Uh, and we've also um, been able through the, the process of consultation to really explore how best to apply concepts and language around human rights due diligence that were originally developed for the private sector to UN entities, you know, recognizing that there are some differences in, in the mandate, in the purpose, in the everyday language that, that is used um, uh, across the UN family. When it comes to the most recent round of feedback, uh, we generally, generally heard uh, very strong support for the approach that, that the guidance now takes. Uh, which was encouraging, um, and also some very targeted and very helpful feedback to support us to further hone and, and strengthen it. Um, so, for example, a number of entities provided some helpful suggestions as to where we could most more closely align the guidance with 
other agendas that are important across the, the UN system. So for example, more prominently highlighting where digital technology use and human rights due diligence need to be sensitive to the, the different impacts on girls, women and gender non-conforming people um, and to support an approach that is based on the principles of inclusion and intersectionality. So we've made that much more explicit. Uh, some of the reviewers also helped us to identify other relevant principles, guidance documents and, and other resources on human rights and technology that are already in use across the UN, which has supported us to really promote an approach um, to the guidance that aligns with rather than duplicates um, those existing processes. The most recent round of review also offered us a chance to test some of the hypothetical examples that were now included in the guidance with other stakeholders. And we received some input on how we could further refine those to reflect issues that arise across different entities, not just the entities that helped us develop these examples, and to ensure that the language that we're using resonates with users across different parts of, of the UN family. Finally, we heard that our efforts to clarify the relationship between this guidance and the process to develop a, a framework policy on human rights due diligence hadn't quite hit the mark, and we received some helpful suggestions on how we could make this clearer for readers uh, earlier in the guidance. As Scott mentioned, we're currently working on the fifth and hopefully final or near final draft, and I think it's likely to look very similar to the fourth draft for those of you who have, have seen that. Um, as I mentioned, the most recent round of feedback has really yielded input that's helped us strengthen the guidance by tweaking the language in subtle but I think important ways and to include more explicit connections to existing processes and resources. So they're not major changes. Stepping back to reflect on the process as a whole, um, it's generated some interesting learnings that are supporting us to start to think through how best uh, we might support um, UN entities to implement the guidance when finalised. Um, the consultation processes, it's not just helped us to hone the guidance, it's provided us with some time and opportunities to learn more about where different entities are at when it comes to human rights due diligence, meaning that we've got a better sense of what might be needed to support capacity building in a, in a more targeted and, and hopefully helpful way going forwards. We've learned a lot about what language resonates with colleagues across the UN, um, we've also been able to identify entities across the UN that already have significant experience working, <clears throat> excuse me, working with human rights due diligence and have practical approaches and insights that they could potentially share with others to support that capacity building process. Um, our engagement across the UN has also generated a lot of food for thought on what risk management for the UN looks like in a world where a proactive approach to human rights is increasingly expected, uh, perhaps especially as we enter into an era in which Increasing use of digital technology um, paves the way for a, sort of a new world of, of human rights risks, as well as potential human rights benefits. Um, we're very mindful that expectations, not just of business, but also of other organizations, including UN entities, um, when it comes to managing human rights risks and issues are, are becoming stronger and are also becoming increasingly connected to discussions about how to address environmental issues, including the, the climate and biodiversity crises. Related to that, the, the process overall has provided a great opportunity to reflect ourselves and with both UN and external stakeholders who've been involved in the various rounds of consultation on the similarities and differences between UN entities and business enterprises when it comes to implementing human rights due diligence for digital technology use. We went into this process, I think it's fair to say, with a general sense that it made sense to leverage and build on standards such as the UN guiding principles for business and human rights, which were developed for business, and we've been able to start the work of initiating conversation with those involved in the consultations on the nuances of adapting um, that approach. I might leave my comments there, um, though, like Scott, I will stay on the line in case there are any questions uh, later. Great, thanks very much, Katie, for that, for that overview. Um, we're going to turn now to a discussion that looks at um, the practical realities and challenges of applying human rights due diligence uh, for the use of technology within the UN system. Um, as noted, while the work on the due diligence guidance has been underway, uh, a number of UN entities have already dived into the space, and we're going to hear from two of them uh, right now, UNHCR and the World Bank, to share some of their experience. So for this section, we're very fortunate to have with us David Satola, the Office of the Legal Counsel at the World Bank, 
legal vice presidency. Um, and I do need to note that David is joining us at an absurdly early hour in Washington, D.C. So thank you so much for being here, David. And from UNHCR, uh, Nicholas Oakshot, uh, Senior Policy Officer for Digital Protection at UNHCR, who we've worked closely with in the course of our work on the Human Rights Due Diligence Guidance. And he helped us organize or organized himself a workshop on applying HRDD to uh, UNHCR's use of technology and complex field settings. And he's been spearheading those efforts across UNHCR. So I'm going to ask uh, the, those two panelists a couple of questions uh, to give us a sense of, of how this looks in practice. Uh, turning to you, Nick, first, um, since UNHCR has been a real leader in applying human rights due diligence and its use of digital technology, um, we've really appreciated your collaboration. Could you please uh, give us a sense of how you're applying human rights due diligence, uh, and particularly in complex settings like those that UNHCR engaged in? Um, including the systems and mechanisms that are in place and how they're being strengthened. Thanks. Thanks, Peggy. I mean, as you'd expect, UNHCR has a, a wide range of policies and guidance that can help to manage risks in its use of digital technology. They range from privacy and data protection through to procurement, partnership, due diligence and beyond. However, in terms of a formal policy framework on human rights due diligence, that's less developed and you know, very much in line with what Scott was saying earlier on. But in our digital transformation strategy, which runs from 2022 to 2026, we've set the goal that UNHCR's own use of digital tech will align with international human rights and ethical standards. And uh, in line with what was said earlier on about um, walking the talk, but these standards will also be promoted with states and the private sector with a focus on high-risk technologies, uses, and contexts. So our process of engagement with the guidance development has very much been around building UNHCR's understanding and capacity to apply human rights diligence approaches to its use of digital technologies in order to meet this, this overall strategic objective. As uh, you mentioned earlier on, uh, in January, uh, we brought together a multifunctional team to implement a simulation of the third draft of the guidance, looking at field-based case studies. Uh, this approach allowed us to uh, engage with experts on human rights due diligence from within the UN system, mm -hmm. but also to receive advice from an international law firm, DLA Piper, which has expertise in advising the private sector on these issues. And this, this was uh, facilitated through a strategic partnership that we have with DLA, which gave us access to this advice on a pro bono basis, which has always helped. Um, by looking at the case studies, we were able to identify more clearly the potential implementation challenges, but also where the guidance added value to our existing uh, policies and processes. Uh, the second case study, um, which looked at the innovative use of social media platforms to deliver protection information to people on the move. You know, such as avoiding how they could avoid risks of exploitation and trafficking in online ads related to accommodation or work. Um, that was particularly positive and resulted in immediate follow up. We've had a, a regional bureau uh, bring together another multifunctional team to undertake a full risk assessment of this approach. And uh, that in, uh, resulted in some quite important uh, adjustments and a decision to develop some uh, more established guidance uh, on this innovation. Um, we've also got, uh, I think, a reasonably clear and positive uh, uh, identification of the way forward. First of all, to meet an uh, immediate priority, we'll consider the, the guidance, even though it's still a draft, as part of a multifaceted assessment of UNHCR's developing approaches to the use of artificial intelligence, including generative AI. Um, this will include the application of UNHCR's new and expanded general policy on data protection and privacy, as well as the principles on the ethical use of AI in the UN system, which were adopted uh, last year, sorry. And secondly, um, we're going to review our uh, set of existing policies and guidance to see how we can best implement the guidance once it's adopted. This will also include exploring whether a uh, user-friendly digital tool could help the field and other internal stakeholders in implementation, as well as how best to engage with affected communities and civil society, which is an important but challenging part of the guidance. So UNH journey, UNHCR's journey down this road has begun, 
and I think a, a quite clear and, uh, and a useful way forward has been identified. Back to you, Peggy. Great, thanks very much, Nick. It's it's really clear that uh, that you've gotten a head start on a lot of this, and then the rest of us in the UN system will really be able to draw on some of those uh, good practices that that you've been working on. Um, I'm going to turn to David now and and ask you for a perspective from the World Bank. I, in my experience, it's not always that easy to talk about human rights in a in a World Bank, bank setting. So I'm I'm a bit curious to hear how it's been for for those of you within the bank that are working in the area of human rights due diligence. Um, and maybe if you could say a, a bit about whether you faced any pushback and how you've addressed it. Sure. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. Just a quick sound check. Can you hear me okay in the room? It's great, David. Thank great. you. Thank you. Great. Uh, well, thank you all for uh, inviting me here. Uh, despite the early hour, I'm delighted to, to be here virtually with you um, and for including me in the panel. I'm uh, sorry not to be in Kyoto in person. Um, before I get on to some of the specific challenges, um, I, I do want to take just a, a minute and, and applaud the effort that you all are doing in trying to synthesize these, uh, these disparate evolving uh, threads. I mean, I think we've, in the past few years, all of us have taken on uh, different approaches to human rights and technology, whether it be in cybersecurity and more recently with artificial intelligence. Um, I think the synthetic approach that that you all are are doing here to have a a a, a, a broad uh, approach to human rights due diligence uh, is really to be applauded. Um, I also think that, and I, you know, Katie and others and Scott have mentioned this before, but the, there are some elements of the process that you're going through that I think are extremely important and that will resonate with. Uh, those who have uh, history with the Internet Governance Forum. One is the, the consultation process that's, that you've undertaken. A multi-stakeholder consultation process will only reinforce the, the, the strength of, of this guidance. Um, I can't underscore enough the issues of capacity building that are mentioned in the document itself. Uh, that's extremely important for us as we are providing financing in, in these areas uh, for different digital development activities. Um, I'm also struck with the, uh, by the sort of principles-based approach. And I think this re is a reflection of the, one of the main challenges, and it's not just for us, but it's for all institutions who are working in trying to in, in, uh, involve human rights due diligence is um, that it, it, it's, it's difficult to have a one size fits all approach. But if you do it on the principles basis, then that I think is reflected in the document, I think that then that can be achieved. Um, I'd like to echo what, what Nick said as well, that you know, in, in the past few years, our organization like UNHCR and others has, has attacked different things in different ways from procurement to human resources to other things. And, and now this is, this is an opportunity for us to kind of, again, bring those threads together. So the first challenge I, I think is that and, and this is, I think, exactly what you're trying to do in this document, is to recognize that there are standards out there, that they are evolving in different ways. But uh, this is, a, I think, a first attempt to, to try and synthesize that. So uh, that, that in itself is a big challenge. The, the biggest challenge for the World Bank in this area is that the way that we do business uh, the way that our operations are conducted is, is, I think, fundamentally different than most other UN organizations. So, and I, I don't need to speak for UNHCR or, or any of the others, but correct me if I'm mischaracterizing you, how you do business. Um, when UNHCR does an operational activity, UNHCR is in the field, its staff are, are doing the work, whereas in the World Bank context, when we do operational work in the field, we're we are generally providing financing to our member states to undertake a project. That's called a recipient executed, what we refer to as a recipient executed activity. So we're, we're one step removed from the kind of uh, direct interaction that most of our other uh, UN family organizations are, are doing. And that, that is a, a principal difference. So one of the challenges that we are facing is that our member states are confronted with um, the, the kind of 
uh, lack of clarity or lack of synthesis in, in a set of rules to apply. So even if we have a, a, a guidance for the UN family, it's not necessarily going to translate directly to how our member states um, might undertake uh, their own due diligence. And with our renewed emphasis on uh, digital as a, as a principal way of doing business and development, I think this, this will be uh, increasingly uh, a challenge for us. Um, I think I'll I think I'll leave it at, at that uh, for now. But uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity and looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Um, sorry, microphone. Yes, good. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I was just saying that David's comments about the, the downstream effects and the engagement, uh, the indirect way that, that some of the, the guidance would need to apply given the nature of the, the way the World Bank works in, in different settings is, is really interesting when you look at how it fits with the, the uh, UN guiding principles on business and human rights framework. So we'll probably come back to that. Um, but I'll flip back to Nick now and just ask a bit from your side um, about pushback um, in terms of, of human rights due diligence. I know we hear a lot of comments from, from those that are engaged about um, some of the challenges they face uh, within their institutions, and it would be great to hear a bit from your side about, about wh how you, what sort of things have come up and, and how you've been able to address them. Thanks, Peggy. Uh, I think that um, part of the process of engaging closely with the the team uh, at UN Human Rights has been really helpful in, in helping us to address uh, and think through what the, the potential pushbacks. Um, it's important to recognize that UNHCR, as, as David uh, was saying, is a field focused organization and the protection of the forcibly displaced and stateless is a key part, perhaps the key part of its institutional DNA. It's integral both to the agency's mandate but also to its identity so in this context new processes uh, can, could be seen as unnecessary steps to potentially getting in the way of the immediate delivery of protection and humanitarian assistance in challenging emergency contexts uh, something which is a duplication rather than uh, a, a, an add-on um, however as the guidance has strengthened from draft to draft, um, it's been seen as being increasingly implementable at the field level. And the value add has become clearer, uh, particularly in relation to existing risk management processes. And I'd flag up that uh, in many ways uh, over the years, we've, we've focused on similar questions, but through the lens of privacy and data protection rather than through a, a, a broader human rights due diligence perspective, which I think uh, has obvious uh, pluses in some contexts, but in other contexts is perhaps uh, too narrow in scope. Um, so overall, I'd say that um, UNHCR sees the guidance as an opportunity to realize the key digital protection strategic goal that I flagged up earlier on and provides us through experience with uh, a stronger basis for increased engagements with states and the private sector, including technologies on promoting uh, the protection and forcibly of the forcibly displaced and stateless in digital contexts. I think that there, uh, there are enormous advantages from applying the, the guidance, even in its draft form uh, uh, to existing field contexts, because it means that we're more relevant in our approaches and the advice that we can provide to, to states in the private sector. Back to you, Peggy. Great. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, and uh, I'm quickly going to turn back to David just to, to check in with you to see if you wanted to, to add on to your comments. I, I found your your notes about the, the principle-based approach as, as being very interesting. And in particular, I know that, especially given the amount of time that we spent on this human rights due diligence guidance, one of our hopes is that it will be a document that, that does have application beyond uh, the UN system as well. And, and obviously, when you're looking at recipient countries and, and how they engage, perhaps um, that's one of the ways in which we could see that happen. But I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on that point, David. 
Yeah, thanks, Peggy. Um, and I just following up on that uh, very point, um, and I think that the principles based approach will enable this one, I think one does need to recognize that there are our, our members and our member states are, are the same as as your member states. Um, they have they're they're at different levels of development. And so one could call it a maturity uh, levels. There are some big middle income countries who borrow from the World Bank who are going to be more sophisticated, have higher capacity to deal with some of these issues. And you know, if you take a big middle income country versus, say, a small island country with a smaller population, uh, less development, maybe even um, you know lower income levels, it's going to it, it's hard to impose the same model on both. And so I think that the, the, the fact that it is a principles-based approach allows for uh, recognition of those different levels of maturity to, to deal with the thing. I'm not suggesting at all uh, a, a subjective approach to human rights or you know, a relative approach to human rights. No, I, I think it's the due diligence part and the capacity uh, to integrate how one approaches technology and, and technology issues that would need to be uh, uh, recognized in, in those contexts. And I think that the, um, <clears throat> we, we find this in, in our, our normal lending operations as well. There are some things that are universal that, that apply across the board. We expect our, our borrowers to observe the same kind of procurement principles and things like that. Um, so likewise, I, I think we can, we can hope to achieve uh, a universal approach to human rights due diligence, but in the process, I think you do need to recognize that uh, different countries have different levels of development and economic maturity, and that would need to be taken into account. Over. Great. Thanks very much, uh, David. I think I think we'll leave it uh, with uh, Nick and, and and David at that point and and. Um, Marwa has been very patient. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Marwa uh, Patafta uh, from Access Now with us. Uh, Access Now has been involved, as Scott noted, uh, along this process. And uh, we'd really like to, to hear from you, um, you know, Access Now's views on, on how the UN's doing in this area. Um, why, why do you think this is, uh, uh, this guides could be important and, you know, what, what you'd like to see as, as we go forward? Thank you very much, Peggy. Okay, this works. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and uh, I hope uh, our colleagues who follow us online can hear me clearly. Um, we, I mean, as a starting point, I think this is a very important step that uh, the U that OHCHR has taken over, um, and to ensure that human rights due diligence is mainstreamed across all UN entities. And we think it's a step that is, frankly, a bit overdue. Um, where we've seen the rollout of technologies or the deployment of technologies on a mass scale uh, without sufficient uh, assessment of potential negative human rights risks, which um, some of them have materialized. And I think that's important, especially in contexts where um, there are not necessarily um, strong rule of law or a human um, strong human rights records in countries where vulnerable communities, um, individuals and communities who may be impacted by the use of digital technologies uh, by UN agencies can have access to effective remedy. So I think it's a, it's a very important step and I really look forward to um, seeing it, it see, see the implementation of it uh, and the final draft as well. Um, we are, of course, we have been engaging on business and human rights um, on a number of fronts, especially with the private sector and, of course, engaging with human rights due diligence has given us a number of lessons learned that I would like to share and I think is important for this conversation. Um, the first one of which is uh, we've seen in the guide um, that the aim of this guide is basically to build the capacity of different UN agencies um, in headquarters and field offices to be able to conduct human rights impact assessments and use this uh, guide. Um, however, we think that it's very important to add an element of independent assessment. Um, this is important for a number of reasons, the first of which is uh, oversight and accountability. When those assessments are made internally, and especially when they're not published or the findings of those are not published, it becomes hard for civil society to scrutinize the decision made 
Um, we've had situations, and especially with the private sector, where um, there is a decision to expand in a certain market or use a specific technology where we see clearly in red letters that this technology will lead to negative human rights impact. Um, however, we're told that it's fine, you can relax because we've done our due diligence, we've done our human rights impact assessments, and you can trust us that we'll take care of this matter. Therefore, I think independent assessments are very important. Um, it's also, and truth be said, I mean, we're all subject to bias and um, having an independent third party that can assess um, the, the rollout of technologies or specific programs that rely on tech or digital solutions, especially when they are already being implemented is key. Um, in order to avoid a you know, situation where the, 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 the technology is being used and there is, a, there is an assessment, uh, but having someone from the outside that conduct this is, is important. Um, the second point, and it ties to the first one, and I'd already alluded to it, and that is transparency. Um, transparency on the process, on the practice, uh, engagement with civil society that allows affected communities to evaluate from their own perspective um, the extent to which these decisions taken by the agency are actually serving their needs and protecting their rights. Um, and, you know, this transparency for us is not an option, which I think the guide suggests. Uh, we think it's important um, and key for the success of this uh, tool. Um, the third point is around enforcement. And, um, I mean, human rights due diligence tools are as good as their enforcement. And again, from experience engaging with the private sector and also with some UN agencies, uh, including UNHCHR, um, we have seen that those tools, whereas you know they are explicitly written or sometimes mandated by internal policy handbooks or uh, internal policies, they're not necessarily implemented. And that's, um, it's especially so in challenging situations such as in humanitarian context where UN agencies have to rush to get refugees registered or to get people across the border. And we, we are at the end of the day operating in an in a ecosystem where private companies are also aggressively selling solutions to, um, to solve very complex problems. And uh, here we see that again in such situations there the technology is used the um, or rolled out and the assessments are either not made or made later um, and when they are made later or not made at all we have a situation where th these technologies are implemented on a mass scale so we have a kind of a de facto situation such as the biometric registration of refugees uh, conducted by um, the UN Refugee Agency. Uh, when you have millions of people already registered with their biometric information, which is extremely sensitive personal data, um, being used and processed, it of course exposes um, individuals and vulnerable communities to a number of risks, but it becomes hard to challenge these uh, systems when it's already been out. Uh, and then the question for us as civil society is, how can we work with UN agencies to mitigate these risks when, you know, the more you c data you collect, the harder it becomes to uh, protect them. So that's just one example for um, when there is no human rights due diligence done, um, what's, the, what's the, you know, the long-term cost of that? And one point also to raise here, and I think um, David mentioned it, um, and that is sometimes also we've seen that when you know, headquarters are very diligent about enforcing and implementing uh, and doing human rights impact assessments, data protection impact assessments. When it trickles down to the field level, uh, where field office operates, sometimes those rules are not necessarily followed. Uh, it could be because of lack of capacity or lack of resources or the sector in which they're operating or the context in which they're operating. But here it's key also to ensure that those um, tools are being implemented at the lowest level where there is direct interaction uh, with um, affected communities. And, um, and so that's one point to highlight on the enforcement bit. And then last um, uh, key point to raise here is around public-private partnership. I think that's 
very important to help um, strengthen um, the Human Rights Due Diligence Guide. When private companies are being procured, um, we don't see any information uh, from a number of UN agencies about why they have selected specific countries. There were also examples where um, companies are, you know, with shady human rights records, are have been partnering with UN, UN agencies. Like Palantir is one classical example that uh, that comes to mind. Um, and when civil society asks for more information or transparency on how s company X has been selected. Uh, we don't receive answers. So I think t adding an, or um, strengthening transparency on public-private partnership due diligence for the companies that are procured are just as important as assessing the negative or potential or foreseen uh, negative human rights impacts of the programs or the technologies themselves. Thanks very much, Myra. It's really great to get your f reflections on it. And your second point uh, related to the transparency in the process and involvement uh, of civil society, which you said was was key to making this process work. And I think your, your comments gave us a good example of that. I mean, we need that sort of um, input about, about where we've gotten and how much further we have to go. Uh, that doesn't mean we'll necessarily get there all in one step. Um, but it's it's very important to, to have that that spotlight and and to understand you know where uh, what what needs to be done and and um, and how how we need to move not just from the guidance and not just from the implementation but to look at some of these key issues about how to make sure that it's as deep and meaningful um, and that these questions around transparency and and independent uh, auditing and other things are, are addressed so thanks for that um, with that, uh, I think it's time for us to move quickly to the question and answer. Um, we, as I said, we're very grateful to those of you that uh, have joined us for the session. Um, we're happy to, we have people online, I think, that uh, may come in with questions as well, but we'd be very happy to prioritize questions in the room first. If, if people want to uh, just, we're a small enough group, I think you can just uh, flag me and I be happy uh, for, I think you need to go to the mic just so the people online will be able to hear it, I'm being told. Anybody have any questions or comments on what they've heard? Mm, I'm seeing none. Sorry? And there you go. Oh, thank you. And if you can introduce yourself as well, please. Sure. Um, my name is Bushri Body. Um, my question is around um, like these guidelines that are being created. Um, I'm wondering how much of a space there is to actually talk about what's influencing, again, the decision-making process around procuring certain technologies within the UN system um, and thinking about, like, I mean, there's funding that goes into the system from certain actors that, like, have their priorities and agendas that are clearly set out, but that's not necessarily something that could be made transparent, I think, within the parameters of how the UN system currently functions. But for like an internal mechanism within the UN system, that's there's also a lack of clarity within it. So like, is there anything that's being developed maybe to make that more transparent internally, even if it's not something that can be publicly shared? Um, because I think that's an important part of understanding the decision making process of why certain technologies are being pushed, and like the underlying narrative around those technologies. Because there's like the understanding that maybe they'll improve efficiency, for example, with UNHCR's um, use of biometric technology. There was a lot that was um, discussed about it decreasing um, fraud instances, but those were seen to be so negligible that it didn't merit the risks that those populations were being exposed to as a result of the use of those technologies. Um, so I'm wondering if there's any mechanism that's being considered there as well. I'm sorry. Great, thanks. No, it's a, a good a good follow-up question to the, the comments that, that Marwa made as well. I'll just see if there are any others that wanted to come in with questions and then we can go back to the panel and others for response on that point. Anybody else want to come in? Do we have any questions online, Eugene, that we should bring in? Oh, oh sorry, please. Hello, I'm Ana Cristina Ruelas from UNESCO, and I have a question about the independence of assessments. How to identify who is going to do the, in the independent assessment when you have like different bodies? Like what is your experience of who will be the independent uh, body that will perform assessments when it comes to UN agencies which have many 
uh, member states with different views? Should the member state decide uh, different uh, different names to perform the assessment? Should civil society decide which civil society should decide? What would be your recommendation on that? Because it's very like that. That will be like a how to uh, develop that independence. Please, we'll take this one last question, then I'll go back to the panel with all three. Hi, my name's Oliver. I can't name my organization because of security uh, risks. Um, my question is, um, because UNESCO just uh, stood up, would the human rights due diligence um, that you're developing, would it apply to the UNESCO guidelines that are currently also in development? Because a lot of civil society have been asking why the UNESCO guidelines have no uh, due diligence process. Thanks. So we have three questions on the table. Um, I think, Nick, if you're there, maybe it makes sense to go to you first as, as UNHCR has, has been coming to the conversation at, at several occasions. But I, I think you know, to potentially broaden it out um, and just have a sense from you about you know, how you're dealing with some of the challenges that have been raised around public-private partnerships and transparency around them um, and the, you know, the different uh, factors that are in play when, when UNHCR is looking at some of these uh, issues, including the, the use of independent assessments and other things. Thank you. Thanks, Peggy. I, I think that, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a good question, the question about the purposes um, for which uh, certain technologies are chosen. And I think one good reference point that um, civil society and other stakeholders now have is UNHCR's digital transformation uh, strategy, which I'm just going to drop the link into the chat so that you can see there what uh, our objectives are on digital. And you can you can see in that strategy that it's very much focused on uh, the people that we serve. Three goals of the five are you know digital protection, digital inclusion, and providing more digital services for the people we serve. And so. There, I think that there's uh, more of a clear idea on the, the business side, if you like, of what we want to use digital technology for. And it's the first strategy that we've had. So I think it's an uh, important uh, reference point. On um, uh, transparency questions, I think that one of the key opportunities, but also I think fundamental challenges that we've identified in the work we've we've done around the human rights due diligence guidance is how can we effectively engage with uh, civil society stakeholders uh, in uh, the implementation of that guidance? Um, I think that, you know, from talking to experts in the private sector, that's also a challenge that businesses have faced. And I would very much welcome an opportunity to discuss with Access Now and other stakeholders ideas on how we can make that work. On the one hand, uh, you know, uh, respecting that there may be some uh, confidentiality questions that arise, but also how important it will be um, to include uh, civil society in those due diligence um, processes. Um, on the question of uh, independent assessments, I think that that's a particular challenge within the UN system. There is an independent auditing function that, um, that does look at the work of UN agencies. And once the policy that Scott refers to uh, is adopted, that policy will become auditable, if you like. Um, but, uh, and on the other hand, we have, say, in the context of data protection, established uh, uh, agreements with expert suppliers to help uh, bring both expertise, but also uh, some independent rigor to data protection impact assessments that, that have been undertaken both at the global and the field level. Um, but uh, I think the jury is still out from UNHCR's perspective about whether uh, independent entities undertaking uh, audits of the implementation of the, the guidance beyond the existing system um, would be uh, would be something that we could work well with. Um, but overall, I think that uh, we're on a learning process, as I said in my earlier comments, and would very much welcome greater dialogue and discussions with civil society about how, um, how we can best make this guidance work. Back to you. Great. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, and I'll turn to, to David to see if you have any comments on that and then to 
the panelists here. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And and just wanted to follow up very quickly on, on Marwa's comment and the, the the ensuing discussion on enforcement and, and related issues. Um, <clears throat> I agree. I, I think that that le lends itself towards accountability, which is definitely um, required. And that while we don't have anything specific on human rights at the moment. We, we do have a variety of, of other tools that are available both to our borrowers and to civil society and the beneficiaries of our, of our, our work. And, and some of those in, are the following. One of them is um, <clears throat> our, we have a grievance redress mechanism in our projects. And so every project will, will have this so that if there is uh, a negative impact on someone an individual, for example, they can then appeal to the World Bank to um, seek redress for whatever harm they've encountered. We also have, in terms of the, and I think this might address in part the PPP question or working with the private sector, a lot of the financing that we provide to governments goes to vendors or consultants um, or contractors. So, um, you know, if, if it's a roads project, we're not going to build the road. The government's not going to build the road. They're going to hire someone to, to build the road. But in that context, um, we have our fraud and corruption guidelines, which, uh, to borrow the phrase, sort of follows the money and all the way down the chain to the, the most local uh, subcontractor. So to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing with the money. We also have in, a, in the broadest sense, the organization called the Inspection Panel, which is independent and which um, can be in, uh, invoked if there are, are you know, issues that arise in one of our projects that uh, there was some serious breach or, or something like that. And we also have internally a group called the Independent Evaluation Department, which um, retrospectively looks at projects and terms of lessons learned and what, what worked, what didn't work. And so collectively, there's a lot of accountability mechanisms that are there. They're, they're not specifically designed right now necessarily to address human rights, but there's no reason that they couldn't be adapted to include human rights issues. And as Nick said, you know, over the past few years since the you know, entry into force of GDPR, personal data protection is, is a huge issue for us. Um, we provided billions of dollars of financing in the COVID pandemic, and maybe some of you remember that from a couple of years ago. But the, you know, the, the amount of personal data that was being collected by our recipients at that time, we realized was going to be huge. Um, and we wanted to put in place mechanisms in our lending uh, instruments that would, uh, would ensure that our borrowers had in place the right kind of uh, legal and technical measures to protect personal data. Some, some of our borrowers had laws in place and we could rely on those. In other cases, there weren't legal frameworks in place. And so we worked with our borrowers to make sure that for those projects, uh, the, 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 the projects themselves had uh, a framework in place. Now, let me just digress for a moment there. Our, our members are sovereigns. The World Bank is a sovereign when it, when, when we have a lending instrument, when we do a financing agreement, a sovereign to sovereign agreement is a treaty. It's a very powerful instrument. And when we did those COVID projects with countries that didn't necessarily have a data protection regime in place, we built it into our agreement. And so we were pretty comfortable with the fact that that sovereign to sovereign agreement, that treaty for the purpose of the data that was collected uh, in that context of COVID was going to be protected. So not perfect, but certainly we, you know, a tool that we had that we used to make sure that to the extent that we could, those issues were being addressed. Over. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. It's great to get that insight. Um, we only have a couple minutes left. We're starting to hear noises outside of our room here in, in Kyoto. Um, Marwa, I'll turn to you quickly. I don't want to hold people. Um, Quickly, I couldn't agree more with the first comment, and that's an issue we also face. Often, um, technologies are deployed or used uh, without evidence, and I think it's evidence-based solutions are very important in a context where, again, private companies are happy to sell you 
um, and I use this term, snake oil, or you know, solutions that could have serious ramifications or negative impact on human rights. Um, and, th and therefore, for us as civil society organizations, we sometimes struggle to understand the rationale why certain solutions that are disproportionate, given their human rights uh, impacts, are being used and justified. So having an evidence to say, for instance, with biometric registration that there is no other solution but biometric registration that justify the collection and processing of sensitive data and therefore, and based on this evidence and this research. Uh, research, of course, is in resource intensive, time intensive, and, and I understand again that in challenging contexts, that's hard to achieve all the time, but nevertheless, it is important uh, to, to scrutinize the narratives behind certain technologies such as AI. Um, the point on uh, independent assessments, I mean, I'm not in the business of promoting uh, certain entities, uh, but there are, of course, uh, companies or civil society organizations that are specialized in doing exactly that, uh, doing human rights due diligence. And as someone who had participated in a number of consultations, my job as a civil society organization to ensure that those um, you know, as auditors or, you know, companies are speaking to the right people. So they're not just speaking to Access Now as a global organization, but that can actually speak to grassroots organizations, so the people who belong to the communities that might be affected. Um, that's, I think, something that civil society should continue doing um, in building bridges, and I understand um, the difficulty in uh, reaching out to the stakeholders, which I believe Nick had uh, mentioned. Um, and that's something that civil society can can help with. Uh, an organization like Access Now, we have partners across the world, and we're more than happy to connect um, whenever a consultation needed. And the same, of course, applies to other partners. Great, thanks, Marwa. Uh, Quentin, uh, a closing word from Quentin. Yep, sure. Thanks very much. And. Um, just bringing it back to the overall uh, role of this non-binding guidance, and uh, it kind of helps to reconcile these two challenges. One is how we have uh, horizontal alignment across the different UN agencies and entities, and then making it principles-based such that it can be translated into those local contexts. Um, it's not a surefire uh, outcome guaranteeing kind of thing. To get to that, probably uh, to hard code it into the operational procedures like procurement, uh, one would need to have it baked into the entity specific procedures, including the tendering process, um, you know, the kind of checklists and auditing that goes on those procurement processes. Uh, and that can, this guidance can be, you know, a beacon for each entity to do that kind of hard coding. It has to be done entity by entity because each entity has its own governing bodies. For example, in the Secretariat, the General Assembly prescribes housekeeping rules, we call it, but um, basically the way in which the UN does its procurement and has the criteria for procurement handed down by the GA, whereas UNHCR, other agencies will have more flexibility in some cases. But it can act as this kind of beacon, this guidance for each entity to hard code these kinds of principles into its own local procedures. And also just um, in closing, as a, as a kind of beacon just for individual people, staff members who are working in the organizations. Um, I recall, for example, during the COVID days, uh, when the Secretariat itself was considering how to deal with uh, the pandemic and whether to introduce its own contact tracing, proximity uh, tracking system. And in the end, it was a judgment. It was an emergency and it was a judgment. And in my opinion, the correct judgment went, you know, won out, which was that we were not going to do it and that the partner who was offering to do it was not going to be able to meet the uh, privacy and, uh, you know, kind of requirements that were uh, appropriate for the, cons for the case. But it was a judgment call. And this kind of human rights due diligence framework offers this kind of um, load star for the system to both translate uh, the principles into its own kind of regular procedures, but also for individuals who are taking judgment calls on a day-to-day -day basis. Great, thanks very much, Quentin. We've run over time, so just to conclude by saying that that you know we've we've had a, a good conversation here. Some some uh, important questions have been raised around transparency and assessments and enforcement. Those are issues that we will you know look very seriously uh, at, and the interagency working group. Uh, we'll take them on board as we're looking to, to implement and move forward uh, in this process. And uh, I think it's 
Uh, coming at it from a previously civil society perspective, I have to say I think you know from my interaction with with the the UN agencies involved, there's a real commitment to trying to move this forward in a positive way. Um, but some of the issues raised are difficult ones for us for us to solve. The the issues of the public private partnerships and the the corporate engagement. Um, I'm I'm in charge of digital transformation uh, from a champion standpoint at my organization, and one of the things in reaching out to other UN agencies to to have a sense of how they've been able to do what they wanted to do within digital transformation, is you know the real recognition that the funding is not there uh, for it to happen, except in the context of of some of these important partnerships, and and you know we're grateful for that because the UN has to be an ent entity that that functions with all of the tools necessary to protect human rights in my regard, to protect refugees in UNHCR's regard. So, um, so these are challenging things for us to implement, but we, we really appreciate the input and uh, commit to continuing the conversation as, as we go forward. Thank you all for staying so late uh, and missing the, the reception outdoors. Uh, I hope you'll, you'll get a chance uh, to enjoy the evening here in Kyoto, and thanks again for all your time. And thanks to our panelists for all their efforts. Thank you.